Cantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Arrows Fall by Mercedes Lackey. Narrated by Krista Lewis. Prologue. Long ago, so long ago that the details of the conflict are lost and only the merest legends remain, the world of Velgarth was racked by sorcerous wars. With the population decimated, the land was turned to wasteland and given over to the forest and the magically engendered creatures those peoples had used to fight those wars, while the people that remained fled to the eastern coastline, for only in those wilderness areas could they hope to resume their shattered lives. In time it was the eastern edge of the continent that became the site of civilization, and the heartland that in turn became the wilderness. But humans are resilient creatures, and it was not over long before the population once again was on the increase, moving westward, building new kingdoms out of the wilds. One such kingdom was Valdemar. It had been founded by the once barren Valdemar, and those of his people who had chosen exile with him rather than face the wrath of a selfish and cruel monarch. It lay on the very western and northernmost edge of the civilized world, bounded on the north and northwest by wilderness that still contained uncanny creatures, and on the far west by Lake Evendim, an enormous inland sea. Travel beyond Valdemar was perilous and uncertain at the very best of times, and at the worst, a traveler could bring weird retribution on innocence when the creatures he encountered back-trailed him to his point of origin. In part due to the nature of its founders, the monarchs of Valdemar welcomed fugitives and fellow exiles, and the customs and habits of its people had over the years become a polyglot patchwork. In point of fact, the one rule by which the monarchs of Valdemar governed their people was, there is no one true way. Governing such an ill-assorted lot of subjects might have been impossible had it not been for the heralds of Valdemar. The heralds had extraordinary powers, yet never abused those powers, and the reason for their forbearance, in fact, for the whole system, was the existence of creatures known as companions. To one who knew no better, a companion would seem little more than an extraordinarily graceful white horse. They were far more than that. The first companions had been sent by some unknown power or powers at the pleading of King Valdemar himself, three of them at first, who had made bonds with the king, his heir, and his most trusted friend, who was the Kingdom Herald. So it came to be that the heralds took on a new importance in Valdemar, and a new role. It was the companions who chose new heralds, forging between themselves and their chosen a mind-to-mind bond that only death could sever. While no one knew precisely how intelligent they were, it was generally agreed that their capabilities were at least as high as those of their human partners. Companions could, and did, choose, irrespective of age and sex, although they tended to choose youngsters just entering adolescence and more boys were chosen than girls. The one common trait among the chosen, other than a specific personality type, patient, unselfish, responsible, and capable of heroic devotion to duty, was at least a trace of psychic ability. Contact with a companion and continued development of the bond enhanced whatever latent paranormal capabilities lay within the chosen. With time, as these gifts became better understood, Ways were developed to train and use them to the fullest extent of which the individual was capable. Gradually, the gifts displaced in importance whatever knowledge of true magic was left in Valdemar, until there was no record of how such magic had ever been learned or used. Valdemar himself evolved the unique system of government for his land. The monarch, advised by his council, made the laws. The heralds dispensed the laws and saw that they were observed. The heralds themselves were nearly incapable of becoming corrupted or potential abusers of their temporal power. In all of the history of Valdemar, there was only one herald who had ever succumbed to that temptation. His motive had been vengeance, 
He got what he wanted, but his companion repudiated and abandoned him, and he committed suicide shortly thereafter. The Chosen were by nature remarkably self-sacrificing. Their training only reinforced this. They had to be. There was a better than even chance that a herald would die in the line of duty. But they were human for all of that, mostly young, mostly living on the edge of danger. So it was inevitable that, outside of their duty, they tended to be a bit hedonistic and anything but chaste. They seldom formed any ties beyond that of their brotherhood and the pleasures of the moment, perhaps because the bond of brotherhood was so very strong and because the herald-companion bond left little room for any other permanent ties. For the most part, few of the common or noble folk held this against them, knowing that no matter how wanton a herald might be on leave, the moment he donned his snowy uniform, he was another creature altogether. For a herald in whites was a herald on duty, and a herald on duty had no time for anything outside of that duty, least of all the frivolity of his own pleasures. Still, there were those who held other opinions. Laws laid down by the first king decreed that the monarch himself must also be a herald. This ensured that the ruler of Valdemar could never be the kind of tyrant who had caused the founders to flee their own homes. Second in importance to the monarch was the herald known as the king's or queen's own. Chosen by a special companion, one that was always a stallion, and never seemed to age, though it was possible to kill him. The king's own held the special position of confidant and most trusted friend and advisor to the ruler. This guaranteed that the monarchs of Valdemar would always have at least one person about them who could be trusted and counted on at all times. This tended to make for stable and confident rulers, and thus a stable and dependable government. It seemed for generations that King Valdemar had planned his government perfectly. But the best laid plans can still be circumvented by accident or chance. In the reign of King Sendar, the kingdom of Carsi that bordered Valdemar to the southeast hired a nomadic nation of mercenaries to attack Valdemar. In the ensuing war, Sendar was killed and his daughter Selene assumed the throne herself having only recently completed her herald's training. The queen's own, an aged herald called Talamir, was frequently confused and embarrassed by having to advise a young, headstrong, and attractive female. As a result, Selene made an ill-advised marriage, one that nearly cost her both her throne and her life. The issue of that marriage, the heir presumptive, was a female child Selene called Elspeth. Elspeth came under the influence of a foreigner, the nurse Hulda, whom Selene's husband had arranged before he died to be brought from his own land. As a result of Hulda's manipulations, Elspeth became an intractable, spoiled brat. It became obvious that if things went on as they were tending, the girl would never be chosen, and thus could never inherit. This would leave Selene with three choices, marry again, with the attendant risks, and attempt to produce another, more suitable heir, or declare someone already chosen and with the proper bloodline to be heir, or, somehow, salvage the heir presumptive. Talamir had a plan, one that it seemed had a good chance of success. At this point, Talamir was murdered, throwing the situation into confusion again. His companion, Roland, chose a new queen's own, but instead of picking an adult or someone already a full herald, he chose an adolescent girl named Talia. Talia was of Holderkin, a puritanical border group that did its best to discourage knowledge of outsiders. Talia had no idea what it meant to have a herald's companion accost her and then, apparently, carry her off. Among her people, females held very subordinate positions, and nonconformity was punished immediately and harshly. She was ill-prepared for the new world of the heralds and their collegium that she had been thrust into. But the one thing she did have experience in was the handling and schooling of children, for she had been the teacher to her holdings younger members from the time she was nine. She managed to salvage the brat, 
Anne succeeded well enough that Elspeth was chosen herself just before Talia was sent out on her internship assignment. During that assignment, she and Chris, the herald picked to be her mentor, discovered something frightening and potentially fatal, not only to themselves but to anyone who happened to be around Talia. Due to the chaos just after her initial training in her gift, she had never been properly trained. And her gift was empathy, both receptive and projective, strong enough to use as a weapon. It wasn't until it had run completely wild that she and Chris were able to retrain her so that her control became a matter of will instead of instinct. She still had moments of misgiving about the ethics of her gift. She also had moments of misgiving on another subject altogether another herald. Dirk was Chris's best friend and partner, and Talia, after being with him only a handful of times, none intimate, was attracted to him to the point of obsession. There was a precedent for such preoccupation. Very rarely, heralds formed a bond with one another as deep and enduring as the herald-companion bond. Such a tie was referred to as a life bond, Chris was certain that this was what Talia was suffering from. Talia wasn't so sure. This was just one minor complication for an internship that included battle, plague, intrigue, wildly spreading rumors about her, and a gift that was a danger to herself and others. At last the year and a half was over, and she was on her way home. Home. To an uncertain relationship a touchy adolescent heir, all the intrigues of the court, and possibly an enemy, Lord Ortholin, who just happened to be Chris's uncle. Chapter One We could be brother and sister, Chris thought, glancing over at his fellow herald. Maybe twins. Talia sat Roland with careless ease an ease brought about by the fact that they'd spent most of their waking hours in the saddle during her internship up north. Chris's seat was just as casual, and for the same reason. After all this time, they could easily have eaten, slept, yes, and possibly even made love a saddle. The first two they had accomplished, and more than once. The third, they'd never tried. But Chris had heard rumors of other heralds who had. It did not sound like something he really was curious enough to attempt. They figured on making the capital and the collegium by early evening, so they were both wearing the cleanest and best of their uniforms. Heraldic whites, those for field duty, were constructed of tough and durable leather, but after 18 months they only had one set apiece that would pass muster and they'd been saving them for today. So we're presentable, which isn't saying much, Chris mourned to himself, surveying the left knee of his breeches with regret. The surface of the leather was worn enough to be slightly nappy, which meant it was inclined to pick up dirt. And dirt showed on whites. After riding all day, they both were slightly gray. Maybe not to the casual eye, but Chris noticed. Tantras curvetted a little, and Chris suddenly realized that he and Talia's Roland were matching their paces. On purpose, my two-footed brother, came Tantras' sending, tinged with a hint of laughter. Since you two are so terribly shabby, we thought we'd take attention off you. Nobody's going to notice you when we're showing off. Thanks, I think. By the way... You couldn't pass for twins. There's too much red in her hair, and she's too little. But Sibs, yes. Although where you got those blue eyes? Blue eyes run in my family, Chris replied with feigned indignation. Both father and mother have them. Then if you were going to be Sibs, your mother must have been keeping a bard in the wardrobe for Talia to have hazel eyes and curly hair. Tantris pranced and arched his neck, and one of his safferine eyes flashed a teasing look up at his chosen. Chris stole another glance at his internee 
and concluded that Tantris was right. There was too much red in her hair, and it was too curly to have come out of the same batch as his own straight blue-black locks. And she barely came up to his chin. But they both had fine-boned, vaguely heart-shaped faces, and more than that, they both moved the same way. Ulbrich's training, and Karen's. Probably. You're prettier than she is, though. The witch you know. Chris was startled into a laugh, which made Talia glance over at him quizzically. Might one ask? Tantris, he replied, taking a deep breath of the verdant air and chuckling. <laughs> He's twitting me on my vanity. I wish, she answered, with more than a little wistfulness, that just once I could mind speak rolling like that. You ought to be glad you can't. You're saved a lot of back talk. How far are we from home? A little more than an hour. He took in the greening landscape with every sign of satisfaction, now and again taking deep breaths of the flower-laden air. A uh, silver for your thoughts. So much, she chuckled, turning in her saddle to face him. A copper would be more appropriate. Let me be the judge of that. After all, I'm the one who asked. So you did. They rode in tree-shadowed silence for several leagues. Chris was minded to let her answer in her own time. The soft chime of bridal bells and their companions' hooves on the hard surface of the trade road made a kind of music that was most soothing to listen to. Ethics, she said at last. Woof, that's dry thinking. I suppose it has. She plainly let her thoughts turn inward again. Her eyes grew vague, and he coughed to recapture her attention. You went elsewhere, he chided gently when she jumped a little. Now, you were saying... Ethics. Ethics of what? My gift. Specifically, using it. I thought you'd come to terms with that. In a situation of threat, yes. In a situation where there was no appropriate and just punishment under normal procedures. That child raper. Exactly. She shivered a little. I thought I'd never feel clean again after touching his mind. But... What could I have done with him? Ordered his execution? That wouldn't be enough of a punishment for what he did. Imprison him? Not appropriate at all. And much as I would have liked to pull him to bits slowly, heralds don't go in for torture. What did you do to him, in detail, I mean? You didn't want to talk about it before. It was a kind of twist on a mind-healing technique. It depended on the fact that I'm a projective empath. I can't remember what Devin called it, but you tie a specific thought to another thought or set of feelings that you construct. Then every time the person thinks that thought, they also get what you want them to know. Like with Vostel, every time he would decide that he was to blame, he'd get what I put in there. Which was? She grinned. So next time I won't be so stupid. And when he'd be ready to give up from pain, he'd get, But it isn't as bad as yesterday, and it'll be better tomorrow. Not words, actually. It was all feelings. Better in that case than words would have been, Chris mused, shooing a fly away absently. So Devon said, Well, I did something like that with... that... thing... I took one of the worst sets of his stepdaughter's memories and tied that in to all of his own feelings about women. And I kept point of view so that it would appear to him as if he were the victim. You saw what happened. Chris shuddered. He went mad. He just collapsed, foaming at the mouth. No, he didn't go mad. He locked himself into an endless repetition of what I'd fed him. It's an appropriate punishment. He's getting exactly what he put his stepdaughters through. It's just... At least I think so. Because if he ever changes his attitudes, he can break free of it. Of course, if he does, she grimaced, 
He might find himself dancing on the end of a rope for the murder of his older stepdaughter. The law prevents the execution of a madman. It doesn't save one who's regained his sanity. Lastly, what I did should satisfy his stepdaughter, who is, after all, the one we really want to come out of this thing with a whole soul. So, where's the ethical problem? That was a threat situation, a threat situation. But, is it ethical to, say, read people during council sessions and act on my information? Ugh. Chris was unable to think of an answer. You see, let's go at it from another angle. You know how to read people's faces and bodies. We've all been taught that. Would you hesitate to use that knowledge in council? Well, no. She rode silently for a few more moments. I guess what will have to be the deciding factor is not if I do it, but how I use the information. That sounds reasonable to me. Maybe too reasonable, she replied doubtfully. It's awfully easy to rationalize what I want to do, what I have no choice about in some cases. It's not like thought sensing. I have to actively shield to keep people out. They go around shoving their feelings up my nose on a regular basis, especially when they're wrought up. Chris shook his head. All I can say is do what seems best at the time. Really, that's all any of us do. Verily, a oh wise one. Chris ignored his companion's taunting comment. He was going to question her further, but broke off when he caught the sound of a horse galloping full out, heading up the road toward them, the hoofbeats having the peculiar ringing of a companion. That sounds like a companion, yes, and in full gallop. He rose in his stirrups for a better view. Bright lady, now what? Steed and rider came into sight as they topped the hill. That's Simri. Tantris's ears were pricked forward. She's slim. She must have foaled already. It's Simri, Chris reported. Which means skiff. And since I'll bet she just foaled, it isn't a pleasure ride that takes them out here. The last time they'd seen the thief-turned-herald had been a bit over nine months ago, when he'd met with them for their half-term briefing. Simri had spent the time frolicking with Roland, and both she and her chosen had forgotten about the nearly supernatural fertility of the Grove Stallions. The result was foregone, much to Simri's chagrin, as well as Skiff's. Talia knew Skiff better than Chris did. They'd been very close as students, close enough, that they'd sworn blood brotherhood. They had been close enough that Talia could read him better at a distance than Chris could. She shaded her eyes with her hand, then nodded a little. Well, it isn't a disaster. There's something serious afoot, but it isn't an emergency. How can you tell at this distance? Firstly, there's no emotional surge. Secondly, if it were serious, he'd be absolutely expressionless. He looks a bit worried, but that could be for Simri. Skiff spotted them and waved wildly as Simri slowed her headlong pace. They hastened theirs to the disgruntlement of the pack mules. Avonsim are ever glad to see you too, Skiff exclaimed as they came into earshot. Simri swore you were close, but I was half afraid I'd have to ride a couple of hours and I ate to make her leave the little one for that long. You sound like you've been waiting for us. Skiff, what's the problem? Chris asked anxiously. What are you doing out here? Nothing for you. Plenty for her. Mind you, this is strictly under the ivy bush. We don't want people to know you've been warned, Tolia. I slipped out on behalf of a lady in distress. Who? Elspeth? Selene? What? Give me a minute, will ya? I'm trying to tell ya. Elspeth asked me to intercept you on your way in. It seems the council is trying to marry her off, and she's not overly thrilled with the notion. She wants you to know so you'll have time to muster some good arguments for the council meeting tomorrow. Skiff reigned Simri in beside them, and they picked up the pace. Alessander has made a formal offer for her for Ankar. Lots of advantages there. Virtually everybody on the council is for it, except Elkoth and Kirill. 
and Selene. They've been arguing it back and forth for two months, but it's been serious for about a week. And it looks as if Selene is gradually being worn down. That's why Elspeth sent me out to watch for you. I've been slipping out for the past three days, open to catch you when you came in and warn you what's up. With you two to back her, Selene's got full veto, either to table the betrothal until Elspeth's finished training, or throw the notion out altogether. Elspeth didn't want any of the more excitable counsellors to know we were warning you, or they might have put more pressure on Selene to decide before you got here. Talia sighed. So, nothing's been decided. Good. I can deal with it easily enough. Can you get on ahead of us? Let Elspeth and Selene both know we'll be there by dinner bell. I can't do anything now anyway, but tomorrow we can take care of the whole mess at council session. If Elspeth wants to see me before then, I'm all hers. She'll probably find me in my rooms. Your wish is my command, Skiff replied. As all three knew, Skiff knew more ways than one in and out of the capital and the palace grounds. He'd make far better time than they could. They held their pace to that of the mules as Skiff sent Simri off at a diagonal to the road, raising a cloud of dust behind him. They continued on as if they hadn't met him, but Chris traded a look of weary amusement with her. They weren't even officially home yet, and already the intrigues had begun. Anything else bothering you? To put it bluntly, she said at last, I'm nervous about coming back home. As nervy as a cat about to kitten? Why for? And why now? The worst is over. You're a full herald. The last of your training's behind you. What's to be nervous about? Talia looked around her. At the fields, the distant hills, at anything but Chris. A warm spring breeze, loaded with flower scent, teased her hair and blew a lock or two into her eyes so that she looked like a worried foal. I'm not sure I ought to discuss it with you, she said reluctantly. If not me, then who? She looked at him measuringly. I don't know. No, Chris said, just a little hurt by her reluctance. You know, you just aren't sure you can trust me, even after all we've shared together. She winced, disconcertingly accurate. I thought bluntness was my besetting sin. Chris cast his eyes up to the heavens in an exaggerated plea for patience, squinting against the bright sunlight. I am a herald. You are a herald. If there's one thing you should have learned by now, it's that you can always trust another herald. Even when my suspicions conflict with ties of blood? He gave her another measuring look. Such as your uncle, Lord Orthalan. He whistled through his teeth and pursed his lips. I thought you'd left that a year ago. Just because of that little run-in you had with him over Skiff, you see him plotting conspiracy behind every bush. He's been very good to me, and a half a dozen others I could name you, and he's been invaluable to Selene, as he was to her father. I have very good reasons to see him behind every bush, she replied with some heat. I think trying to get Skiff in trouble was part of a long pattern, that it was just an attempt to isolate me. Why? What could he possibly gain? Chris was fed up and frustrated because this wasn't the first time he'd had to defend his uncle. More than one of his fellow heralds had argued that Orthalan was far too power-hungry to be entirely trustworthy, and Chris had always felt honor-bound to defend him. He thought Talia had dismissed her suspicions as irrational months ago. He was highly annoyed to find that she hadn't. I don't know why, Talia cried in frustration, clenching her fist on her reins. I only know that I've never trusted him from the moment I first saw him, and now I'll be co-equal in council with Kirill and Elkarth, with a full voice and decisions. That could put us in more direct conflict than we've ever been before. Chris took three deep breaths and attempted to remain calm and rational. Talia, you may not like him, 
but you've never had any problems in keeping your dislike out of the way of your decision making that I've ever seen. And my uncle is very reasonable, but I can't read the man. I can't fathom his motives, and I can't imagine why he should feel antagonism toward me. But I know he does. I think you're overreacting," Chris replied, still keeping a tight rein on his temper. I told you once before that it isn't you that's offended him, assuming that he really is offended. But because he's probably feeling like a defeated opponent, he expected to take Talamir's place as Selene's closest advisor when Talamir was murdered, and cut out the role of Queen's own. Talia shook her head violently. Havens, Chris. Orthalan is an intelligent man. He can't have imagined that was possible. He hasn't the gift, for one thing, and I am not overreacting to him. Now, Talia, don't patronize me. You're the one who is telling me to trust my instincts, and now you say my instincts can't be trusted because they're telling me something you don't want to believe. Because it's childish and silly, Chris snorted. Talia took a deep breath and closed her eyes. Chris, I don't agree with you, but let's not fight about it. Chris bit back what he wanted to say. At least she wasn't going to force him to stay on the defensive. If you want, it. It isn't what I want. What I want is for you to believe and trust in my judgment. If I can't have that. Well, I just don't want to fight about it. My uncle, he said carefully, trying to be absolutely fair to both sides, is very fond of power. He doesn't like giving it up. That in itself is probably the reason he's been displaying antagonism toward heralds and you in particular. Just be firm and cool, and don't give an inch when you know you're in the right. He'll settle down and resign himself, as you said. He's not stupid. He knows better than to fight when he can't win. You'll never be friends, but I doubt that you need to fear him. He may be fond of power, but he has always had the best interests of the kingdom at the forefront of his concerns. I wish I could feel as confident about that as you do. She sighed, then shifted in her saddle, as if trying to ease an uncomfortable position. Chris began to make a retort, then thought better of it and grinned. At this point, a change of subject was called for. Why don't you worry about something else, Dirk, for instance? Beast. She smiled when she saw he was laughing at her. So I am. I'm sure he'll tell me the same. Oh well, the best thing you can do for that little trouble is to let affairs take their natural course. Sooner or later, he'll come to the point. If I have to push him myself, Callus too," she pouted mischievously at him. "Believe it," he replied agreeably. "I'm going to enjoy teasing the life out of both of you." Talia schooled herself to remain calm, as she had told Skiff. There was nothing to be done right now. There were other things she wanted to find out before she took that council seat in the morning too. Like whether the rumors that she had misused her gift to manipulate others were still active, and who was keeping them active if they were. At this point, it was a bit too late to try and find out who had originated them. As they approached the outer city and its swirling crowds, she was made aware of just how much more sensitive her gift of empathy had become. The pressure of all those emotions ahead of her was so strong. She found it hard to believe that Chris could be unaware of it. She wished, not for the first time, that her gift included mind speech. It would have been comforting to consult with Roland the way Chris could with Tantris. She'd forgotten what living around so many people was like, and having had her gift go rogue on her, had made her more sensitive than she had been before she left. It wasn't going to be easy to stay tightly shielded day and night, but her enhanced perception. Was going to demand just that. She felt a flicker of reassurance from Roland, and smiled faintly, despite her anxiety. They made their way down the increasingly crowded road into the outer city.
outside the ancient defensive walls, which had sprung up over several generations of peace. The inner city held the shops, the better inns, and the homes of the middle class and nobility. The outer was given over to the workshops, markets, rowdier hostels and taverns, and the homes of the laborers and poor. The crowds of the outer city were noisy and cheerful. As when she had first ridden into the capital, Talia found herself assaulted on all sides by sight, scent, and sound. The myriad odors of cookshops, inns, and food vendors vied with the less savory smells of beasts and trade. The pressure of all the varied emotions of the people around her threatened to overwhelm her for one brief moment until she firmed up her shields. No, she thought with resignation, this is not going to be easy. The road led through a riot of color and motion, and the noise was cacophonic, confusion without mirroring some of her own confusion within. The leather workers kept to a section here outside the north gate, and both Talia and Chris were caught off guard by a puff of acrid, eye-burning fumes that escaped from a vat somewhere nearby. Phew! <laughs> Chris gasped, laughing at the tears in his eyes and Talia's. Now I remember why Dirk and I usually backtracked around to the haymarket gate. Oh well, <coughs> too late now. The brief pause they made to clear their vision gave her a chance to finish making her shielding automatic. Back in their sector, once she'd gotten her shields back, she'd tended to leave them down when it was only the two of them together. Shielding expended energy, and at that point, she hadn't any to spare. Now she put in place the safeguards that would ensure that her shields stayed up even when she was unconscious, and felt a brief surge of gratitude to Chris for having retaught her the right way to shield. Chris kept a careful eye on her as they made their way through the crowds. If she were going to break, now would be the time, under the pressure of all these emotions. I wasn't worried. You weren't, hmm? Maybe I should ask her to favor you with one of those emotional backlashes. No, thank you. I had one, remember? Roland nearly brained me. Tantris's sending took on a serious coloration. You know, you really shouldn't tease her about Dirk. Life bonds aren't easy to bear when the pair hasn't acknowledged it. Chris looked at his companion's back-tilted ears in astonishment. You sure? I mean, she certainly shows every symptom of life bonding, but we're sure. Do you by any chance know when? He asked his companion. Dirk was the first herald she ever saw. Roland thinks it might have been then. That early? Lord and lady, that would be one powerful bond. Chris continued to watch her with a little bemusement as the thought trailed away. Tradesmen and their patrons screamed cheerfully at one another over the din of vehicles, squalling children, and bawling animals. Yet for all that the populace seemed to ignore the presence of the two heralds passing through their midst, a path always seemed to clear itself before them, and someone beckoned them on by a smile or a wave of a hat. The guard at the outer gate saluted them as they passed through. The guard folk were no strangers to the comings and goings of heralds. They rode through the tunnel that passed under the thick, gray granite walls of the old city, and the din lessened for just a moment. Then they emerged into the narrower ways of the capital itself. It lacked only an hour until the evening meal, and the streets were as crowded with people as Chris had ever seen them. It was not quite as noisy here in the old city, but the streets were just as full. After months of small towns and villages, Chris found himself marveling anew at the crush of people and the closely built, multi-storied stone houses. For many months, the chime of bells on their companions' bridles had been the loudest sound they heard. Now that sound was completely engulfed in the babble around them. The streets had been designed in a spiral. No one could move straight to the palace grounds, as in most older cities that had been built with an eye to defense. Chris led them on a course that wound ever inward. The din died away behind them as they left the streets of shops behind, and entered the inner residential core, 
The modest houses of the merchant class gradually gave way to the more impressive buildings owned by the wealthier noble, each set apart from the street by a private wall enclosing the manse and a bit of garden. Eventually they made their way to the inner beige brick wall surrounding the palace and the three collegia, bardic, healers, and heralds. The silver and blue clad palace guard stationed at the gate halted them for a moment while she checked them off against a list of those expected to be arriving. Careful records were kept on when a herald should come in from the field. In the case of those arriving from distant sectors, this calculation was accurate within a stretch of two or three days. In the case of those arriving from nearby sectors, expected arrival time was accurate to within hours. This list was posted with the gate guard, so when a herald was overdue, someone knew it, and something could be done to find out why quickly. Harold Duck in yet? Chris asked the swarthy guardswoman casually when she'd finished. Just arrived two days ago, Harold, she replied, consulting the roster. Guard then notes he asked about you two. Thank you, guard. Pleasant watch to you. Chris grinned, urging Tantras through the gate she held open, with Roland following closely behind. Chris continued to watch Talia carefully, feeling a surge of gratified pride as he noted her behavior. The past few months had been living hell for her. Control of her gift had been based entirely on instinct, rather than on proper training, and no one had ever realized this. The rumors that she had used it to manipulate, worse that she had done so unconsciously, had pushed her off balance. His own doubts about the truth of those rumors had been easy for her to pick up. And for someone whose gift was based on emotions, and who was frequently prey to self-doubt, the effect was bound to be catastrophic. It was at least that. She'd lost all control over her gift, which, unfortunately, remained at full strength. She'd lost the ability to shield and projected wildly. She'd very nearly killed them both on more than one occasion. We were just lucky that during the worst of it, we were snowed in at that way station. It was just the two of us, and we were isolated long enough for her to get back in charge of herself. And then... She'd met the rumors again, this time circulating among the common folk. More than once they'd regarded her with fear and suspicion, yet she had never faltered in the performance of her duties or given any indication to an outsider that she was anything except calm, thoughtful, and controlled. She'd given a months-long series of performances a trained player couldn't equal. It was vital that a herald maintain emotional stability under all circumstances. This was especially true of the Queen's own, who dealt with volatile nobles and the intrigues of the court on a daily basis. She'd lost that stability, but after working through her trial, had managed to get it back and more. He managed to catch her eyes and gave her an encouraging wink. She dropped her solemn face for a moment to wrinkle her nose at him. They passed the end of the guard barracks and neared the black iron fence that separated the public grounds of the palace from the private grounds and those of the three collegia. Another guard stood at the gate here, but his position was mainly to intercept the newly chosen. He waved them on with a grin. From here the granite core of the palace with its three great brick wings and the separate buildings of the healers and bardic collegia was at last clearly visible. Chris sighed happily. No matter where a herald came from, this place and the people in it were his real home. Talia felt a surge of warmth and contentment at the sight of the Collegium and the palace, a feeling of true homecoming. Just as they passed this last gate, she heard a joyful shout, and Dirk and Aradi pounded up the brick-paved pathway at a gallop to meet them. Dirk's straw-blonde hair was flying every which way, like a particularly wind-blown bird's nest. Chris vaulted off Tantris's back as Dirk hurled himself from Arides. They met in a back-pounding, laughing bear hug. Talia remained in the saddle. At the sight of Dirk, her heart had contracted painfully, and now it was pounding so hard she felt that it must be clearly audible. Her anxieties concerning Elspeth and the intrigues of the court receded into the back of her mind. She was tightly shielded, 
afraid to let anything leak through. Dirk's attention was primarily on her and not on his friend and partner. Dirk had been watching for them all day, telling himself that it was Chris whose company he had missed. He'd felt like a tight bowstring without being willing to identify why he'd been so tense. His reaction on finally seeing them had been totally unplanned, giving him release for his pent-up emotion in the exuberant greeting to Chris. Though he seemed to ignore her, he was almost painfully aware of Talia's presence. She sat so quietly on her own companion that she might have been a statue, yet he practically counted every breath she took. He knew that he would remember how she looked right now, down to the smallest hair. Every nerve seemed to tingle, and he felt almost as if he were wearing his skin inside out. When Dirk finally let go of his shoulders, Chris said, with a grin that was bordering on malicious, You haven't welcomed Talia, brother. She's going to think you don't remember her. Not remember her? Hardly. Dirk seemed to be having a little trouble breathing. Chris hid another grin. Talia and Roland were less than two paces away, and Dirk freed an arm to take Talia's nearer hand in his own. Chris thought, He'd never seen a human face look so exactly like a stunned ox's. Talia met the incredible blue of Dirk's eyes with a shock. It felt very much as if she'd been struck by lightning. She came near to trembling when their hands touched, but managed to hold to her self-control by a thin thread and smiled at him with lips that felt oddly stiff. Welcome home, Talia. That was all he said which was just as well. The sound of his voice and the feeling of his eyes on her made her long to fling herself at him. She found herself staring at him, unable to respond. She looked a great deal different than he remembered, leaner, as if she'd been fine-tempered and fine-honed. She was more controlled, certainly more mature. Was there a sadness about her that hadn't been there before? Was it some pain that had thinned her face? When he'd taken her hand, it had seemed as if something, he wasn't sure what, had passed between them. But if she'd felt it too, she gave no sign. When she'd smiled at him, and her eyes had warmed with that smile, he thought his heart was going to stop. The dreams he'd had of her all these months, the obsession, he'd figured they'd pop like soap bubbles when confronted with the reality. He'd been wrong. The reality only strengthened the obsession. He held her hand that trembled very slightly in his own and longed with all his heart for Chris's silver tongue. They stood frozen in that position for so long that Chris thought with concealed glee that they were likely to remain there forever unless he broke their concentration. Come on, partner! He slapped Dirk's back heartily and remounted Tantris. Dirk jumped in startlement as if someone had blown a trumpet in his ear, then grinned sheepishly. If we don't get moving, we're going to miss supper, and I can't tell you how many times I dreamed of one of Miro's meals on the road. Is that all you missed? Food? I might have known. Poor, abused brother. Did Talia make you eat your own cooking? Worse, Chris said, grinning at her. She made me eat hers. He winked at her and punched Dirk's arm lightly. When Chris broke the trance he was in, Dirk dropped Talia's hand as if it had burned him. When Talia turned a gaze full of gratitude on Chris, presumably for the interruption, Dirk felt a surge of something unpleasantly like jealousy at the thanks in her eyes. When Chris included her in the banter, Dirk wished that it had been his idea, not Chris's. Beast, she told Chris, making a face at him. Hungry beast! He is right, though, much as I hate to agree with him, she said softly, turning to Dirk, and he suppressed a shiver. Her voice had improved and deepened. It played little arpeggios on his backbone. If we don't hurry, you will be too late. It doesn't matter too much to me. I'm used to sneaking bread and cheese from Miro, but it's very unkind to keep you standing here. Will you ride up with us? He laughed to cover the hesitation in his voice. You'd have to tie me up to keep me from coming with you. 
He and Chris remounted with a creak of leather, and they rode with Talia between them. That gave Dirk all the excuse he needed to rest his eyes on her. She gazed straight ahead or at Roland's ears, except when she was answering one or the other of them. Dirk wasn't sure whether he should be piqued or pleased. She wasn't favoring either of them with a jot more attention than the other. But he began to wish very strongly that she'd look at him a little more frequently than she was. A dreadful fear was starting to creep into his heart. She had spent the past year and a half largely in Chris's company. What if... He began scrutinizing Chris's conduct, since Talia's was giving him no clues. It seemed to confirm his fears. Chris was more at ease with Talia than he'd ever been with any other woman. They laughed and traded jokes as if their friendship had grown through years rather than months. It was worse when they reached the field and the taxette, and Chris offered her an assist down with mock gallantry. She accepted the hand with a teasing hauteur and dismounted with one fluid motion. Had Chris's hand lingered in hers a moment or two longer than had been really necessary? Dirk couldn't be sure. Their behavior wasn't really lover-like, but it was the closest he'd ever seen Chris come to it. They unsaddled their companions and stowed the tack safely away in the proper places after a cursory cleaning. Dirk's was pretty much clean, but Talia's and Chris's needed more work than could be taken care of in an hour. After being in the field for so long, it would all have to have an expert's touch. Dirk kept Talia in the corner of his eye while she worked, humming under her breath. Chris kept up his chatter, and Dirk made distracted monosyllabic replies. He wished he could get her alone for just a few minutes. He had no further chance for observation. Karen, Cheryl, and Jerry appeared like magicians out of the thinnest air, converged on her, and carried her off to her rooms, baggage and all, leaving him alone with Chris. Look, I don't know about you, but I am starved, Chris said, as Dirk stared mournfully after the foursome, Talia carrying her harp, my lady, and the rest sharing her packs. Let's get the four feet turned loose and get that dinner. Well? Karen asked, her rough voice full of arch significance, when the three women had gotten Talia and her belongings safely into the privacy of her room. Well, what? Talia replied, glancing at the graying riding instructor from under demure lashes while she unpacked in her bedroom. What? What? Oh, come on, Talia! Cheryl laughed. You know exactly what we mean. How did it go? Your letters weren't exactly very long or very informative. Talia suppressed a smile and turned her innocent gaze on Karen's life mate. Personal or professional? Jerry fingered the hilt of her belt knife significantly. Talia, she warned, if you... Don't stop trying our patience. Roland just may have to find a new queen's own tonight. Oh, well, if you're going to be that way about it. <laughs> Talia backed away, laughing, as Cheryl, hazel eyes narrowed in mock ferocity, curled her long fingers into claws and lunged at her. She dodged aside at the last moment, and the tall brunette landed on her bed instead. All right, I yield, I yield. What do you want to know first? Cheryl rolled to her feet, laughing. What do you think? Skiff hinted that you and Chris were getting cozy, but he wouldn't do more than hint. Quite cozy, yes, but nothing much more. Yes, we were sharing blankets, and no, there wasn't anything more between us than a very comfortable friendship. Pity, Jerry replied merrily throwing herself onto Talia's couch in the outer room, then twining a lock of her chestnut hair around one finger. We were hoping for a passionate romance. Sorry to disappoint you, she replied, not sounding sorry at all. Though if you're thinking of trying in that direction... Hmm? Jerry did her best not to look too eager, but didn't succeed very well. Well, once he's managed to shake Nessa loose... Ha! <laughs> Don't laugh, we think we know a way. Well, once she's no longer hot on the hunt, he's going to be quite unpartnered, and he's just as um, pleasant a companion as Varianus claims. 
Jerry, don't lick your whiskers so damned obviously. He's not a bowl of cream. Jerry looked chagrined and blushed as scarlet as the couch cushions as Cheryl and Karen chuckled at her discomfiture. I wasn't that bad, was I? You most certainly were. Keep your predatory thoughts to yourself if you don't want to frighten him off the way Nessa has, Karen admonished with a wry grin. As for you, little centaur, he seems to have cured your manshyness rather handily. I guess I owe Kirill and Elkarth an apology. I thought assigning him to you was insanity. Well, now that our prurience has been satisfied, how did the work go? It's a very long story, and before I go into it, have you three eaten? Three affirmatives caused her to nod. Well, I haven't yet. You have a choice. You can either wait until I'm done with dinner for the rest of the gossip, they groaned in mock anguish, or you can check me in and bring me something from the kitchen. If Selene or Elspeth need me, they'll send a page for me. I'll check her in. Jerry shot out the door and down the spiral staircase. I'll go fetch you a young feast. You look like you've lost pounds, and when Mira finds out it's for you, he'll probably ransack the entire pantry. Cheryl vanished after Jerry. Karen stood away from the wall she'd been leaning against. Give me a proper greeting, you maddening child, she smiled, holding out her arms. Oh, Karen. Talia embraced the woman who had been friend, surrogate mother and sister to her, and more, with heartfelt fervor. God's how I've missed you. And I you. You've changed, and for the better. Karen held her closely, then put her at arm's length surveying her with intense scrutiny. It isn't often I get to see my hopes fulfilled with such exactitude. Don't be so silly, Talia blushed. You're seeing what isn't there? Oh, I think not, Karen smiled. The gods know you are the world's worst judge when it comes to evaluating yourself. Dearling, you've become all I hoped you'd be, but you didn't have the easy time we thought you would, did you? I... no, I didn't. Talia sighed. I... get in. My gift went rogue on me, at full power. Great good gods. She examined Talia even more carefully, gray eyes boring into Talia's. How the hell did that happen? I thought we'd trained. So did everyone. Wait a moment. Let me put this together for myself. You finished Ilsa's class. Now let me remember. Karen's brow creased in thought. It does seem to me that she mentioned something about wanting to send you to the healers for some special training, that she didn't feel altogether happy about handling an empath when her own expertise was thought-sensing. Karen turned away from Talia and began pacing, a habit the younger woman was long familiar with, for Karen claimed she couldn't think unless she was moving. Now... I'd assumed she'd taken care of that because you spent so much time with the healers, but she hadn't, had she? And then she was murdered. As far as Chris and I could figure, the heralds assumed that the healers were giving me empath training, and the healers assumed the heralds had already done so because I seemed to be in full control. But I wasn't. It was all instinct and guess. And when control went, gods! Karen stopped pacing and put both of her hands on Talia's shoulders. Little one, are you sure you're all right now? Talia remembered only too vividly the hours of practice Chris had put her through, the painful sessions with the two companions literally attacking her mentally. I'm sure. Chris is a gift teacher, after all. He took me all the way through the basics, and Roland and Tantris helped. Oh, Really? Well, well. <laughs> That's an interesting twist. Karen raised an eloquent eyebrow. Companions don't intervene that directly as a rule. I don't think they saw any other choice. The first month we were all snowed in at that way station. Then we found out that those damned rumors had made it up to our sector, and we didn't dare look for outside help. It would have just confirmed the rumors. True. True. If I were on the circle, I think I would be inclined to keep all this under the ivy bush. Letting the world know that we blundered that badly with you won't do a smidgen of good. 
and would probably do a lot of harm. Selected people, yes, and this should certainly go down in the annals so that we don't repeat the mistake with the next empath. But no, I don't think this should be generally known. That was basically Chris's thinking, and I agree. You're the first person to know besides the two of us. We'll both be telling Kirill and Elkarth, and I think that's all. Yes, Karen said slowly. Yes, let those two worry about who else should know. Well, what ends well is well, as they say. I am fine, Talia repeated emphatically. I have absolute control now. Control not even Roland can shake. In a way, I'm glad it happened. I learned a lot, and it's made me think about things I never did before. Right then. Now let's take these rags of yours down to the laundry chute. Yes, all of them. Not even one outfit for tomorrow. After being in the field, they'll all need refurbishing. Here. She dug into Talia's wooden wardrobe and emerged with a soft, comfortable lounging robe. Put that on. You won't be going anywhere tonight, and in the morning, Gaitha will have left a pile of new ones at your doorstep. Though, from the look of you, they'll be a bit loose since you'll have had them made up from the old measurements. We've all got a lot of news to catch up on. Oh, and I've got a message from Elspeth. Thank the lady, and I'll see you in the morning. Well, my old and rare, we have got a lot of news to catch up on. Dirk nodded his mind so fully occupied with things other than his dinner that he never noticed that he was munching his way through a heap of hostile greens, a vegetable he despised with passion. Chris noticed and had a difficult time in keeping a straight face. Fortunately, the usual chaos of the collegium common room at dinner gave him plenty of opportunity to look in other directions when the urge to break into a howl of laughter became too great. It was the height of the dinner hour, and every wooden bench was full of students in greys and instructors in full heraldic whites, all shouting amiably at one another over the din. So, how did your stint go? We greatly appreciated that music, by the way, both of us. We've got a goodly portion of it memorized by now. She... You did? You do? That's... Dirk suddenly realized he was beginning to babble and ended lamely. That's very nice. I'm glad you liked it. Oh, yes, Talia, especially. I think she values your present more than anything anyone else sent her. She certainly has been taking very good care of it, but that's like her. I'm giving her highest marks. She is one damn fine herald. Now Dirk took advantage of the noise and clatter at the tables all about them to cover his own confusion. Well, he replied, when he finally managed to clear his head a bit of the daze he seemed to be in. It sounds like you had a more entertaining trainee than I did, and a more interesting round. Mine was so dull and normal, already and I sleepwalked through most of it. Lord of lights! I wish I could claim that. Don't forget, may your life be interesting happens to be a very potent curse. Besides... I seem to remember you claiming that young Skiff had you worn to a frazzle before the circuit was over. <laughs> I guess I did, Dirk chuckled. Did you know his Simri dropped a foal, and he blames it all on you two? No doubt, since neither of them have an ounce of shame to spare between them. Chris ducked as a student burdened with a stack of dirty dishes taller than he was inched past them. Lord, I hope that youngling's got one of the fetching gifts, or he's going to lose that whole stack in a minute. Yes, Skiff and Simri deserve what they got. Poor Talia would have been ready to skin both of them, given the chance. Oh? Chris was more and more pleased by Dirk's reactions. He needed no further urging and related the tale with relish, stopping short of the fight, which had been caused, in an obscure sort of way, by Dirk, and the swimming match that followed. He insisted then that they ought to take themselves out of the way of those students assigned to clearing tables. Fine. My room or yours? Dirk was doing his damnedest to keep his feelings from showing. Unfortunately, Chris knew him too well. That deadpan, dicing face he was putting on only proved he was considerably on edge. Good God, it's not yours. We'd be lost in there for a week, mine. And I still have some of that Eris wine, I think. 
The tales continued over the wine and a small fire, both of them lounging at full length in Chris's old, worn green chairs, and every other sentence Chris spoke seemed to have something to do with Talia. Dirk tried his best to seem interested, but not as obsessed as he actually was. Chris let the shadows hide his faint smile, for he wasn't fooled a bit. But not once did Chris let fall the information Dirk really wanted to know, and finally, emboldened by the wine, he came out and asked for it. Look, Chris, you're the soul of chivalry, but we're blood brothers. You can tell me safely. Were you or weren't you? Were we what? Chris asked innocently. Sleeping together, you knit. Yes, Chris answered forthrightly. What did you expect? Well, neither one of us made of ice. He figured that it was far better for Dirk to hear the truth, and to hear it in such a way that he took it for the matter-of-fact thing that it was. Talia and Dirk were probably tied neck and neck for the position of his best friend, and that was all he and Talia meant to each other. He could no more conceive of being in love with her than with the close friend he now faced. He watched Dirk covertly, weighing his reaction. I... I suppose it was sort of inevitable. Inevitable. Something more. Frankly, during that first winter, it was too blamed cold to sleep alone. He launched into the whole tale of their blizzard ordeal, with editing. He didn't dare reveal how Talia's gift had gotten out of control. Firstly, it wasn't anything Dirk needed to know about. Secondly, he was fairly certain it was something that should be known by as few as possible. Elkarth and Kirill, certainly, but he was pretty well certain it just wouldn't be ethical to go around telling anyone else without Talia's express permission. He concluded the tale with a certain puzzlement. Dirk seemed to have suddenly gone dumb, and very soon pled exhaustion and left for his own room. Oh, Lord, of all the damned situations to be in, his very best friend in the entire world with his hooks quite firmly in the first woman Dirk had even wanted to look at in years. It wasn't fair. It wasn't any damned fair. No woman in her right mind was even going to want to look at him with Chris around. And Chris, Chris, was he in love with Talia? And if he were, gods, gods, they certainly belonged together. No, damn it! Chris could have any female he wanted, herald or no, without even lifting a finger by all the gods Dirk was going to fight him for this one. Except that he hadn't the faintest idea how to go about fighting for her, and Chris was like a brother, more than a brother. This wasn't any kind of fair to him. He lay sleepless for hours that night, staring into the darkness, tossing and turning restlessly, and cursing the nightjar that was apparently singing right outside his window. By dawn, he was no closer to sorting out his feelings than he had been when he threw himself down to rest. Chapter 2 Talia! Elspeth greeted Talia's appearance at breakfast with a squeal and a hug that threatened to squeeze the last bit of breath out of her. The last year and a half had added inches to the young heir's height. She stood a bit taller than Talia now. Time had added a woman's curves to the wraith-like child as well. Talia wondered, now that she'd seen Elspeth, if her mother truly realized how much growing she'd done in the time Talia had been gone. The wood-paneled common room was full of youngsters in student greys, as most of the instructors had eaten earlier. The bench and table-filled room buzzed with sleepy murmuring and smelled of bacon and porridge. Except for the fact that she recognized few of the faces, and the fact that the room was completely full, it all looked the same as it had when Talia was a student. She slid into the warm, friendly atmosphere like a blade into a well-oiled sheath, and felt as if she had never left. But I ain't lady, Catling, you're going to break all my ribs— Talia protested, returning the hug with interest. I got your message from Karen. I take it Skiff did tell you I got in last night, didn't he? I rather expected to find you on my doorstep. I had full watch last night. One of the duties imposed on the students was to camp in Companion's Field around the time of a foaling, each taking the watch in turn, 
Companions did not fall with the ease of horses, and if there were complications, seconds could be precious in preserving the life or health of mare and foal. Skiff told me you were here, and that he'd given you my screech for help, so I knew I didn't have to worry any more, and I certainly didn't need to disturb your sleep. I heard Simri dropped. Who else? Selika! Elspeth grinned at Talia's bewildered look of non-recognition. She chose Arvin just after you left. He's twenty if he's a day, and when Gillian was here during break between assignments, well... You know, Gillian, she's as bad as Destria. Seems her companion was like-minded. We haven't half been giving Arvin a hard time over it. Zalika hasn't dropped yet, but she's due any day. Talia shook her head and slipped an arm around the heir's shoulders. You younglings, I don't know what the world's coming to these days. Elspeth gave a very unladylike snort, narrowed her enormous brown eyes, and tossed her dark hair scornfully. You don't cousin me. I've heard tales about you and your year mates that gave me grey hairs, climbing in and out of windows at the dead of night with not so ex thieves, spying on the royal nursemaid. Catling, Talia went cold sober. Elspeth, I'm sorry about Hulda. She met Elspeth's scrutiny squarely. Elspeth grimaced bitterly at the name of the nursemaid who had very nearly managed to turn her into a spoiled, unmanageable monster, and came close to eliminating any chance of her being chosen. Why, you caught her red-handed in conspiracy to keep me from ever getting to be ah, she replied, with a mixture of amusement and resentment, the amusement at Talia's reaction, the resentment reserved for Hulda. Sit, sit, sit. I'm hungry, and I refuse to have to crane my neck up to talk to you. You, you aren't angry at me, Talia asked, taking a seat beside Elspeth on the worn wooden bench. I wanted to tell you I was responsible for her being dismissed, but frankly, I never had the courage. Elspeth smiled a little. You didn't have the courage. Thank the lady for that. I was afraid you were perfect. Hardly, Talia replied dryly. Well, why not tell me your end of it now? I just got it secondhand from Mother and Kirill. Oh, Lord, where do I begin? Mm, chronologically, as you found it out. Elspeth seized a mug of fruit juice from a server and plumped it down in front of her seatmate. Right. It really started for me when I tried to get to know you. Hold up kept blocking me. How? Cutting you off for lessons, saying you were asleep or studying, or whatever other excuse she could come up with. Catelyn, I was only about fourteen, and a fairly unaggressive fourteen at that. I wasn't about to challenge her. But it just happened too consistently not to be on purpose, so I enlisted Scaff. Elspeth nodded. Good choice. If there was anybody likely to find out anything, it would be Skiff. I know for a fact he still keeps his hand in. Oh, how? Elspeth giggled. Whenever he's in residence, he leaves me sweets hidden in the secret drawer of the desk in my room, with notes. Oh, Lord, you haven't told anybody, have you? Elspeth was indignant. And give him away? Not a chance. Oh, I've told Mother, in case he ever gets caught, which isn't likely, but I swore her to secrecy first. Talia sighed in relief. Thanks be to the lady, if anybody other than Harold's found out. Elspeth sobered. I know. At worst, he could be killed before a guard knew he was a herald and it was a prank. Believe me, I know. Mother was rather amused, and rather glad, I think, it can't hurt to have somebody with skills like that in the Heralds. Anyway, you recruited Skiff. Right. He began sneaking around and discovered that Hulda, rather than being the subordinate as everyone thought, had taken over control of the nursery and your education. She was drugging old Melody, who was supposed to be your primary nurse. Well, that seemed wrong to me, but it wasn't anything I could prove, because Melody had been ill. She'd had a brainstorm. So I had Skiff keep watching. That was when he discovered that Hulda was in the pay of someone unknown, paid to ensure that you could never be chosen and thus never become heir. Bitch! 
Elspeth's eyes were bright with anger. I take it neither you nor he ever saw who it was. Talia shook her head regretfully and took a sip of fruit juice. Never. He was always masked, cloaked and hooded. We told Jadis, Jadis told the Queen, and Hulda vanished. And I only knew that I'd lost the one person at court I was emotionally dependent on. I'm not surprised you kept quiet. Elspeth passed Talia a clean plate. Oh, I might have gotten angry if you'd told me two or three years ago, but not now. There was a great deal of cold, undisguised anger in the heir's young brown eyes. I still remember most of that time quite vividly. Talia lost the last of her apprehension over the indignation in Elspeth's voice. There's more to it than just my being resentful, though, Elspeth continued. Looking back at it, Talia, I think that woman who called herself my nurse would quite cheerfully have strangled me with her own hands if she thought she could have profited and gotten away with it. Yes, and enjoyed every minute of it. Oh, come now. You weren't that much of a little monster. Here. You'd better start eating or Miro will throw fits at us when we get downstairs to clean. He's fixed all your favorites. Elspeth took some of the platters being passed from hand to hand and heaped Talia's plate with crisp oat cakes and honey, warm bacon, and stir-fried squash, totally oblivious to the incongruity of the heir to the throne, serving one who was technically an underling. She had indeed come a long way from the royal brat who had been so very touchy about her rank. Talia, I lived with Hulda most of my waking hours. I know for a fact she enjoyed frightening me. The bedtime story she told me would curl the hair of an adult, and I'd bet my life that she got positive pleasure out of my shivers. And I can't tell you why I feel this way, but I'm certain she was the most coldly self-centered creature I've ever met, that nothing mattered to her except her own well-being. She was very good at covering the fact, but... I don't think I doubt you, Catling. One of your gifts is mind speech, after all, and little children sometimes see things we adults miss. You adults! You aren't all that much older than me. You saw a fair amount yourself, and you'd have seen more if you'd been able to spend more time with me. She was turning me into a little copy of herself when she wasn't trying to scare me. Once she'd cut me off from everyone else so that there was no one to turn to as a friend, she kept schooling me in how I shouldn't trust anyone but her and how I should fight for every scrap of royal privilege, stopping for no one and nothing on the way. There's more, something that turned up after you left. When they told me the truth, I got very curious. Which is why I call you Catling, Talia interrupted with a grin. Since you're fully as curious as any cat. Too true. Curiosity sometimes pays, though. I started going through the things she left and doing a bit of discreet correspondence with my paternal relatives. Does your mother know this? Talia was a bit surprised. It's with her blessing. By the way, I get the feeling that Uncle King Faramenta likes me as much as he disliked my father. We've gotten into quite a cosy little exchange of letters and family anecdotes. I like him too, and it's rather too bad we're so closely related. He's got a whole tribe of sons, and I think anybody with a sense of humor like his would be rather nice to get to know. Elspeth's voice trailed off wistfully. Then she got back to the subject at hand with a little shake of her head. Anyway, now we're not altogether certain that the Hulda who left Rethwellen is the same Hulda who arrived here. What? Oh, it's so much fun to shock you. You look like somebody just hit you in the face with a board. Elspeth, I may kill you myself if you don't get to the point. All right, I'll be good. It's rather late in the day to be checking on these things now, but there was a span of about a month after Hulda left the royal nursery in Rethwellen to come here, where she just seems to have vanished. She wasn't passed across the border, and no one remembers her in the inns along the way. Then, poof, she's here, bag and baggage. Father wasn't among the living any more through his own stupid fault, and she had all the right papers and letters. Nobody thought to doubt that she was the holder he'd sent for. Until now, that is. Pray, lady. Talia grew as cold as her breakfast, thinking about the multitude of possibilities this opened up.
Had the unknown my lord she and Skiff had seen her conspiring with brought her here? They had no way of knowing if that one had been among those traitors uncovered and executed after Ilsa's murder, for neither of them had ever seen his face. They thought he had been, for there were no other stirrings of trouble after that, but he might only have gone to ground for an interval. Had even my lord guessed that she was not what she seemed? And where had she vanished to after she was unmasked? No one had seen her leave. She had not passed the border, at least by the roads, and that was an echo of what Elspeth had just detailed. Yet she was most assuredly gone before anyone had a chance to detain her. And who or what had given her warning that she had been uncovered? A danger that Talia had long thought safely laid to rest had suddenly resurrected itself. The cockatrice new hatched from the dunghill. Muro is going to have my hide, Elspeth warned, and Talia started guiltily and finished her meal. But she really couldn't have told what she was eating. And that was the last incident, Chris finished. The last couple of weeks were nothing but routine. We finished up. Griffin relieved us, and we headed home. He met the measuring gazes of first Elkarth, then Kirill. Both of them were shocked cold sober by his revelation of the way Talia's gift had gone rogue, and why. They had evidently assumed this interview was going to be a mere formality. Chris's tale had come as an unpleasant surprise. Why? Kirill asked after a pause that was much too long for Chris's comfort. Didn't you look for help when this first happened? Largely because by the time I knew something was really wrong, we were snowed into that way station, senior. He's got you there, brother. Elkarth favored the silver-haired Seneschal's herald with a wry smile. By the time we got out, she was well on the way to having a problem solved, Chris continued doggedly. She had the basics, had them down firmly, and once we got in with people again, we found that those rumors had preceded us. At that point, I reckoned we'd do irreparable harm by leaving the circuit to look for other help. We'd only have confirmed the rumor that there was something wrong by doing so. Hmm, a point, Kirill acknowledged. And at that point, I wasn't entirely certain that there was anyone capable of training her. Healers... Elkarth began. Don't have empathy alone, nor do they use it exactly the way she does, the way she must. She's actually used it offensively, as I told you. They rarely invoke the use of it outside of healing sessions. She is going to have to use it so constantly it will be as much a part of her as her eyes and ears. At least, Chris concluded with an embarrassed smile. That's the way I had it figured. I think that in this case, you were right, young brother, Carol replied after long thought, during which time Chris had plenty of leisure to think about all he'd said and wonder if he'd managed to convince these two, the most senior heralds in the circle. Chris let out a breath he didn't even realize he'd been holding. There was this, too, he added. At that point, Letting out word that we and the Collegium had failed to properly train the new queen's own would have been devastating to everyone's morale. Bright goddess, you're right, Elkarth exclaimed with consternation, his eyebrows rising to meet his grey cap of hair. For that to become well known would be as damaging to the faith of heralds as it would be to that of non-heralds. I think, given the circumstances, you both deserve high marks. You, for your good sense and discretion, and your internee for meeting and overcoming trials she should never have had to face. I agree, Kirill seconded. Now, if you'll excuse us, Elkarth, and I will endeavor to set such safeguards as to ensure this never happens again. With a polite farewell, Chris thankfully fled their presence. In the hour after breakfast, Talia covered a great deal of ground. She first left the Herald's Collegium and crossed to the separate building that housed Healer's Collegium and the House of Healing. The sun was up by now, though it hadn't been when she'd gone to breakfast, and from the cloudless blue of the sky, it looked as if it was going to be another flawless spring day. Once within the beige brick walls, 
she sought out Healer Devon to let him know of her return and to learn from him if there were any Herald patients in the House of Healing that needed her own special touch. She found him in the still room, carefully mixing some sort of decoction. She entered very quietly, not wanting to break his concentration, but somehow he knew she was there anyway. Word spreads quickly. I knew you'd gotten back last night, he said without turning around. And most welcome you are too, Talia. She chuckled a little. I should know better than to try and sneak up on someone with the same gift I have. He set his potion down on the table before him, stoppered it with care, and turned to face her. As a smile reached and warmed his hazel eyes, he held out brown stained hands in greeting. Your aura child is unmistakable, and right glad I am to feel it again. She took both his hands in her own, wrinkling her nose a little at the pungent odors of the still room. I hope you're glad to see me for my own sake, and not because you need me desperately, she replied. Much to her relief, he assured her that there were no heralds at all among his patients at the moment. Just wait until the midsummer storms south, or the pirate raids west, though he told her, his dark eyes rueful. Rene will have her greens by winter. She's got every intention of going back south to be stationed near her home. You're back in good time. You'll be the only trained mind healer besides Patras here when she leaves, and it's possible we may need you for patients other than Harold's. Next she returned to the Harold's wing for an interview she had not been looking forward to. She knocked hesitantly on the door to Elkarth's office, and found that not only was Elkarth there, but that the Seneschal's herald was with the dean. During the next hour, she reported as dispassionately as she could all that had happened during her internship. She did not spare herself in the least, admitting fully that she had concealed the fact that she was losing control over her gift, admitting that she did not confess the fact until forced to by Chris. She told them what Chris had not that she had nearly killed both of them. They heard her out in complete silence until she had finished, and sat with her hands clenched in her lap, waiting for their verdict on her. What have you concluded from all this? Elkarth asked unexpectedly. That, that no one herald can stand alone, not even the Queen's own, she replied after thought. Perhaps especially the Queen's own. What I do reflects on all heralds, and more so than any other just because I'm so much in the minds of the people. And of the proper usage of your gift? Carol asked. I... I don't really know entirely, she admitted. There are times when what I need to do is quite clear, but most of the time it's so... so nebulous. It's going to be pretty much a matter of weighing evils and necessity, I guess. Elkarth nodded. If I have time, I'll ask advice from the circle before I do anything irrevocable, but most of the time I'm afraid I won't have that luxury. But if I make a mistake, well, I'll accept the consequences and try and make it right. Well, Harold Talia, Elkarth said black eyes bright with what Talia finally realized was pride. I think you're ready to get into harness. Then I passed? What did I tell you? Kirill shook his head at his colleague. I knew she wouldn't believe it until she heard it from our lips. The iron-haired, granite-faced herald unbent enough to smile warmly at her. Yes, Talia, you did very well. We're quite pleased with what you and Chris have told us. You took a desperate situation that was not entirely of your own making and turned it around by yourselves. And we are satisfied with what you told us just now, Elkarth added. You've managed to strike a decent balance in the ethics of having a gift like yours, I think. So, now that you've had the sweet compliments, are you ready for the bitter? There's a council meeting shortly. Yes, sir, she replied. I've been warned. About more than just the meeting, I'll wager. Senior, that would be compromising my sources. Lord and lady, 
Elkarth's sharp features twitched as he controlled his urge to laugh. She sounds like Telomere already. Kirill just shook his head ruefully. That she does, brother. Well enough, Talia. We'll see you there. You'd best be off. I imagine Selene is wanting to discuss a few things with you before the council meeting itself. Talia knew a dismissal when she heard one, and took her leave of both of them with a light foot to match her lightened heart. Talia! Selene forestalled all formality by embracing her herald warmly. Bright lady, how I have missed you! Come in here where we can have a little privacy. She drew Talia into a granite-walled alcove, holding a single polished wooden bench just off the corridor leading to the council chamber. As usual, she was dressed as any of her heralds, with only the thin circlet of royal red gold that rested on her own golden hair proclaiming her rank. Let me get a good look at you. Havens, you look wonderful, but you've gotten so thin. Haven't to eat my own cooking, Talia replied. That's all. I would have tried to see you last night. You wouldn't have found me, Selene said, blue eyes dark with affection. I was closeted with the Lord Marshal going over troop deployments on the border. By the time we were finished, I wouldn't have been willing to see my resurrected father. I was that weary. All those damn maps. Besides, the first night back from internship is always spent with your closest friends. It's tradition. How else can you catch up on 18 months of news? Eighteen months of gossip, you mean? Talia grinned. I understand Chris and I caused a little ourselves. From your offhand manner, can I deduce that my thoughts of a deathless romance are in vain? Her eyes danced with amusement, and she pouted in feigned disappointment. Talia shook her head in mock exasperation. You too? Bright havens, is everyone in the Collegium determined to have us mated, whether we will or no? The sole exceptions are Kirill, Elkarth, Skiff, Keren, and, of all people, Albrick. They all swore that if you ever lost your heart, it wouldn't be to Chris's pretty face. They could be right. Selene noted her herald's faintly troubled expression and deemed it prudent to change the subject. Well, I'm more than happy to have you at my side again, and I could have used you for the past two months. Two months? Is it anything to do with what Elspeth sent Skiff out to us for? Did she? That minx. Probably. She hasn't been any more pleased over the council's actions than I have. I've gotten an offer for Elspeth's hand from a source that is going to be very difficult for me to refuse. Say on. Selene settled back on the bench, absently caressing the arm of it with one hand. We received an envoy from King Alessander two months ago, a formal request that I consider wedding Elspeth to his Ankar. There's a great deal to be said for the match. Ankar is about Chris's age, not too great a discrepancy as royal marriages go. He's said to be quite handsome. This would mean the eventual joining of our kingdoms, and Alessander has a strong and well-trained army, much larger than our own. I'd be able to spread the heralds into his realm, and his army would make Carsey think twice about ever invading us again. Three quarters of the councillors are for it unconditionally. The rest favor the idea, but aren't trying to shove it down my throat like the others are. Well, Talia replied slowly, twisting the ring Chris had given her. You wouldn't be hesitating over it if you didn't feel there was something wrong. What is it? Firstly, unless I absolutely have to, I don't want Elspeth sacrificed in a marriage of state. Frankly, I'd rather see her live unwedded and have the throne go to a collateral line than have her making anything but a match that is at least based on mutual respect and liking. Salonay played with a lock of hair, twisting it around one of her long, graceful fingers, thereby betraying her anxiety. Secondly... She's very young yet. I'm going to insist she finish her training before making a decision. Thirdly, I haven't seen Ankar since he was a babe in arms. I have no idea what kind of a man he's grown into, and I want to know that before I even begin to seriously consider the match. To tell the truth, I'm hoping for her to have a love match, and that with someone who is at least chosen, if not a herald. 
I saw for myself what kind of problems that can come when the Queen's consort is not co-ruler, yet has been trained to the idea of rule. And you know very well that Elspeth's husband will not share the throne unless he too is chosen. Good points, all of them. But you have more than that troubling you. Talia had fallen into reading the Queen's state of mind as easily as if she'd never been away. Now I know why I've missed you. You always manage to ask the question that puts everything into perspective. Selene smiled again, with delight. Yes, I do. But it wasn't the kind of thing I wanted to confess to the council or even to Kirill, bless his heart. They'd put it down to a silly woman's maunderings and mutter about moon days. What's bothering me is this. It's too pat, this offer. It's too perfect. Too much like the answer to everyone's prayers. I keep looking for the trap beneath the bait and wondering why I can't see it. Perhaps I'm so in the habit of suspicion that I can't trust even what I know to be honest. No, I don't think that's it. Talia pursed her lips thoughtfully. There is something out of kelter, or you wouldn't be so uneasy. You've mind speech and a touch of foresaying, right? I suspect that you're getting foggy foresight that something isn't quite right about the idea and your uneasiness is being caused by having to fight the council with no real reasons to give them. Bless you. That's exactly what it must be. I've been feeling for the past two months as if I were trying to bail a leaky boat with my bare hands. So use Elspeth's youth and the fact that she has to finish her training as an excuse to stall for a while. I'll back you. When Kirill and Elkarth see that I'm backing you, they'll follow my lead, Talia said with more confidence than she actually felt. Remember, I have a full vote in the council now. Between the two of us, we have the power to veto even the vote of the full council. All it takes is the monarch and queen's own to overturn a council vote. I'll admit it isn't politic to do so, but I'll do it if I have to. Selene sighed with relief. How have I ever managed all these years without you? Very well, thank you. If I hadn't been here, I expect you'd have managed to stall them somehow, even if you had to resort to Devon physicking Elspeth into a phony fever to gain time. Now, isn't it time to make our entrance? Indeed it is, Selene smiled with just a hint of maliciousness. And this is a moment I have long waited for. There are going to be some cases of chagrin when certain folk realize you are Queen's own in truth, vote and all, and that the full council will be in session from now on. They rose together and entered the huge, brass-mounted double doors of the council chamber. The other members of the council had assembled at the table. They stood as one as the queen entered the room, with Talia in her proper position as queen's own, one step behind her and slightly to her right. The council chamber was not a large room and had only the horseshoe council table and the chairs surrounding it as furnishings, all of a dark wood that age and much handling had turned nearly black. Like the rest of the palace, it was paneled only halfway in wood, the rest of the room, from about chin height to the ceiling, being the gray stone of the original palace keep. A downscaled version of Selene's throne was placed at the exact center of the council table. Behind it was the fireplace, and over the fireplace, the arms of the monarch of Valdemar, a winged white horse with broken chains about its throat. On the wall over the door, the wall that her throne faced was an enormous map of Valdemar inscribed on heavy linen and kept constantly up to date. It was so large that any member of the council could read the lettering from his or her seat. The work was exquisite. Every road and tiny village carefully delineated. The chair to the immediate right of the queen's was Talia's. To the immediate left was the seneschal's. To the left of the seneschal sat Kirill. To Talia's right the Lord Marshal. The rest of the councillors took whatever seat they chose, without regard for rank. Talia had never actually used her seat until this moment. By tradition it had to remain vacant until she completed her training and was a full herald. She had been seated with the rest of the councillors and had done nothing except voice an occasional opinion when asked, and give her observations to Selene when the meetings were over. 
While her new position brought her considerable power, it also carried considerable responsibility. The counselors remained standing, some with visible surprise on their faces. Evidently, word of her return had not spread as quickly through the court as it had through the collegium. Selene took her place before her chair, as did Talia. The queen inclined her head slightly to either side, then sat, with Talia sitting a fraction of a second later. The counselors took their own seats when the queen and queen's own were in their places. I should like to open this meeting with a discussion of the marriage envoy from Alessandal, Selene said quietly, to the open surprise of several of her counselors. Talia nodded to herself. By taking the initiative, Selene started the entire proceedings with herself on the high ground. One by one, each of those seated at the table voiced their own opinions. As Selene had told Talia, they were uniformly in favor of it, most desiring that the match be made immediately. Talia began taking stock of the counselors, watching them with an intensity she had never felt before. She wanted to evaluate them without using her gift, only her eyes and ears. First was Lord Garthieser, who spoke for the North, Orthalan's closest ally without a doubt. Thin, nervous, and balding, he punctuated his sentences with sharp movements of his hands. Though he never actually looked directly at Ortholin, Talia could tell by the way he oriented himself that his attention was so bound on Ortholin that no one else made any impression on him at all. There can be no doubt, Garthieser said in a rather thin and reedy voice, that this betrothal would bring us an alliance so strong that no one would ever dare dream of attacking us again. With Alessandar's army ready to spring to our rescue, not even Kasi would care to trifle with us. I venture to predict that even the border raids would cease, and our borders would be truly secure for the first time in generations. Orthalan nodded, so slightly that Talia would not have noticed the motion if she had not been watching him. And she wasn't the only one who caught that faint sign of approval. Garthieser had been watching for it, too. Talia saw him nod and smile slightly in response. Elkarth and Kirill were next. Elkarth perched on the edge of his chair and looking like nothing so much as a gray snow wren, and Kirill as nearly motionless as an equally gray granite statue. I can see no strong objections, Elkarth said, his head slightly to one side. But the heir must be allowed to finish her training and her internship before any such alliance is consummated. And Prince Ankar must be of suitable temperament, Kirill added smoothly. This kingdom, forgive me, Highness, this kingdom has had the bitter experience of having a consort who was not suitable. I, for one, have no wish to live through another such experience. Lady Wyrist spoke next, who stood for the East another of Ortholin's supporters. This plump, fair-haired woman had been a great beauty in her time and still retained charm and magnetism. I am totally in favor, and I do not think this is the time to dally. Let the betrothal be as soon as possible, the wedding even. Training can wait until after alliances are irrevocable. She glared at Elkarth and Kirill. It's my border the Carsites come rampaging over whenever they choose. My people have little enough, and the Carsites regularly rave away what little they have. But it is also my border that would be open to new trade with our two kingdoms, firmly united, and I can see nothing to find fault with. White-haired, snowy-bearded Father Alden, the Lord Patriarch, spoke up wistfully. As my lady has said... This alliance promises peace, a peace such as we have not enjoyed for far too long. Carsey would be forced to sue for lasting peace, faced with unity all along two of its borders. Renewing our long friendship with Hardorn can only bring a truer peace than we have ever known. Though the heir is young, many of our ladies have wedded younger still. Indeed, Bard Hiron so fair-haired that his flowing locks were nearly white, was speaker for the bardic circle, 
he echoed Father Alden's sentiments. It is a small sacrifice for the young woman to make, in the interests of how much we would gain. Talia noted dubiously that his pale gray eyes practically glowed silver when Ortholin nodded approvingly. The thin and angular healer Miram, spokeswoman for her circle, was not so enthralled. To Talia's relief, she actually seemed mildly annoyed by Hiran's hero worship, and something about Ortholin seemed to be setting her ever so slightly on edge. You all forget something. Though the child has been chosen, she is not yet a herald, and the law states clearly that the monarch must be a herald. There has never been a reason strong enough to overturn that law before, and I fail to see the need to set such a dangerous precedent now. Exactly, Kirill murmured. The child is just that, a child, not ready to rule by any stretch of the imagination, with much to learn before she is. Nevertheless, I am cautiously in favor of the betrothal, but only if the heir remains at the collegium until after her full training is complete. Somewhat to Talia's surprise, Lord Marshal Randon shared Miram's mild dislike of Ortholin. Talia wondered, as she listened to that scarred and craggy warrior measuring out his words with the care and deliberation of a merchant measuring out grain, what could have happened while she'd been gone to so change him? For when she had last sat at the council board, Randon had been one of Ortholin's foremost supporters. Now, however, though he favored the betrothal, he stroked his dark beard with something like concealed annoyance, as if it galled him having to agree with Ortholin's party. Horse-like Lady Kester, speaker for the West, was short and to the point. I'm for it, she said, and sat herself down. Plump and soft-spoken Lord Gildas for the South was equally brief. I can see nothing to cause any problems, said Lady Catherine of the Guilds quietly. She was a quiet, gray, dove-like woman, of an outer softness that masked a stubborn inner core, and much that would benefit every member of the kingdom. That, I think, is a good summation. Lord Palinor, the Seneschal, concluded. You know my feelings on the matter, Majesty. The Queen had held her peace, remaining calm and thoughtful, but totally noncommittal until everyone had spoken except herself and her herald. Now she leaned forward slightly and addressed them, a hint of command tinging her voice. I have heard you all. You each favor the match, and all of your reasons are good ones. You even urge me to agree to the wedding and see it consummated within the next few months. Very well. I can agree with every one of your arguments, and I am more than willing to return Alessandra's envoy with word that we will be considering his offer with all due gravity. But one thing I cannot and will not do. I will never agree to anything that will interrupt Elspeth's training. That, above all other considerations, must be continued." Lady forbid it, but should I die, we cannot risk the throne of Valdemar in the keeping of an untrained monarch. Therefore, I will do no more than indicate to Alessandra that his suit is welcome, and inform him in no uncertain terms that serious negotiations cannot begin until the heir has passed her internship. Majesty! Garthezer jumped to his feet as several more counselors started speaking at once, one or two growing angry. Talia stood then and rapped the table, and the babble ceased. The argumentative ones stared at her as though they had forgotten her presence. My lords, my ladies, forgive me, but any arguments you may have are moot. My vote goes with the Queen's decision. I have so advised her. It was fairly evident from their dumbfounded expressions that they had forgotten that Talia now carried voting rights. If the situation had not been so serious, Talia would have derived a great deal of amusement from some of the dumbfounded expressions, Ortholin's in particular. If that is the advice of the Queen's own, then my vote must follow, Carol said quickly, although Talia could almost hear him wondering if she really knew what she was doing. And mine, Elkarth seconded, looking and sounding much more confident of Talia's judgment than Carol. There was silence then, a silence so deep one could almost hear the dust motes that danced in the light from the clear story windows falling to the floor. 
It seems, said Lord Garthieser, the apparent leader of those dissenting, that we are outvoted. Faint grumbling followed his words. At the farthest end of the table, a white-haired lord rose. The faint grumbling ceased. This gentleman was the one Talia had been watching so closely, the only one who had not spoken. Orthalan, lord of Wyvern's Reach and Chris's uncle, he was the most senior counselor, for he had served Selene's father. He had served Selene as well throughout her entire reign. Selene often called him Lord Uncle, and he had been something of a father figure to Elspeth. He was highly regarded and respected. But Talia had never been able to warm to him. Part of the reason was because of what he had attempted to do with Skiff. While he did not have the authority to remove any chosen from the Collegium, he had tried to have the boy sent away for two years' punishment duty with the army. His ostensible reason was the number of infractions of the Collegium rules Skiff had managed to acquire, culminating with catching him red-handed in the office of the Provost Marshal late one night. Orthalan had claimed Skiff was there to alter the misdemeanor book. Talia, who had asked him to go there, was the only one who knew he had broken into the office to investigate Hulda's records. He was going to try to see who exactly had sponsored her into the kingdom in an attempt to ferret out the identity of her co-conspirator. Talia had saved her friend at the cost of a lie, saying that she had asked him to find out whether her Holderkin relatives were claiming the privilege tax allowed those who had produced a child chosen. Since that time, she had been subtly but constantly at loggerheads with Ortholin. When she first began sitting on the council, it seemed as if he had constantly moved to negate what little authority she had. He had openly belittled so many of her observations, on the grounds of her youth and inexperience, that she had very seldom spoken up when he was present. He always seemed to her to be just a little too careful and controlled. When he smiled, when he frowned, the expression never seemed to go any deeper than the skin. At first she had chided herself for her negative reaction to him, putting it down to her irrational fear of males, handsome males in particular, for even though past his prime he was a strikingly handsome man. There was no doubt which side of Chris's family had blessed him with his own angelic face. And there was no sin in being a trifle cold, emotionally speaking. Yet for some reason she was always reminded of the wyvern that formed his crest when she saw him. Like the wyvern, he seemed to her to be thin-blooded, calculating, and quite ruthless, and hiding it all beneath an attractively bejeweled skin. But there was more to her mistrust of him now, because she had more than one reason to suspect that he was the source of those rumors about her misusing her gift, and she was certain that he had started them because he knew how such vile rumors would affect an empath who was well known to have a low sense of self-esteem. She was equally certain that he had deliberately planted doubts in Chris's mind, knowing that she would feel those doubts and respond. But this time she had cause to be grateful to him. When Ortholin spoke, the rest of the councillors paid heed, and he spoke now in favor of the Queen's decision. My lords, my ladies, the Queen is entirely correct, he said surprising Talia somewhat, for he had been one of those most in favor of marrying Elspeth off with no further ado. We have only one heir, and no other candidates in the direct line. We should not take such a risk. The heir must be trained. I see the wisdom of that now. I withdraw my earlier plea for an immediate betrothal. Alessandra is a wise monarch, and will surely be more than willing to make preliminary agreements on the strength of a betrothal promised for the future. In such ways, we shall have all the benefits of both plans. Talia was not the only member of the council surprised by Ortholin's apparent about face. Hiron stared as if he could not believe what he had heard. The members of his faction and those opposed to him seemed equally taken aback. The result of this speech was the somewhat reluctant, though unanimous, vote of the council to deal with the envoy just as Selene had outlined. The vote was, frankly, little more than a gesture, since together Selene and Talia could overrule the entire council. But though the unanimous backing of her stance gave Selene a position of strong moral advantage, 
Talia wondered what private conversations would be taking place when the council session concluded, and who would be involved. The remaining items on the council's agenda were routine and mundane. Rescinding tax for several villages hard hit by spring floods, the deployment and provisioning of extra troops at Lake Evendim in the hope of making life difficult enough this year that the pirates and raiders would decide to return to easier prey, the finding of a merchant clan that had been involved in the slave trade, the arguments about just how many troops would be moved to Lake Evendim and who would fund the deployment went on for hours. The Lord Marshal and Lady Kester, who ruled the district of the fisherfolk of the lake, were unyielding in their demands for the extra troops. Lord Gildas and Lady Cathan, whose rich grainlands and merchant guilds would supply the taxes for the primary support of the effort, were frantic in their attempts to cut down the numbers. Talia's sympathy lay with the fisherfolk, yet she could find it in her heart to feel for those who were being asked to delve into their pockets for the pay and provisioning of extra troops who would mostly remain idle. It seemed that there was no way to compromise and that the arguments would continue with no conclusion. That would be no solution for the fisherfolk either. Finally, as the Lord Marshal thundered out figures concerning the numbers needed to keep watch along the winding coastlines, a glimmering of an idea came to her. Forgive me, she spoke into one of the sullen silences. I know little of warfare, but I know something of the fisherfolk. Only the young, healthy, and whole go out on the boats in season. Unless my memory is incorrect, the old, the very young, pregnant women, those minding the young children for the rest of the family, and the crippled, remain in the temporary work villages. Am I right? Aye, and that's what makes these people so damned hard to defend, the Lord Marshal growled. There isn't a one left behind with the ability to take arms. Well, according to your figures, a good third of your troopers would be spending all their time on coast watch. Since you're going to have to be feeding that many people anyway, why not provision the dependents instead and have them doing the watching? Once they're freed from having to see to their day-to-day -day food supplies, they'll have the time for it. And what does a watcher need besides a pair of good eyes and the means to set an alert? You mean use children as coast watchers? Garthazer exclaimed. That's, that's plainly daft. Just you wait one moment, Garthazer, Miriam interjected. I fail to see what's daft about it. It seems rare good sense to me. But how are they to defend themselves? Against what? Who's going to see them? They'll be hidden, man, in blinds, the way coast watchers are always hidden. And I see the girls drift. Putting them up would let us cut down the deployment by a third, just as Gildas and Catherine want, Lady Kester exclaimed looking up like an old grey warhorse hearing the bugles. You'd still have to provision the full number, though, you old tight fists. But they'd not have to pay him, one of the others chuckled. But children, Hiron said doubtfully. How can we put children in that kind of vital position? What's to keep them from running off to play? Border children are not very childlike, Talia said quietly looking to Kester, and the speaker for the West nodded emphatic agreement. Silver hair, lad! The only thing keeping these children off the boats is size, Kester snorted, though not unkindly. They're not your soft highborns. They've been working since their hands were big enough to not a net. Aye, I must agree. Lady Wyrist entered this argument for the first time. I suspect your fisher folk are not unlike my holder can. As Herald Talia can attest, border-bred children have little time for childish pursuits. All the more chance that they'll run off, then, Hiron insisted. Not when they've seen whole families burned out by the selfsame pirates they're supposed to be watching for, said Miram. I served out there. I'd trust the sense of any of those children before I'd trust the sense of some high-born greybeards I could name. Well said, lady! Kester applauded and turned sharp eyes on the Lord Marshal. Tell you what else, you old war dog, and you can persuade these troopers of yours to turn to and lend a hand to a bit of honest work now and again. Such as, the Lord Marshal almost cracked a smile. Taking the land work, drying the fish and the 
sponge, mending the nets and lines, packing and crating, readying the long houses for winter? It might be possible. What were you planning to offer? War pay. With the land work off my people's hands, and knowing their folk on land are safe, we should be able to cover the extra bonus ourselves and still bring in a proper profit. With careful phrasing, I think I could manage it. Done, then. How say you, Catherine? Gildas? They were only too happy to agree. The council adjourned on this most positive note. Selene and Talia stood as one and preceded the rest out, Kirill a pace behind them. You have been learning, haven't you? Kirill said in Talia's ear. Me? Yes, you, and don't play the innocent. Elkarth joined his colleague as they stood in a white-clad knot outside the council chamber door, waiting for Selene to finish conferring with the Seneschal on the agenda for the afternoon's audiences. He pushed a lock of gray hair out of his eyes and smiled. That was cleverly done, getting the border lords on your side. It was the only way to get a compromise going. Carthen and Gildas would have agreed to anything that saved the money. With the borderers and those two, we had a majority, and everybody benefited. Talia smiled back. It was just a matter of invoking border or pride, really. We're proud of how tough we are, even as littles. Lovely. Truly lovely, Selene joined them. All those sessions of dealing with hard-headed borderers in the middle of feuds taught you more than a little. Now tell me this, what would you have done if you hadn't absorbed all that fisher folk lore from Karen, Terran, and Cheryl? Sat down? I don't think so. Not when it was obvious that there'd never be agreement. Talia thought for a moment. I think, if one of you hadn't done so first... I would have suggested an adjournment until we could dig up an expert on the people of the area, preferably a herald who has done several circuits there. Fine. That's what I was about to do when you spoke up. We are beginning to think as a team. Now I have a working lunch with Kirill and the Seneschal. I don't need you for it, so you can go find something to gulp down at the Collegium. At one, I have formal audiences, and you have to be there. Those will last about three hours. You're free then until seven and court dinner. After dinner, unless something comes up, you're free again. But Albrecht is expecting you at four. Elkarth grinned at Talia's groan. And Devon at five. Welcome home, Talia. Well, she said with a sigh, it's better than shovel and snow, I guess. But I never thought I'd begin missing field work so soon. Missing field work already? Talia turned to find Chris standing behind her, an insolent grin on his face. I thought you told me you'd never miss field work. She grinned back. I lied. No, he feigned shock. Well, what of the council meeting? She wanted to tell him everything, then suddenly remembered who he was, who his uncle was. Anything she told him would quite likely get back to Orthalan, and Chris would be telling Orthalan in all innocence never dreaming he was handing the man weapons to use against her by doing so. Oh, <laughs> nothing much, she said reluctantly. The betrothal's being held off until Elspeth's finished training. Look, Chris, I'm sorry, but I'm rather short on time right now. I'll tell you later, all right? And she fled, before he could ask anything more. Lunch was a few bites, snatched on the run between the palace and her rooms. Audiences required a slightly more formal uniform than the one she'd worn to the council session. Talia managed to wash, change, and get back in time to discuss the scheduled audiences with the Seneschal. Talia's role here was as much bodyguard as anything else, although her duties included assessing the emotional state of those coming before the Queen and giving her any information that seemed appropriate. The audience chamber was long and narrow, the same gray granite and dark wood as the rest of the old palace. Selene's throne was on a raised platform at the far end. Behind the throne, the wall had been carved into the royal arms. There were no curtains for assassins to hide behind. The queen's own spent the entire time positioned behind the throne to the queen's right, from which position the queen could hear her least whisper. Petitioners had to travel the length of the chamber, giving Talia ample time to read their emotional state, if she thought it necessary to do so. The audiences were quite unexciting. Petitioners ranged from a smallholder seeking permission to establish a dyer's guildhouse on his property to two noblemen 
who had called challenge on each other and were now trying desperately to find a way out of the situation without either of them losing face. Not once did she deem the situation grave enough to warrant reading any of them. When the audience session concluded, Talia sprinted back to her room to change into something old and worn for her weapons drill with Albrecht. Walking into the cell was like walking into the past. Nothing had changed. Not the worn, backless benches against the wall, not the clutter of equipment and towels on and beneath the benches, not the light coming from the windows. Not even Albrecht had changed so much as a hair. He still wore the same old leathers, or clothing like enough to have been the same. His scar-seamed face still looked as incapable of humor as the walls of the palace. His long black hair held neither more nor less gray than it had the last time Talia had seen him. Elspeth was already there, going full out against Jerry under Albrecht's critical eye. Talia held her breath in surprise. Elspeth was, to her judgment at least, Jerry's equal. The young weapons instructor was not holding anything back, and more than once only saved herself from a kill by frantically wrenching her body out of the way of the wooden blade. Both of them were sodden with sweat when Albrecht finally called a halt. You do well, children. Both of you. Albrecht nodded as he spoke. Both Elspeth and Jerry began walking slowly in little circles to keep their muscles from stiffening, while drying their faces with old towels. Jerry, it is more work you need on your defense. Working with the students has made you sloppy. Elspeth, if it was that you were not far busier than any student should be, I would make you Jerry's assistant. Elspeth raised her head, and Talia could see she was flushed with the praise, her eyes glowing. However... You are very far from perfect. Your left side is too weak and you are vulnerable there. From now on you are to work left-handed, using your right only when I tell you to keep from losing your edge. Enough for today. Off to the bath with you. It is like your companions you smell. He turned to Talia, who bit her lip, then said, I have the feeling I'm in trouble. In trouble? It is possible. Albrecht scowled, then unexpectedly smiled. No fear, little Talia. It is that I am well aware how few were the chances for you to keep in practice. Today we will start slowly, and I will determine just how much you have lost. Tomorrow, you will be in trouble. Talia was thanking the gods an hour later that Chris had insisted they both keep in fighting trim as much as possible. Albrecht was reasonably pleased that she had lost so little edge, and kept his cutting remarks to a minimum nor was she the recipient of more than one or two bruising thwacks from his practice blade when she'd done something exceptionally stupid. On the whole, she felt as if she'd gotten off very lightly. Another run, this time to wash and change yet again, and she was back at Healer's Collegium, going over the past eighteen months with Devon and Renee. Both were blessedly succinct. There had not been any truly major mental traumas for Renee to deal with among the heraldic circle. As a result, Talia was able to flee to Companion's Field just as the warning bell for supper sounded at the Herald's Collegium. Roland was waiting at the fence, and she pulled herself onto his back without bothering with going for a saddle. I think, she told him, as he walked off into a quiet copse, that I may die of exhaustion. This is worse than when I was a student. He lipped her booted foot affectionately. Talia picked up a projection of reassurance and something to do with time. You think I'll get used to it in a few days? Lord, I hope so, still. She thought hard, trying to remember just what the Queen's schedule was like. Hmm. Council sessions aren't more than three times a week. Audiences, though, they're every day. Albrecht will torture me every day, too, but I could reschedule, say, Devon before breakfast and just after lunch. Save weapons drill for just before dinner, so I'm only changing twice a day. You, my darling, whenever I can squeeze a free moment. Roland made a sound very like laughing. True, with the tight bond we have, I don't have to be with you physically, do I? What did you think of the audiences? To Talia's delight, he hung his head and did a credible imitation of a human snore. You too? Lord and lady, there's bad estate banquets. Why did I ever think being a herald would be exciting? Roland snorted and projected the memory of their flight across country to get help for the plague-stricken village of Waymeet. Following that, 
with the fight with the raiders that had attacked and fired Heavenbeck. You're right. I think I can live with boredom. What do you think of how Elspeth's coming along? To her surprise, Roland was faintly worried, but could give her no clear idea why he felt that way. Is it important enough to trance down to where you can give me a clearer idea? He shook his head, mane brushing her face a little. Well, in that case, we'll let it go. It's probably just the usual rebelliousness, and I can't say as I blame her. Her schedule is as bad as mine. I don't like it, and I can't fault her if she doesn't either. Talia dismounted beside a tiny spring-fed pool and sat in the grass, watching the sun set and emptying her mind. Roland stood beside her, both of them content with a quiet moment in which to simply be together. Well, I'm into it at last, she said half to herself. I thought I'd never make it sometimes. This had been the first day she had truly been Queen's Own, with all the duties and all the rights, from the right to overrule the council to the right to overrule Selene, though that was one she hadn't exercised and still wasn't sure she had the nerve for, from her duty to ease the fears of her fellows in the circle to the duty to see to the heir's well-being. It was a frightening moment in a way, and a sobering one. On reflection, it almost seemed as if the Queen's own best served the interests of Queen and Country by not being too forward, by saving her votes for the truly critical issues, and keeping her influence mostly to the quiet word in the Queen's ear. That suited Talia. She hadn't much enjoyed having all eyes on her this afternoon, especially not Ortholin's. But Selene had been more at ease just because Talia was there. There had been no mistaking that. In the long run, that was what the job was all about, giving the monarch one completely honest and completely trustworthy friend. The dying sun splashed scarlet and gold on the bottoms of the few clouds that hung in the west, while the sky above them deepened from blue to purple, and the hounds, the two stars that chased the sun, shone in unwinking splendor. The tops of the clouds took on the purple of the sky as the sun dropped below the horizon, and the purple tinge soaked through them like water being taken into a sponge. The light faded, and everything began to lose color, fading into cool blues. Little frogs began to sing in the pool at Talia's feet. Night-blooming jacinth flowers opened somewhere near her, and the cooling breeze picked up the perfume and carried it to her. And just when she was feeling totally disinclined to move, a mosquito bit her. Ouch! Damn! She slapped at the offending insect, then laughed. The gods remind me of my duty. Back to work for me, love. Enjoy your evening. Chapter 3 As if that tiny insect bite had been an omen, things began to go wrong, starting with the weather. The perfect spring turned sour. It seemed to rain every day without a let-up, and the rain was cold and steadily dismal. The sun, when Talia actually saw it, gave a chill, washed-out light. Miserable, that was what it was. Miserable and depressing. The few flowers that managed to bloom seemed dispirited and hung limply on their stems. The damp crept into everything, and fires on the hearths all day and all night did little to drive it out. The whole kingdom was affected. There were new tales reaching the court every day of flooding, sometimes in areas that hadn't flooded in a hundred years or more. This was bound to have an effect on the councillors. They worked like heroes at all hours to cope with emergencies, but the grim atmosphere made them quarrelsome and inclined to snipe at each other at the least opportunity. Every council session meant at least one major fight and two ruffled tempers to be soothed. The names they called each other would have been ample cause for dueling anywhere else. At least they treated Talia with that same lack of respect. She came in for her share of sniping, and that was a positive sign, that she had been accepted as one of them, and their equal. The sniping among equals was something she could cope with though it was increasingly difficult to keep her temper when everyone around her was losing theirs. 
far harder to deal with in any rational way, were Ortholin's subtle attempts at undercutting her authority. Clever those attempts were, frighteningly clever. He never said anything that anyone could directly construe as criticism. No, what he did was hint, oh so politely and at every possible opportunity, that perhaps she was a bit young and inexperienced for her post, that she might be going overboard because of the tendency of youth to see things always in black and white, that she surely meant well, but, and so on. It made Talia want to scream and bite something. There was no way to counteract him, except to be even more reasonable and mild-tempered than he. She felt as if she were standing on sand, and he was the flood tide washing it out from under her. Things were not going all that well between herself and Chris, either. Goddess Talia, Chris groaned, slumping back into his chair. He's just doing what he sees as his duty. Talia counted to ten, slowly, counted the library bookshelves, then counted the rings of the knothole in the table in front of her. He was claiming I was overreacting at the same time that Lady Kester was calling Hiron a pompous pea brain at the top of her lungs. Well, Chris, he's said the same damn things every council session and at least three times during each session. Every time it looks as if the other councillors are beginning to listen to what I'm saying, he trots out the same speech. She shoved her chair away from the table and began pacing restlessly up and down the length of the vacant library. This had been a particularly bad session and the muscles of her neck felt as tight as bridge cables. I just can't see anything at all sinister in my uncle's behavior. Damn it, Chris! Talia, he's old. He's set in his ways. You're frighteningly young to him and likely to usurp his position. Have some pity on the man. He's only human. So what am I? She struggled not to shout but the argument was giving her a headache. I'm supposed to like what he's doing? He's not doing anything, Chris scowled, as if he had a headache too. Frankly, I think you're hearing insult and seeing peril that isn't there. Talia turned abruptly and stared at him, tight-lipped, fists clenched. In that case, she replied, after a dozen slow, careful breaths of dust-laden air. Maybe I should take my irrational fantasies elsewhere. But she turned again and all but ran down the staircase. He called something after her in a distressed voice. She ignored it and ran on. So now they didn't talk about much of anything anymore. And Talia missed that. Miss the closeness they used to have, the way they used to be able to confide their deepest secrets to each other. Truth to be told, she missed that more than the physical side of their relationship, though now that she was no longer used to being celibate, she missed that too. Then there was her relationship, or, more accurately, lack of one with Dirk. His behavior was baffling in the extreme. One moment he would seem determined to get her alone somewhere, the next he shied away from even being in the same room. He would be lurking in the background everywhere she went for a day or two, then, just as abruptly, would vanish, only to reappear in a few days. Half the time he seemed determined to throw Chris at her, the other half equally determined to block Chris from getting anywhere near her. Talia saw her elusive quarry, leaning on the fence surrounding Companion's Field. He was staring, broodingly, off into the far distance. For a wonder, it wasn't raining, although the sky was a dead dull gray and threatening to pour any moment. Derek! He jumped, whipped about, and stared at her with wide, startled eyes. Oh, what are you doing here? He asked, somewhat ungraciously his back pressed hard against the fence, as if that barrier was all that was keeping him from running away. The same as you, probably, Talia replied, forcing herself not to snap at him. 
looking for my companion and maybe somebody to ride with. In that case, shouldn't you be looking for Chris? he asked, his expression twisted as if he'd swallowed something very unpleasant. She couldn't think of a reply and chose not to answer him. Instead, she moved to the fence herself and stood with one booted foot on the first railing and her arms folded along the top, mimicking the pose he had held when she saw him. Talia, he took one step toward her. She heard his boot squelch in the wet grass, then stopped. I, Chris is a very valuable friend, more than a friend. I, she waited for him to say what was on his mind, hoping that this time he'd finish it. Maybe if she didn't look at him, he'd be able to speak his piece. Yes, she prompted when the silence went on so long she'd almost suspected him of sneaking away. She turned to catch his blue, blue eyes, staring almost helplessly at her before he hastily averted them. Uh, I've got to go, he gasped and fled. She was ready to scream with frustration. This was the fourth time he'd pulled this little trick, starting to say something, then running away. And with things somewhat at odds between herself and Chris, she really didn't feel as if she wanted to ask Chris to help. Besides, she hadn't seen Chris much since their last little set-to. With an exasperated sigh, she mind-called Roland. They both needed exercise, and he, at least, would be a sympathetic listener. Chris was avoiding Talia on purpose. When he'd first returned, his uncle had taken time out to give him familial greetings. That was only to be expected. But Ortholin lately seemed to be going out of his way to speak to his nephew two or three times a week, and the conversation somehow always turned to Talia. Not by accident, either. Chris was mortally sure of that, nor were they pleasant conversations, though they seemed to be on the surface. Chris was beginning to get an impression that Ortholin was looking for something. Weaknesses in the Queen's own, perhaps, Certainly whenever he happened to say something complimentary about Talia, his uncle would always insinuate a yes, but surely, in a rather odd and confiding tone. Like the latest example. He'd been on his way back from a consultation with Elkarth about some of his latest far-seeing pupils, when Ortholin had just happened to intercept him. Nephew, Ortholin had hailed him. I have word from your brother. Is anything wrong? Chris had asked anxiously. The family holdings were in the heart of some of the worst flooding in a generation. Does he need me at home? I'll be free in a few weeks. No, no. <laughs> Things are far from well, but it's not an emergency yet. The smallholders have lost about a tenth of their fields in total. Obviously, some are worse off than others. They've lost enough livestock that the spring births are barely going to make up for the losses. Oh, and your brother lost one of his Shinain crossbred stallions. Damn, he's not going to find another one of those in a hurry. Are we needing any outside help? Not yet. There's enough grain and storage to make up for the losses. But he wanted you to know exactly how things stood, so that you wouldn't worry. Thank you, Uncle. I appreciate your taking the time to let me know. And is your young protege settling in, do you think? He then asked smoothly. What with all the emergencies that have come up lately? I wonder if she has more than she can cope with sometimes. Haven's uncle, I'm the last one to ask, Chris had said with a little impatience. I hardly see her any more. We both have duties, and those duties don't let us cross paths too often. Oh, Somehow, I had gotten the impression that you heralds always knew what was happening in each other's lives. Chris really hadn't been able to think of a response to that, at least not a respectful one. I only asked because I thought she looked a bit careworn, and I thought perhaps she might have said something to you, Orthalan continued, his cold eyes boring into Chris's. She has a heavy burden of responsibility for one so young. She's equal to it, Uncle. I've told you that before. Roland wouldn't have chosen her otherwise. Well, 
I'm sure you're correct, Othalin replied, sounding as if he meant the opposite. Those rumors of her using her gift to manipulate were absolutely unfounded. I told you that. She has been so circumspect in even reading others that she practically has to be forced to it. Chris broke off, wondering if he was saying too much. Ah, Orthalan said after a moment, that is a comfort. The child seems to have a wisdom out of keeping with her years. However, if she should feel she's having problems, I would appreciate it if you'd tell me. After all, as the Queen's eldest counsellor, I should be aware of possible trouble. I'd be only too happy to help her in any way I can. But <laughs> she still seems to be carrying over that grudge from her student days, and I doubt she'd ever give me the correct time of day, much less confide in me. Chris had mumbled something noncommittal, and his uncle had gone away outwardly satisfied. But the whole encounter had left a very bad taste in Chris's mouth. He was regretting now the fact that he'd confided to his uncle in one of those early conversations his belief that Talia and Dirk were life-bonded. The man had seized on the tidbit as avidly as a hawk on a mouse. But at the same time, he didn't want to have to face Talia herself with these suspicions awakened. She'd get it out of him, no doubt of it. And while she wouldn't say, I told you so, she had a particular look of lowered eyelids and a quirk at one corner of her mouth that spoke volumes, and he wasn't in the mood to deal with it. Besides, it was only too possible that she'd infected him with her paranoia. If only he could be sure of that. But he couldn't. So he avoided her. Dirk straddled an old worn chair in his room, staring into the darkness beyond the window pane. It was nearly dusk, and as black as midnight out there. He felt as if he were being torn into little bits. He couldn't make up his mind what he wanted to do. Part of him wanted to battle for Talia by all means fair or foul. Part of him felt that he should be unselfish and give Chris a clear field with her. Part of him was afraid to find out what she thought of all this, and a fourth part of him argued that he really didn't want any commitments to females anyway. Look what the last one had gotten him. The last one, Lady Narrell. Oh, gods. He stared at the sullen flickers of lightning in the heart of the clouds above the trees. It had been so long ago, and not long enough ago. Gods, I was such a fool. He and Chris had been posted to the Collegium, teaching their specialties, fetching and foresight. It had been his first experience of court and Collegium as a full herald. I was a stupid sheep looking for a wolf. Not that he hadn't had his share of dalliances, even if he'd always had to play second to Chris. He hadn't minded, not really. But he'd been feeling a little lost. Chris had been born to court circles and flowed back into them effortlessly. Dirk had been left on the outskirts. Van Narrell had introduced herself to him. I thought she was so pure, so innocent. She seemed so alone in the great court, so eager for a friend. And she was so young, so very beautiful. How could he have known that in her sixteen short years she'd had more men in her thrall than a rosebush had thorns? And how could he have guessed she intended to use him to snare Chris. Gods, I was half out of my mind with love for her. He stared at the reflection in the window broodingly. I saw only what I wanted to see, that's for certain. Lost most of my few wits. But there had been just enough sense left to him that when she'd asked him to arrange a private meeting between herself and his friend, he'd hidden where he could overhear her. The artificial grotto in the garden that she had chosen was secluded, but had ample hiding space in the bushes to either side of the entrance. Dirk probed at the aching memory as if it were a sore tooth, taking twisted pleasure from the pain. <laughs> I could hardly believe my ears when I heard her issuing Chris an ultimatum. Come to her bed until she tired of him, or she would make my life a living hell. He had burst in on them demanding to know what she meant, crazy wild with anger and pain. Chris had slipped away, 
and Narrell turned to him with utter hatred in her enormous, violet eyes. When she'd finished what she had to say to him, he'd wanted to kill himself. Again he stared at his reflection. Not everything she said was wrong, he told himself sadly. What woman with any sense would want me? Especially with Chris and Reach. It had been a long time before he'd stopped wanting to die, and a longer time before life became something he enjoyed instead of something he endured. Now, was it all happening again? He was doing his level best to come to terms with himself, and being stuck at the collegium with Talia inside at least once a day wasn't helping. The whole situation was comical, but somehow when he tried to laugh it off, his mirth had a very hollow sound even to his ears. He had thrown himself into his work, only to find that he was watching for her constantly out of the corner of his eye. He couldn't help himself. It was like scratching a rash. He knew he shouldn't, but he did it anyway, and it gave him a perverse sort of satisfaction, and even though it troubled him to watch her, it troubled him more not to. Gods, gods, what am I going to do? The reflection gave him no answer. After three weeks of rain, the weather had cleared for a bit. To Talia's great relief, things were emotionally on a more even keel, at least where the tempers of court and collegium were concerned. The evening had been warm enough to leave windows open, and the fresh air had made a gratifying change in the stuffiness of her quarters. Talia was fast asleep, when the death bell shattered the peace of the night with its brazen tolling. It woke her from a nightmare of flame, fear, and agony. That nightmare had held her in a grip so tenacious that she expected to open her eyes to find her own room an inferno. She clutched the blankets to her chest as she slowly became aware that the air she breathed was cool and scented with night mist, not smoke-filled and choking. It took several moments for her to clear her mind of the dream, enough to think clearly again, and when at last she did, it was to realize that the dream and the death bell's tolling had related causes. Fire. Her nails bit into her palms as she clenched her hands. When fire was involved, the herald most likely to be involved with it was, Griffin, dear gods, let it not be Griffin, not her yearmate, not her friend. But as she stared on seeing into the darkness, and forced herself into a calmer frame of mind. She knew without doubt that it was not Griffin after all. The name and the face that hazed into her now receptive mind were those of a student of the year following hers, Krista, whom she remembered as one of Dirk's pupils in the gift of fetching. And in many ways, this was an even greater tragedy, for Krista had still been on her internship assignment. When the pieces were all assembled from the various fragments the heralds at the Collegium had read when the death bell began ringing, the result was almost as confusing as having no information at all. This much alone they knew. Krista was dead. The herald assigned as her counselor, the cheerfully lascivious Destria, was badly hurt, and the cause had something to do both with raiders and a great fire. The information they received from the heralds stationed with the healing temple to which Destria had been carried was nearly as fragmentary. Their gifts of mind speech weren't nearly as strong as Kirill's or Cheryl's, but they made it plain that Destria needed more help than they could provide, and that there was urgent need of a different kind of aid. They were sending Destria back to Healer's Collegium and the palace, and with her would come clarification. Within the week they came. One uninjured herald... Destria, a pitiful thing carried on a litter swung between two companions, one of them Destria's Sophie, and a battered and bruised farmer whose clothing still bore the smoke stains and ash of a fire. All three of them had to have traveled day and night with scarcely a pause to rest to reach the capital so quickly. Selene called the council into immediate session, and the petitioner came before them. He sagged wearily into the chair they set for him, his eyes sunken deeply into their sockets, his hair so full of ash it was hard to tell what color it was. It was plain he had wasted not even a single hour, but had gotten on with the journey without taking time for his own comfort. And the tale he told, of well-armed, organized raiders and the near massacre of everyone in his town, was enough to chill the blood. They had given him a seat, 
since he was plainly too weary to stand for very long, and he seemed like an omen of doom, sitting before the council table, both hands bandaged to the elbow. The taint of smoke had so permeated his clothing that it was carried even to the councillors, and the smell of it brought his message home with terrible force. It was slaughter, pure and simple, he told the council in a voice roughened by the smoke, and we walked into it like silly sheep. Up until this spring we've had so much problem with brigands, little bands of them pecking away at us, that we'd come to expect them like spring floods. Then, when they all vanished this winter, God, you'd think we'd have had the sense to realise something was up, but we didn't. We just thought they'd gone off to richer pickings. Ah, fools, fools and blind. He dropped his face into his hands for a moment, and when he lifted it again, there were tears on his cheeks from eyes already red. They'd gotten together, you see. One of the wolves had finally proved the strongest, and they'd gotten together. We'd prided ourselves on having put the village in an unassailable valley, sheer rock to our back and sides, and only one narrow pass that let into it. We couldn't be starved or forced out from thirst. We had our own wells and plenty of food stockpiled. Well, they had an answer to that. A handful of them killed the sentries and poisoned the dogs that patrolled the heights, then rained fire arrows down on the village by night. We build with wood and thatch, mostly. The buildings went up like pitch torches. The rest waited outside the pass and picked off those that got as far as the cleft. Have you ever seen rabbits running before a grass fire? That was us. And they were the hungry wolves waiting for dinner to leap into their jaws. Men I've known all my life... I watched getting their legs shot out from underneath them, children hardly old enough to be wearing knives too, even greybeards and grannies. Anybody likely to be able to take up a weapon? They shot to cripple, not to kill. Dead mouths can't tell where they've hid their little treasures, you see. A good half of those they shot may never walk right again. A good quarter bled to death where they lay, and a full quarter of the children burned to death in the houses they set fire to. A muted murmur of horror crept around the table. Lady Kester hid her own face in her hands. A beam of late afternoon sunlight spotlighted the speaker as it poured in through the high windows. It touched him with a clear gold that made his eyes seem even more like burned-out pits in his face. Your heralds were not far, overnighting in a way station, I think. How they knew our plight, I'll never know. Must have been more of your magic, I guess. They came charging up on the backs of the raiders, two of them like a blessed army. Those white horses, the companions, they were damn near an army by themselves. They broke up the ambush at the head of the pass, got them scattered off into the woods for a bat. Then the older one started getting us organized, got us clearing the snipers off the heights. The younger one took off into the burning buildings, hearing cries and looking for somebody to save, I guess. The older one didn't even notice she was gone until... He swallowed hard, and his hands were shaking. I heard screaming. Worse than before, the older herald. She jerked like she'd been shot. She shouted at us to take the brigands before they got themselves over their fright. Then she headed into the fires herself. I followed. My hands were too burned to hold a weapon, but I thought I might be able to help with the fires. The younger one had gotten trapped on the second floor of one of the houses. I was right behind the older one, and I could see her against the fire. Calm as you please, she's tossing younglings out to their parents. At least I think she was tossing them. She'd have a little one in her hands one moment, then the next his mum or dad would be holding it. The older one ran up, started shouting at her to jump. She just shook her head and turned back one more time. The floor collapsed then. That damn horse of hers crashed through the wall and went in after her. The other herald was right on his heels. She'd no sooner cleared the door when the whole roof caved in. We got her out, but the other... One of Selene's pages brought him wine, and he drank it gratefully, his teeth chattering against the rim of the tankard. That's what happened. For us, we beat them back, but we didn't get more than a handful of them compared to the numbers we know they've got. They're coming back, we know they are, especially since they must know the heralds are gone. We lost half the town, most of the able-bodied. I was about the only one that could make the ride here. We need help, Majesty. My lords, we need it bad. You'll have that help, Selene pledged, 
her eyes hard and black with anger as she stood. This isn't the first incursion of these bastards we've heard of, but it's by far and away the worst. It's obvious to me that there is no way we can expect you folk to handle brigands as organized as these are. Lord Marshal and good sir, if you'll come with me, we'll mobilize a company of the guard. She looked inquiringly at the rest of the council. Lady Catherine spoke for all of them. Whatever is needed, Highness. You and the Lord Marshal are the best judge of what that is. We'll stand surety for it. Talia nodded with all the other counselors. What Selene had told the man was true. For the past few months, there had been tales of bandits growing organized in Jar Falcon's marches. Sporadic raids had occurred before this, but never had the brigands dared to put an entire town to the sword. It was obviously more than local militia could handle. The entire council was agreed on that. Talia slipped away then, knowing with certainty that Selene did not need her at the moment, and that another most definitely did. The tug at her was unmistakable. She opened the door to the council chamber just enough to slip through, and once she was out into the cool, dark hallway, broke into a run. She ran out through the old palace and past the double doors of Harold's Collegium, then down the echoing main hall, heading for the side door and for healers. She felt the pull of a soul in agony as clearly as if she were being called by voice. She all but collided with Devon, who was on his way to look for her. I might have known you'd know, he said gratefully, hitching up his green robe so that he could run with her. Talia, she's fighting us, and we can't get past her shield and to do even the simplest pain blocks. She blames herself for Krista, and all she wants to do now is die. Renee can't do anything with her. That's what I thought. Lord and Lady, the guilt is so thick I can almost see it. Well, let's see if I can get through to her. They had accomplished a certain amount of healing at the site of the battle, while Destria was still unconscious, enough to enable moving her safely. She still was a most unpretty sight, lying on a special pad in one of the rooms reserved for burn patients. The room itself was bare stone, scrubbed spotless twice a day when unoccupied, and not so much as a speck of dust was ever allowed to settle there. The one window was sealed tight so that nothing could blow in. Everything that was brought in was removed as soon as it was no longer needed and scalded. It was a tribute to the on-site healers that Destria was still among the living. The last person Talia had seen with burns like hers had been Vostal, who had taken the full fury of an angry firebird on his fragile flesh. Where her burns had been relatively light, though the skin was red, puffed, and blistering, she was unbandaged. But her arms and hands were wrapped in special poultices of herbs and the thinnest and most fragile of tanned rabbit and calfskin. And Talia knew that, beneath those bandages, the skin was gone and the flesh left raw. They had laid her on a pallet of lambskin, tanned with the wool on, the fibers would cushion her burned skin and prevent too much pressure from being exerted on it. Talia knelt at the head of the pallet and rested both her hands on Destria's forehead. Destria's face and head were the only portions of her that were relatively untouched. As Talia reached into the whirlwind of pain, delirium, and guilt with her gift, she knew that this was likely to be the hardest such fight she'd ever faced. Guilt black and full of despair, surrounded Talia from all directions. Pain, physical and mental, lanced through the guilt like red lightning. Talia knew her first priority was to find out why the guilt existed in the first place and where it was coming from. That was easy enough. She simply lowered her shielding a fraction more and let herself be drawn in where the negative emotions were the thickest. The fading core that was Destria spun an ever-tightening cocoon of bleakness around herself. Talia reached for that cocoon with a softly glowing mental hand and withered it until that which was Destria stood cringing before her. Talia paid no heed to her attempts at escape, but drew her into a rapport in which nothing was hidden, not from her and not from Destria. And she let Destria read her as she strove to begin the healing of the other herald's mental hurts. I failed. That was the most overwhelming. They counted on me, and I failed. But there was something more, 
something that kept the guilt feeding on itself until Destria loathed her own being, and Talia found it, hiding underneath, festering. And I failed, because I wanted something for me. I failed, because I was selfish. I don't deserve my whites. I deserve to die. This was something Talia was only too familiar with, and was something Renee wouldn't understand. Healers were firm believers in a little honest selfishness. It kept a person sane and healthy. Heralds, though. Well, heralds were supposed to be completely unselfish, totally devoted to duty. That was nonsense, of course. Heralds were only people. But sometimes they started to believe in that nonsense, and when something went wrong, because of their natures, the first people they tended to blame were themselves. So now Talia had to prove to Destria that there was nothing wrong with being a herald and human. No small task, since Destria's guilt was akin to doubts she shared about herself. How often had she berated herself for wanting a little corner of life to call her own, some time when she didn't have to be a herald, when she had been so tired of having to think first of others before taking the smallest action, how many times had she yearned for a little time to be lazy, a chance for a bit of privacy, and then felt guilty because she had? And hadn't she been ready to assume that she was guilty of unconsciously using her empathy to manipulate others? Hadn't she been angry enough to strangle someone more than once and then been angry at herself for giving in to the weakness of rage? Oh, she understood Destria's self-loathing only too well. Renée and the rest of the healers watched soberly, sensing the battle Talia fought, though except for the perspiration beating Talia's brow, there were no outward signs of a struggle. They all remained in the same positions they had first taken as the shadows cast through the window lengthened almost imperceptibly, and the light slowly faded, and still there was no outward indication of success or failure. Then, after the first half hour, Renée whispered to Devon, I think she's getting somewhere. Destria threw me out after the first few minutes and wouldn't let me in again. When a full hour had passed, Talia sighed, then carefully broke her physical contact with the other herald and slumped with exhaustion, her hands lying limply on her thighs. Go ahead. I've got her convinced for now. She won't fight you at the moment. As she spoke, the waiting healers converged on Destria like worker bees on an injured queen. Renée, whose gift of healing was, like Talia's, for minds rather than bodies, helped Talia to her feet. Why couldn't I get through to her? she asked plaintively. Simple. I'm a herald. You're not, Talia said, edging past the healers and out into the hall. She reacted to you the way you would react to a non-healer trying to tell you that a good stab was nothing to worry about. Gods, I'm tired, and I'll have it all to do again tomorrow, or she'll fight you again. And then, when I finally convince her permanently that it wasn't her fault, I'll have to convince her she isn't going to revolt men with the way she'll look when you're done, and that the scarring isn't some punishment set on her for being a bit randy. I was afraid of that, Renée bit her lip. And she is going to scar. I can't tell you how badly yet, but there's no getting around it. Her face wasn't touched, but the rest of her, some of it isn't going to be at all pretty. The only burn victim I've ever heard of that was as bad was... Despite her weariness, Talia's eyes lighted when she saw an idea begin to form behind Renée's frown. Out with it, my lady. You've the same gift as I have, and if you've gotten a notion, it's probably going to work. She paused in the hallway and leaned against the wood-paneled wall. Renée rubbed the bridge of her long nose with her finger. Faustel, what does he do now? Could he be recalled here for a while? She asked, finally, hope in her cloud-gray eyes. Relay at the Fallflower Healing Temple, and yes, anyone on relay work can be replaced. What are you thinking of? That he'll be the best medicine for her. He went through it all himself. He knows how it hurts and when it'll stop and how you have to force yourself to work through the pain if you intend to get the full use of your limbs back. And he's a herald, so she'll believe what he says. Besides all that, despite the old scars, he's still a better-than-passable-looking man. And he doesn't believe in the fates dealing out arbitrary punishments for a little healthy hedonism. Talia chuckled in spite of herself. Oh, very good. 
If we have him at her side coaxing and encouraging, he'll do half our work for us. You're right about his beliefs, too. All I had to do was keep reassuring him that the pain would end, and that he wasn't being a coward and a whiner for occasionally wanting to give up. I've no doubt they'll find each other quite congenial when Destry is back to something like her old self and her old appetites. I'll see Kittle and get Vostel sent here as soon as he can be replaced. He'll be here by the time she starts to need him. Talia moved away from the wall and stumbled as her knees wobbled a little. They had only gotten a few feet down the hall and already her exhaustion was threatening to overwhelm her. Renée steered her toward a soft and comfortable-looking padded bench, one of the many placed at intervals along the walls, for healers were apt to catch oddments of rest wherever and whenever they could. And you, you get yourself down onto that couch and take a short nap. I'll wake you. But if you don't take some recovery time, you won't be of any use to any of us. You know the saying, never argue with a healer. And I never do. See that you keep it that way. About a week later, Talia was on her way from the audience chamber to her own room to change for arms practice, and her mood was a somber one. The audiences were no longer dull, and that was unfortunate. More and more often those seeking audience with the Queen were from Gyra Falcon's marches, reporting the depredations of what was obviously a small army of bandits. It was the wild and rocky character of the countryside that had let them organize without anyone realizing it. That same wild countryside enabled them to vanish before the guard could pin them down. Ortholin was using the existence of these bandits as a political tool, a tactic that disgusted Talia, considering the suffering that they were causing, not to mention that they were preying on some of the lands supposedly in his jurisdiction. She had just endured one such session. There were six heralds out there now, along with the guard company Selene had sent, the heralds were organizing the common folk to their own defense, since the guard could not be everywhere at once. One of those heralds, Harold Patris, sent a messenger that had only arrived today. They seem to know exactly where the guard is at all times, Patris had written. They strike and are away before we can do anything. They know these hills of stone and the caves that honeycomb them better than we guessed. I suspect them of traveling a great deal underground, which would certainly answer the question of how they move about without being spotted. At this point we are beyond saving the livestock or the harvest. Majesty, I must be frank with you. It will be all we can do just to save the lives of these people. And I must tell you worse yet. Having stripped them of all possessions, the bastards have taken to carrying off the only thing these folk have left, their children. Great goddess! Lady Wyrist had exclaimed. I'm on it, Majesty, Lady Catherine had said grimly at almost the same moment. They won't get children out past my guildsmen, not after that slaver scandal. With your permission. Selene had nodded distractedly, and Lady Catherine sprinted from the room in a swirl of colorful brocades. Majesty, Ortholin said then, it is as I have been saying. We need a larger standing army. And we need more autonomy in local hands. If I had been given two or three companies of the guard and the power to order them, this emergency would never have become the disaster it is. Then the debate had broken out, yet again. The council had split on this issue of granting power at the local level and increasing the size of the guard, split about equally. On Ortholin's side were Lord Garthieser, Lady Wyrist, Bard Hyron, Father Alden, and the Seneschal. Selene, who did not want the size of the army increased, because to do so would mean drafted levies and possibly impressment, preferred to keep the power where it was, with the council, and was lobbying for hiring professional mercenaries to augment the existing troops. Backing her were Talia, Kirill, Elkarth, Healer Miram, and the Lord Marshal. Lady Kester, Lord Gildas and Lady Catherine remained undecided. They weren't especially pleased with the notion of foreign troops, but they also weren't much in favor of hauling folk away from their lands and trades either. Talia was pondering the state of things when her sharp ears caught the sound of a muffled sob. Without hesitation, she unshielded enough to determine the source and set out to find out what was wrong. Her sharp ears led her into a seldom-used hallway near the Royal Library, 
one lined with alcoves, which could contain statues or suits of plate mail or other large works of art, but which were mostly vacant and screened off by velvet curtains. This was a favored place for courting couples during great revels, but the lack of seating tended to confine assignations to those conducted standing. She had a little problem finding the source of the sob, as it was hiding itself behind the curtains in one of those alcoves along this section of hall. Only a tiny sniffle gave her the clue as to which of three it was. She drew the heavy velvet curtain aside quietly. Curled up on a cushion purloined from a chair in the audience chamber was a child. He was a little boy of about seven or eight. His eyes were puffy from crying. His face was smeared where he'd scrubbed tears away with dirty fingers, and from the look of him, he hadn't a friend in the world. She thought that he must have been adorable when he wasn't crying. A dark-haired, dark-eyed cherub. The uniform Salonet's pages wore, sky blue trimmed in dark blue, suited his fair complexion. He looked up when the curtain moved, and his face was full of woe and dismay, his pupils dilated in the half-light of the hall. Hello, Talia said, sitting on her heels to bring herself down to his level. You look like you could use a friend. Homesick? A fat tear trickled slowly down one cheek as he nodded. He looked very young to have been made one of Salonet's pages. She wondered if he weren't a fosterling. I was too when I got here. There weren't any girls my age when I first came. Just boys. Where are you from? Shire Falcons, marches, he gulped, looking as if her sympathy had made him long for a comfortable shoulder to weep on, but not daring to fling himself on a strange adult. Can I share that pillow? she asked, solving the problem for him. When he moved aside, she settled in with one arm comfortingly around his shoulders, projecting a gentle aura of sympathy. That released his inhibitions, and he sobbed into the velveteen of her jerkin, while she soothingly stroked his hair. He didn't need her gift, really. All he needed was a friend and a chance to cry himself out. While she gentled him, she pummeled her memory for who he could be. Are you Robin? she asked finally when the tears had slowed a bit. At his shaky affirmative, she knew she'd identified him correctly. Robin's parents, who held their land of Lord Ortholin, had prevailed on Ortholin to take their only child to the safest haven they knew. Court. Understandable, even laudable, but poor Robin didn't see their reasoning. He only knew that he was alone for the first time in his young life. Haven't you found any friends yet? Robin shook his head and clutched her sleeve as he looked up to read her expression. When he saw that she was still sympathetic and encouraging, he took heart enough to explain— they, they're all bigger and older. They call me Tagalong, and they laugh at me, and I don't like their games anyway. I, I can't run as fast or keep up with them. Oh, she narrowed her eyes a little in thought, trying to remember just what it was she'd seen the pages playing at. You took them so for granted they were almost invisible. Then she had it. You don't like playing war in castles. That was understandable enough when fighting threatened his parents. The flicker of the oil lamp opposite their alcove showed her his sad, lost eyes. I, I don't know how to fight. Da said I wasn't old enough to learn yet. That's all they want to do, and anyway, I'd rather r r read, but all my books are still at home, home, home. And if she knew the Seneschal, he'd strictly forbidden the pages to enter the palace library. Not too surprising, seeing as most of them would have played catapults using the furniture with the books as ammunition. She hugged his slight shoulders and made a quick decision. Would you like to be able to read and take lessons at the Herald's Collegium instead of with the pages? Salonet had all of her pages schooled, but for most of them it was a plague to be endured or a nuisance to be avoided. He nodded, his eyes round with surprise. Well, my master, Albrecht, is going to have to wait a little. You and I are going to see Dean Elkarth. She rose and offered her hand. He scrambled to his feet and clutched it. Fortunately, there were plenty of other youngsters being schooled at the Collegia, though few were as young as this one. 
They were the unaffiliated students, the Blues, who had belonged to no collegium but were attending classes along with the Bardic, Healer, and Heraldic students. They, too, wore uniforms, of a pale blue and not unlike the pages' uniform. A good many of them were well-born brats, but there were others that were well-intentioned, those studying to be builders, architects or scholars in many disciplines. They'd be well-pleased to welcome Robin into their ranks, and they'd probably adopt him as a kind of mascot. Talia knew she'd have no trouble in arranging with Selene for this little one to spend most of his time at the Collegium when he wasn't standing his duty. And at his age, his duty was probably less than an hour or two a day. She was pretty certain she'd be able to convince Elkarth as well. She was right. When she took the child to Elkarth's cramped office, piled high with books, the dean seemed to take to Robin immediately. Robin certainly did to him. She left him with Elkarth, the gray-haired herald explaining some of the classes Robin snuggled trustingly against his chair, both of them oblivious to the dust and clutter about them. It seemed that she'd unwittingly brought together a pair of kindred spirits. So it proved. She met Robin from time to time thereafter, once or twice when he'd unthinkingly sought her out as a never-failing wellspring of comfort for homesickness, the rest of the time trudging merrily about the collegium, his arms loaded with a pile of books almost as tall as he, and, more than once, in the library with Elkarth. Once she found them both bent over an ancient tome of history written in an archaic form of the language that little Robin couldn't read himself, but just knew Elkarth could and said so. He was convinced that Elkarth was the original fount of all knowledge. He was bringing Elkarth all his questions as naturally as breathing. Until now, Talia frequently found both of them immersed in something so dry she needed a drink just thinking about it. Kindred souls, indeed. Chapter 4 Dirk sprawled in his favorite chair in his quarters, a battered old piece of furniture long ago faded to indeterminate beige, but one that was as comfortable as an old boot. He wished that he could be as comfortable inside as he was outside. He stared at the half-empty glass in his hand morosely. He shouldn't be drinking on such a fine night. He was drinking far too much of late, and he knew it. But what's a man to do when he can't sleep, when all he thinks of is a certain pair of soft brown eyes, when he doesn't know whether to betray his own heart or his best friend? The only cure for his insomnia was to be found at the bottom of a bottle, so that's where he usually was at day's end. Of course, the cure had its drawbacks. Wretched hangovers, increasingly ill temper, and the distinct feeling that avoiding problems was the coward's way out. He longed for a field assignment. Oh, gods, to get away from the collegium and her. But nothing of the kind was forthcoming. And anyway, they wouldn't assign anything to Chris or him until their current batch of students was fully trained in the use of their gifts. Their students... Gods, there was another reason to drink. He finished the glass without even noticing he'd done so, eyes burning with unshed tears. Poor little Krista. He wondered if anyone else had figured out she had been using her gift to save the little ones in that fire. Any time I close my eyes, I can almost see her. The self-conjured vision was horrific. He could picture her only too easily, surrounded by an inferno, steadfastly concentrating with all her soul because moving anything alive by means of the fetching gift was hard, hard and dangerous, while the building went up in flames around her, and it was all his fault that she'd sacrificed herself that way. He raised his glass to his lips, only to discover that it was empty already. I'm drinking this bottle too fast, and the way she died, it was all his fault. Before Krista had finished training with him, she'd asked him if it was possible to move living things by fetching. Anyone else, he'd have told no. But she was so good, and he was so infernally proud of her. So he told her the truth, and what was more, done what he'd never done before and showed her how. How to move live creatures without smothering them, without twisting them up inside. And he told her, Gods, how well he remembered telling her. 
that when it had to be done, it was far safer to move a living thing from your hands to where you wanted it to go than from where it was to your hands. I am definitely drinking this too fast. The bottle's half empty already. That was why she'd gone in to send the babies out, not fetch them out to her. If only he'd known when he'd taught her what he'd discovered since, researching in the library, that under great stress it was often possible for someone with their gift to transport themselves short distances. He'd meant to tell her, but somehow he never found the time. Now she's dead, horribly, painfully dead, because I never found the time. He shook the bottle surprised to find it empty already. Oh, well, there's another where that one came from. He didn't even have to get up. The second bottle was cooling on the windowsill. He reached out an unsteady hand and somehow managed to grab the neck of it. He'd already taken the cork out when he was sober, then stuck it back in loosely. If he hadn't, he'd never have gotten the bottle open. Gods, I'm disgusting. He knew this was not the way to be handling the problem, that he should be doing what his heart was telling him to do, find Talia and let her help him work it all out. But he couldn't face her. Not like this. I can't let her see me like this. I can't. She'll think I'm... I'm worse than what Narrell called me. Besides, if he did go to her, she'd read the rest of what was on his mind, and then what would he do? Gods, what a tangle he'd gotten himself into. I... I need her, damn it. But do I need her more than Chris does? I don't know, I just don't know. He couldn't ask Chris for help. Not when Chris was the other half of the problem, and music was no longer a solace. Not when every time he played, he could hear her singing, haunting every line. Damn the woman. She steals my friend, she steals my music, she steals my peace of mind. In the next instant, he berated himself for even thinking such things. That wasn't fair, it wasn't her fault. She hadn't the least notion of what she'd done to him. And so far as he'd been able to tell, she really hadn't been spending all that much time with Chris since she'd gotten back. Maybe there was hope for him, after all. She and Chris surely weren't behaving like lovers. But what would he do if they were in love? For that matter, what would he do if they weren't? The level in the bottle continued to go down as he tried and failed to cope. Robin trotted happily down the hall to the Herald's quarters. He adored the Herald's and was always the first to volunteer when someone had a task that would involve his helping them in any way. In this case, it was twice the pleasure. For the Queen's own... Harold Talia had come looking for a page to return some manuscripts she'd borrowed from Harold Dirk for copying. Robin loved Harold Talia better than all the others put together, excepting only Elkarth. Harold's were wonderful, and Talia was even more than usually wonderful. She always had time to talk. She never told him he was being a baby, like Lord Ortholin did when he was homesick. His mamma had told him how important Lord Ortholin was, but so far as Robin was concerned, Talia was worth any twelve Ortholins. He had often wished he could make her smile the way she could cheer him up. She wasn't looking very happy lately, and anything he could do to make her brighten a little, he would, and gladly. There was a swirl of somber robes ahead of him, one of the great lords, maybe even his own lord. Robin kept his eyes down as he'd always been told to do. It wasn't proper for a little boy to gawk at the great lords of state, especially not when that little boy was supposed to be running an errand. If it was Ortholin, it was important for him to see that Robin was properly doing his duty. So it was rather a shock, what with the fact that he was watching where he was going and all, when he tripped and went sprawling face first, all his scrolls flying about him. If the one ahead of him had been a fellow page he would immediately have suspected he'd been tripped to purpose. But a great lord could hardly be suspected of a childish prank like that. The great lord paused just a moment, papers fluttering around his feet, then went on. Robin kept his eyes down, blushing scarlet in humiliation, and began collecting them. Now that was odd. That was very odd. 
He'd had fourteen scrolls when he'd been sent on this errand. He knew because he'd counted them in Talia's presence twice. Now he had fifteen. And the fifteenth one was sealed, not just rolled up like the others. He could have gotten muddled, of course. But he could almost hear Dean Elkarth's voice in his ear, because he'd asked Elkarth just this very week what he should do if he was asked to do something that didn't seem quite right, or if something happened in the course of his duties that seemed odd. One of the older boys had been sent on a very dubious errand by one of the ladies of the court, and there'd been trouble afterward. The page involved hadn't had the nerve to tell anyone until it was too late, and by then his memory was all confused. So Robin had asked the wisest person he knew what he should do if he found himself in a similar case. Do it, don't disobey. But remember, Robin, Elkarth had told him, remember everything. What happened, who asked you, and when, and why, and who was with them. It may be that what you're being told to do is perfectly legitimate. You could have no way of knowing... But if it isn't, you could be the only person to know the real truth of something. You pages are in a very special position, you know. People look at you, but they really don't see you. So, keep that in mind. And if anything ever happens around you that seems odd, remember it. Remember the circumstances. You may help someone that way. Isn't that being a little like a sneak? Robin had asked doubtfully. Elkarth had laughed and ruffled his hair. If you ask that question, you're in no danger of becoming one, my little owl. Besides, it's excellent training for your memory. Very well, then. Robin would remember this. There was no answer when Robin tapped at Harold Dirk's half-open door. When he peeked inside... He could see Harold Dirk slumped in a chair at the farther end of the room by his open window. He seemed to be asleep, so Robin slipped inside, quiet as a cat, and left the scrolls on his desk. Talia didn't need a summons that morning. Anyone with the vaguest hint of her gift of empathy would have come running to the Queen's side. Emotional turmoil, anger, fear, worry was so thick in the air Talia could taste it, bitter and metallic. She caught the first notes of it as she was dressing and ran for the royal chambers as soon as she was decent. The two guards outside the door looked very uncomfortable, as if they were doing their level best to be deaf to the shouting behind the double doors they guarded. Talia tapped once and cracked one door open. Selene was in her outer chamber, dressed for the day but without her coronet. She was sitting behind her work table in her public room, there was a sealed scroll on the table before her. With her were Lord Orthalan, looking unbearably smug, a very embarrassed Chris, an equally embarrassed guardsman, and an extremely angry Dirk. I don't give a fat damn how it got there. I didn't take it, Dirk was shouting as Talia glanced at the sentry outside and entered. She shut the door behind her quickly. Whatever was going on here, the fewer people there were who knew about it, the better. Then why were you trying to hide it? Othalan asked smoothly. I wasn't trying to hide it, damn it. I was looking for my headache powders when this idiot barged in without a buy your leave. Dirk did look slightly ill, pale, with a pain crease between his brows, his sapphire blue eyes thoroughly bloodshot, his straw blonde hair more than usually tangled. We have only your word for that. Since when, Talia said clearly and coldly, has a herald's word been subject to cross examination? Your pardon, Majesty, but what in the Haven's name is going on here? I discovered this morning that some rather sensitive documents were missing, Selene answered, looking outwardly calm though Talia knew she was anything but untroubled. Lord Orthalan instigated a search, and he found them in Harold Dirk's possession. I haven't been anywhere near the palace wings for the past week. Besides, what use could I possibly make of the damned things? Dirk's mental anguish was so intense that Talia wanted to weep. Look, uncle, you know my quarters are just down the hall from his. 
I can pledge the fact that he didn't leave them all last night. Nephew, I know this man is your friend. If I have to be brutally frank, then I will be, Chris said, flushing an angry and embarrassed red. Dirk couldn't have moved anywhere because he wasn't in any shape to move. He was dead drunk last night, just like he's been every night for the past couple of weeks. Dirk went almost purple, then deathly white. So, since when has his inability to move physically hampered anyone with his gift? Now it was Chris's turn to pale. I haven't heard an answer to a very good question. Orthalan, what on earth would Dirk want with those documents? Talia asked, trying to buy a little time to think. They would put someone in this court in a rather indelicate position, Orthalan replied, and let us say that the person is entangled with a young lady with whom Harold Dirk was at one time very much involved himself. Their parting was somewhat acrimonious. His motivation could be complex, revenge, perhaps, blackmail, perhaps. The Queen and I have been attempting to keep this situation from escalating into scandal, but if anyone accepting us saw the contents of these letters, it could throw the entire court into an uproar. I can't believe I'm hearing a counsellor accuse a herald of blackmail, Talia cried out indignantly. You just heard my nephew, his best friend, say he's been drinking himself insensible every night for the past few weeks. Does that sound like normal behaviour for a herald? Orthalan turned to the Queen. Majesty, I am not saying that this young man would have purloined these documents were he in his proper mind, but I think there is more than enough evidence to indicate that... Orthalan, the Queen interrupted him, I... Wait just a moment. Don't anyone say anything. Talia held one hand to her temple, feeling pain stab through her head. The hot press of the emotions of those around her was so intense she was getting a reaction headache from trying to shield herself. Let's just assume for a one moment that Dirk is telling the absolute truth, shall we? But, no, hear me out. Under that assumption, in what way other than someone deliberately going into his room and planting them there, could those documents have gotten where they were found? Dirk, were they there after dinner? Before I started drinking, you mean? Dirk replied bitterly. No, my desk was perfectly clean for a change. When I woke up this morning, there were about a dozen scrolls there, and this was one of them. Fine. I know if someone had gone into your room that normally didn't belong there, you'd have woken up no matter what. I can tell you that I sent Robin to you last night with those poems I borrowed. There were exactly fourteen scrolls, and that wasn't one of them. Now, unless Lord O'Thalan would like to accuse me of purloining those documents, I still had them after you left, Talia, the Queen said, a distinct edge to her voice. I also know that none of the heralds would wake up for a page entering their room unless the page deliberately woke them. The little devils are too ubiquitous, practically invisible, and we all know they're harmless. So, it is possible that sometime between when Robin left me and when he got to your room, Dirk, an extra scroll got added to his pile. God! Selene addressed the fourth person in the room, and the guardsman turned to the queen with gratitude, suffusing his face. Fetch Robin, please, would you? He'll be having breakfast in the page's room about now. Just ask for him. The guard left, plainly happy to be out of the situation. When he returned with Robin, Talia took the child to one side, away from the others, and closer to the queen than to Ortholin. She spoke quietly and encouragingly, taking the initiative before Ortholin had a chance to try and bully him. Robin, I gave you some papers to take to Heddle Dirk last night. How many were there? I... He looked troubled. I thought there were fourteen, but... But... I fell down, and when I picked them up, there were fifteen. I know because Dean Elkarth told me to remember things that were funny, and that was funny. When did you fall down? Near the staircase by the lion tapestry. Was anyone else nearby? Did you run into anyone? 
I wasn't running, he said indignantly. There was a milord, but milady, mamma always told me not to stare at milord, so I didn't see who it was. Bright stars! Orthalan suddenly looked shamefaced, almost horror-stricken, though somehow Talia had the feeling that he was putting on an act. Certainly there was nothing she could sense empathically behind his expression. That was me, and I had the scroll at the time. Stars, I must have dropped it, and the child picked it up. He turned to Dirk, a faint flush creeping over his face, and spread his hands with an apologetic grimace. Harold Dirk, my most profound apologies, Majesty. I hardly know what to say. I think we've all said quite enough for one morning, Selene replied tiredly. Dirk, Chris, I'm terribly sorry. I hope you'll all put this down to an excess of zeal. Talia? Talia just shook her head a little and said, We can all talk about it when we've cooled down. Right now is not the time. Selene gave her a smile of gratitude as Ortholin used this as a cue to excuse himself. Talia was not sorry to see him leave. Selene detailed the guard to escort Robin back and asked Talia, Have you had anything to eat yet? I thought not. Then go do so, and I'll see you in council. The three heralds left together, the guardsman right behind them, escorting a mystified Robin back to the pages' quarters. Talia could feel Dirk seething and braced herself for the explosion. As soon as they were a sufficient distance from the Queen's chambers that they were likely to have no audience, it came. Thanks a lot, friend, Dirk all but hissed. Thanks ever so much, brother. How I ever managed without your help, I'll never know. Look, Dirk, I'm sorry. Sorry? Damn it! You didn't even believe me, my best friend, and you didn't believe a single word I said. Dirk, then, telling everyone I'm some kind of drunken fool. I didn't say that. Chris was beginning to get just as angry as Dirk was. You didn't have to. You implied it very nicely and gave your precious uncle more ammunition to use on me. Dirk. Chris has every right to worry about you if you've been acting oddly, and Chris Dirk's right. Even I could tell you didn't believe him without having to read you. Talia knew she should have kept her mouth shut but couldn't help herself. And he's right about Orthalan. They both turned on her as one and spoke in nearly the same breath. And I don't need any more help from you, Queen's own. Talia, I'm getting very tired of listening to your childish suspicions about my uncle. She went white-lipped with anger and hurt. Fine, then, she snarled, clenching her fists and telling herself that she would not deliver a pair of hearty blows to those stubborn chins. I wash my hands of both of you. You can both go to hell in a gilded carriage for all of me, with purple cushions. Unable to get another coherent word out, she spun on her toe and ran to the closest exit and didn't stop running, until she reached the field and the sympathetic shoulder of Roland. Now look what you've done, Dirk sneered in triumph. What I've done! Chris lost what little remained of his temper and groped visibly for words adequate to express his anger. Gods, I hope you're satisfied now that you've managed to get her mad at both of us. In point of fact, a nasty little part of him Dirk hadn't dreamed existed was pleased, for now at least, that they were on an equally bad footing with Talia. He could hardly admit it, though. Me! All I did was defend myself. I, Chris interrupted angrily, have had just about enough of this. I'll talk to you about this mess if and when you decide to stop behaving like a damn fool, and when you quit drinking yourself into a stupor every night. Until then, this is just a little too public a place for you to start making threats. Chris bit back the angry words that he knew would put any hope of reconciliation out of reach. Far too public, he replied stiffly, and what we have to say to each other is far too 
private, and can and should wait until then. Dirk made an ironic little bow. At your pleasure. There didn't seem to be any way to respond to that, so Chris just nodded abruptly and stalked off down the corridor. Dirk found himself standing alone in the deserted corridor, temples pounding with a hangover, feeling very much abused. He wanted to feel vindicated, and all he really felt like was a fool, and very much alone. By the time Talia arrived for her weaponry lesson, Albrick had heard the rumors that Chris and Dirk had had a falling out. He was not too terribly surprised when Talia appeared for her practice session wearing an expression so coldly impassive it might have been a mask. Few even at the Collegium would have guessed how well he could read the Queen's own, or how well he knew her. She had quite won his heart as a student, so very alone, and so determined to do everything perfectly. She seldom tried to make excuses for herself and never gave up, not even when she knew she had no chance of success. She had reminded him of times long past, and a young and idealistic student cadet of Carsey, and his sympathy and soul had gone out to her. Not that he would ever let her know. He never betrayed his feelings to his students, while they were still students. He had a shrewd idea of how matters stood with her in regard to her feelings about Dirk and Chris, so he had a fairly good idea what her reaction to the quarrel might be. This afternoon the lesson called for Talia to work out alone against the armsmaster. She did not hold back in the least, began attacking him, in fact, with blind fury as soon as the lesson began. Albrick let her wear herself out for a bit. Scar seemed face impassive then caught her with a feint not even a beginner would have fallen for and disarmed her. Enough, quite enough, he said, as she stood white and drained and panting with exhaustion. Have I not told you many times? It is with your intellect you fight, not with your anger. Anger you are to leave at the door. It will kill you. Look how you have let it wear you out. Had this been a real fight, your anger would have done half your enemy's work for him. Talia's shoulders sagged. Master Albrecht. Enough, I have said it, he interrupted, picking up her blade from the floor. He took three soundless steps toward her and placed one calloused hand on her shoulder. Since the anger cannot be left at the door, you will confide it. Talia capitulated, letting him push her gently toward the seats at the edge of the floor. She slumped dispiritedly down onto a bench, pushed up against the wall as he seated himself beside her. After a long moment of silence, she gave him a brief outline of the morning's events. She kept her eyes for the most part on a beam of the late afternoon sunlight that fell upon the smooth, sanded, gray-brown wooden floor. No sound penetrated into the cell from the outside, and the ancient building smelled of dust and sweat. Albrick sat beside her, absolutely motionless, hands clasped around the ankle that rested on his right knee. Talia glanced at him from time to time, but his harsh, hawk-like face remained unreadable. Finally, when she had finished, he stirred just a little, raising his hand to rub the side of his nose. I tell you what I have never admitted, he said after a long pause, tapping his lips with one finger thoughtfully. I have never trusted Lord Orthalan, and I have served Valdemar fully as long as he... Talia was taken aback. But... Why? Any number of small things. He is too perfect a servant of the state. Never does he take for himself any reward. And when a man does not claim a reward visibly, I look for a reward hidden. He does not openly oppose the heraldic circle, but when others do, he is always just behind them, pushing, gently pushing. He is everyone's friend and no one's intimate companion. Also, my companion does not like him. Roland doesn't either. A good measure by which to judge the man, I think. I believe that your suspicions are correct, that he has been striving to undermine your influence with Selene. I think that since he has failed at that, he turns to eliminating your friends, to weaken your emotional base. I think he well knows how it hurts you to see young Dark injured. Talia blushed. 
You are the best judge of the truth of what I say. He shifted on the hard, worn bench and recrossed his legs, ankle over knee. My guess, he knows Chris is your partisan. He could not get Chris to repudiate you, so he decided to set the two great friends at odds with each other in hopes you would be caught in the middle. Me, but... If he is of the mind to undermine your authority, this is one way of it. Albrecht added quietly, hands clasped thoughtfully over one knee, to chip away at those supporting you until they are so entangled in their own misfortune that they can spare no time for helping you. They see what you're getting at now. He's removing my support in such a way that I'm set off balance. Then, when I'm in a particularly delicate position, give me a little shove. Talia flicked out a finger. And, with no one to advise me or give me backing, I vacillate or start making mistakes. And all the things he's been whispering about my not being quite up to the job look like something more than an old man's mistrust of the young. I thought you didn't deal with court politics. She smiled wanly at her instructor. I said I do not play the game. I never said I did not know how the game was played. His mouth turned up a little at one corner. Be advised, however, that I have never told anyone of my suspicions because I seem to be alone in them, and I did not intend to give Lord Ortholin a reason to gaze in my direction. It is difficult enough being from Carsey without earning high-placed enemies. Talia nodded with sympathy. It had been hard enough on her during her first years at the Collegium. She could hardly imagine what it had been like for someone hailing from the land that was Valdemar's traditional enemy. Now I do think he has miscalculated, perhaps to his eventual grief. It is that he has badly underestimated the unity of the circle, I think. Or it is that he cannot understand it. Among the courtiers, such a falling out as is between Chris and Dirk would be permanent, and woe betide she caught between them. Talia sighed. I know they'll make up eventually. Lord of Lights, though, I'm not sure I can deal with the emotional lightnings and thunders till they do. Why couldn't Aradi and Tantris get their hooves into this and straighten it out? Why do you not? Albrick retorted. They are our companions and friends, Delinda, not our overseers. They leave our personal lives to ourselves, nor would any of us thank them for interfering. Yes, they will most probably be whispering sensible things into their chosen's minds, but you know well they will not force either of the two into anything. She sighed wistfully. If I were a little less ethical, I'd fix both of them. If you were a little less ethical, you would not have been chosen, Albrecht pointed out. Now, since the anger is gone, shall we return to the exercise of the body in place of the tongue? Do I have a choice? Talia asked, as she rose from her place on the bench. No, Delinda, you do not, so guard yourself. Elspeth had encountered Orthalan during one of her rare moments of leisure. She was dawdling a bit on her way back to her suite in the palace to dress for dinner with the court. She took dinner with the court once a week to remind everyone, in her own wry words, that they still have an heir. She was standing before an open second-story window, some of the gardens were directly below her. She was wearing a rather wistful expression and hadn't realized there was anyone else in the corridor with her until Ortholin touched her elbow. She jumped and started back, one hand brushing a hidden dagger when she realized who it was and relaxed. Havens! Lord! Un Lord! Ortholin, you startled me out of a year's life! I most sincerely hope not, he replied. But I do wish you would continue to call me Lord Uncle as you started to. Surely, now that you're nearly through your studies, you aren't going to become formal with me. All right, Lord Uncle, since you ask it, just remember to defend me for my impudence when Mother takes me to task for it. Elspeth grinned and leaned back on the window frame a little. Now, what is it that you were watching with such a long face? he asked lightly, coming close enough to look out of the window himself. Below the window were some of the palace gardens. In the gardens, a half-dozen couples, children of courtiers or courtiers themselves, ranging from Elspeth's age upward to twenty or so. They were involved in the usual sorts of activities that might be expected from a group of adolescents in a sunny garden in the spring. 
One couple was engaged in a mock game of tag. One girl was embroidering while her gallant read to her. Two maids were giggling and gasping at the antics of two lads balancing on the basin of a fountain. One young gentleman was peacefully asleep with his head in the lap of his chosen lady. Two couples were simply strolling, hand in hand. Elspeth sighed. And why aren't you down there, my lady? Ortholin asked quietly. Havens, Lord Uncle, where would I get the time? Elspeth's reply was impatient and a touch self-pitying. Between my classes and everything else, besides, I don't know any boys, at least not well. Well, they're skiff, but he's busy chasing Nerissa. Besides, he's even older than Talia. You don't know any young men? when half the swains of the court are near dying just to speak to you. Ortholin's expression of incredulity held as much of bitter as playful mockery, though Elspeth was so used to his manners that she hardly noted it. Well, if they're near dying, nobody told me about it, and nobody's bothered to introduce us. If that's all that's lacking, I will be happy to make the introductions. Seriously, Elspeth, you are spending far too much of your time among the heralds and heraldic students. Heralds make up only a very small part of Valdemar, my dear. You need to get to know your courtiers better, particularly those of your own age. Who knows? You may one day wish to choose a consort from among them. You can hardly do that if you don't know any of them. You have a point, Lord Uncle, Elspeth mused, taking another wistful glance out the window. But when am I going to find the time? Surely you have an hour or two in the evenings? Well, yes, usually. There's your answer. Elspeth smiled. Lord Uncle... You're almost as good at solving problems as Talia. Her face fell a trifle then, and Ortholin's right eyebrow rose as he took note of her expression. Is there some problem with Talia? Only, only that there's only one of her. Mother needs her more than I do, I know that, but I wish I could talk to her the way I used to when she was still a student. She doesn't have the time any more. You could talk to me. Ortholin pointed out. Besides, Talia's first loyalty is to your mother. She might feel obliged to tell her what you confided in her. Elspeth did not reply to this, but his words made her very thoughtful. At any rate, we were speaking of those young gentlemen who are perishing to make your acquaintance. Would you care to meet some of them tonight, after dinner, in the garden by the fountain, for instance? Elspeth blushed, and her eyes sparkled. I'd love to! Then, Ortholin made her a sweeping bow. It shall be as my lady commands. Elspeth thought a great deal about that conversation as she sat through dinner. On the one hand, she trusted Talia. On the other, if there were a conflict of loyalties, there was no doubt to whom her first allegiance was due. She hadn't thought about it before, but the idea of her mother knowing everything about her wasn't a comfortable one, especially since Selene didn't appear to be taking Elspeth's maturity very seriously. But Elspeth had gained inches since Talia had gone, and, with the inches, a woman's curves. She was taking more care with her appearance. She'd seen the glances given some of her older friends by the young males of the collegium, and recently, those glances had seemed very desirable things to collect. She found that lately she was looking to the young men of collegium and court with an eye less bemused and more calculating, and to the eyes of a stranger. She'd looked at herself in her mirror before dinner, trying to appraise what she saw there. Lithe, taller than Talia by half a head, wavy, sable hair and velvety brown eyes, the body of a young goddess, if certain people were to be believed, and the look of one more than ready to know more of life. Yes, there was no doubt that to a stranger she looked more than ready to be thinking about wedding or bedding, certainly old enough by the standards of the court. Or, so Elspeth thought, setting her chin stubbornly. 
Well, if her mother wouldn't see on her own that Elspeth was quite fully grown now, perhaps there were ways to bring that knowledge home to her. And, she thought, catching sight of Lord Ortholin among a group of quite fascinating-looking young men, it just might be rather exciting as well. Chapter 5 The weather, which had briefly taken a turn for the better, soured again. Talia's mood was none too sweet either. The rains returned, and with them, spoiled tempers among the councillors. Again Talia found herself spending as much time intervening in personal quarrels as helping to make decisions. Orthalan, strangely enough, seemed content now to let her alone. He brooded down at his end of the council table like some huge white owl, face blank and inscrutable, pondering mysterious thoughts of his own. This alarmed her more than it reassured her. She took to examining every word she intended to say and weighing it against all the possible ways Orthalan might be able to use what she said against her at some later date. Dirk split his free time, either lurking in her vicinity or hiding out in the wet. The one was as frustrating as the other. Either she didn't see him at all, or she saw him but couldn't get near him. For whenever she tried to approach him, he turned pale, looked around, wearing a frantic expression for the nearest exit, and escaped with whatever haste was seemly. He seemed to have a sixth sense for when she was trying to catch him. She couldn't even trap him in his rooms. Either that, or he somehow knew when she was at the door and pretended he wasn't there. Chris all but hibernated in his room, and Talia was determined not to see him until he apologized for what he'd said to her. While their quarrel of itself was of no great moment, she was tired to death of having to justify her feelings about his uncle. After her little talk with Albrecht, she was certain, with a surety that came all too seldom, that in the case of Ortholin, she was entirely in the right, and he was entirely in the wrong, and this time she was going to hold out until he acknowledged the fact. Meanwhile, she made up for the absence of both of them by trying to be everywhere at once. She was shorting herself of sleep to do so, and still felt there was much she wasn't doing. But there was just so much work. Salonay had asked her to take on the interviews of petitioners from the flooded areas, Devon needed her with three profoundly depressed patients, and there were all those quarrels among the councillors. It was with heartfelt gratitude that she found the sessions with Destria going well. Vostel's arrival put the cap on their success. It was plain to Talia that his reaction to Destria's appearance comforted her immensely. It helped that he regarded her scars as badges of honor and told her so in as many words. And as Renée had thought, he was of tremendous aid when they began Destria's rehabilitative therapy, for he had gone through all this himself. He coaxed her when she faltered, bolstered her courage when it ran out, goaded her when she turned sulky, and held her when she wept with pain. He was doing so much for her that she needed Talia's gift less with every day. Which was just as well, for Selene needed it the more. As soon as one crisis was solved, another sprang up like a noxious weed, and Selene's resources were wearing thin. And when some of the choices she made turned out to be the wrong ones, as soon or late happened, Talia found herself exercising her good sense and gift to the utmost. A drenched and mud-splattered messenger from Harold Patras stood before the council. When the door guard had learned his news, he'd interrupted the session to bring him there himself. Majesty, the man said, with a blank expression that Talia found very disconcerting, and which made her very uneasy. Harold Patra sends this to tell you that the outlaws are no more. He held out a sealed message pouch, as those at the council board erupted in cheers and congratulations. Only the queen, Kirill, and Talia did not join in the rejoicing. There was something about the messenger's expression that told them there was much he had not said. Selene opened the message and scanned it, the blood draining from her face as she did so. Goddess! The parchment sheet fell from her nerveless fingers, and Talia caught it. The queen covered her face with trembling hands as the tumult around the council table died into absolute silence. Her counselors stared at their monarch, 
and at an equally pale queen's own as Talia read Patris's grim words in a voice that shook. We ran the brigands to earth, but by the time they were brought to bay, the temper of the guard was fully aroused. We cornered them at their own camp, a valley overlooked by Darkfell Peak. It was then that they made the mistake of killing the envoy sent to Parley. At that point the guard declared no quarter. They went mad. That is the only way I can describe it. They were no longer rational men. They were blood-mad berserkers. Perhaps it was being out here too long, chasing phantoms. Perhaps the foul weather I do not know. It was hideous. Nothing I or anyone else could say or do was able to curb them. They fell on the encampment, and the outlaws were slaughtered to the last man. Talia took a deep breath and continued. It was not just the outlaws themselves. The guards slew every living thing in their bolt hole, be it man, woman, or beast. But that was not the worst of the horrors, though that was horror enough. Among the dead, Talia's voice failed then, and Kirill took the message from her and continued in a hoarse half-whisper. Among the dead were the very children we had hoped to save. All. All of them dead. Slain by their captors. When it became obvious that they would get no mercy from the god. The counselor stared in dumb shock as Selene wept without shame. Selene blamed herself for not replacing the guard companies with fresher troops, or for not sending someone who could have controlled the weary guardsmen, no matter what strain the troops were under. Nor was the murder of the children the only tragedy, although it was the greatest. Vital intelligence had been lost in that slaughter, who their leader had been, and whether or not he had been acting under orders from outside the kingdom. It took days before Selene was anything like her normal self. The one blessing, so far as Talia was concerned, was that Ortholin exercised a little good sense and chose to back down on his militant stance for more local autonomy. Just as well for Lady Kester's people began having the expected troubles with pirates and coastal raiders, and the promised troops had to be shifted to the west. But before they could reach their deployments, Harold Nathan was seriously hurt, leading the fisherfolk in beating off a slaving raid and that opened up another wonder chest of troubles. Nathan himself came before them, although the healers protested that he was not yet well enough to do so. He was a sharp-featured man, not old but no longer young, brown-haired, brown-eyed, quite unremarkable except for the intensity in those eyes and an anger that kept him going when nothing else was left to him. He sat rather than stood, facing the entire council. He was heavily bandaged, with his arm bound against his side, and still physically so weak he could scarcely speak above a whisper. My ladies, my lords, <clears throat> he coughed. I did not dare trust this to anyone but myself. Messengers can be waylaid, documents purloined. My lord Harold, Garthieser said smoothly, I think you may be overreacting. Your injuries did not cause me to hallucinate what I heard. <clears throat> Nathan snapped, his anger giving him a burst of strength. We captured a prisoner, counselors. I interrogated him myself under truth spell before I was hurt. The brigands are serving those slavers we thought banished. What? Lady Cathan choked out as she half stood, then collapsed back into her seat. There is worse. The slave traders are not working unaided. I have it by my prisoner's confession and by written proofs that they have been aided and abetted by Lord Geoffrey of Helmscarp, Lord Nestor of Laverin, Lord Tavis of Brengard, and trade guildsman Austin Deverell, Gerard Stonesmith, Peter Ringwright, and Eigenhorstfell. He sank back into his own chair, eyes still burning with controlled rage, as the council erupted into accusation and counter-accusation. How could this have occurred without your knowledge, Cathan? Garthieser demanded. By the gods, I begin to wonder just how assiduous you were in rooting out the last lot. You were right up there in the front ranks to accuse me the last time, Garthieser, 
Catherine sneered. But I seem to remember. You were also the one who insisted I do all the dirty work. I am only one woman. I can't be everywhere at once. But Catherine, I cannot see how this could have escaped your knowledge, Hiron protested. Those four named are of first rank. And the other three are Kester's liegemen, added Wyrist suspiciously. I'd like to know how they managed to operate a slaven ring under Kester's nose. And so would I, Lady Kester snapped. More than you, I reckon. And so it went, as Selene mediated the strife among her counselors. Talia had her hands full seeing that she remained sane during all of it. All this, of course, meant that she had no time to pay heed to her own problems, most particularly that of the rift between Dirk and Chris, Chris and herself, and Dirk and herself. It was bad enough that the quarrel existed, but to add yet another pine bough to the conflagrations, Roland was causing her considerable discomfort. He was the premier stallion of the companion herd, and while Talia had been on internship, had only had another stallion, Chris's tantris for company. Now he was making up for his enforced celibacy with a vengeance, and the partner he dallied with most often was Dirk's already. And Talia shared it, couldn't block it if she tried. Not that she blamed Roland, already was sweet, attractive, and a most cooperative partner. She ought to know. She was on the empathic receiving end of all of it, but to have this going on two and three times a week while she positively ached for Aradi's chosen, well, it was unpleasantly like torture. Roland evidently had no notion of what he was doing to his chosen, and Talia refused to spoil his pleasure by letting him know. So she lost further sleep at night, either in suffering through what Roland was unknowingly inflicting on her or in dreams in which she worked desperately to knit up some undefined but important object that kept unraveling. She didn't see Elspeth except at training sessions with Albrick, occasional meals, or now and again with Gwenna out in the field. She seemed a little distracted, and maybe a touch shy, but that was normal for a girl just into puberty, and besides, Talia had her hands full to overflowing. So Talia never once worried about her until one day she realized, with a chill of foreboding, that she hadn't seen the girl in several days, not even at arms practice. Well, that could have been simple circumstance, but it was a situation that needed rectifying, so Talia went looking for her. She found the air in the garden, which was not a place where Elspeth usually spent any time, but she was reading, so she could have decided simply that she needed some fresh air. Hello, Catling. Talia called cheerfully, seeing Elspeth's head snap up at the sound of her voice. Are you waiting for someone? No, no, just got tired of the library. Had she hesitated a fraction of a second before denying that? Say, you've been so busy. I'll bet you haven't heard the latest scrape Tooley's gotten himself into, and I'll bet you could use a good laugh. With that, Elspeth kept the conversation on collegium gossip and then pled tasks elsewhere before Talia could gain control of the situation. The incident left Talia very disconcerted, and when she began seeking the girl out on a regular basis, she only got repetitions of the same. Then Talia began to take note of the specific changes in the girl's behavior. She was secretive, which was unlike her. There was just the vaguest hint of guilt in the way she evaded Talia's questions. Talia took an indirect approach then and began checking on her through her yearmates and teachers. What she found made her truly alarmed. Havens, Tooley said, scratching his curly head in puzzlement. I don't know where she is. She just sort of vanishes about this time of day. Uh-huh, Gerund agreed, nodding so hard Talia thought his head was going to come off. Just lately, she swapped me chores a couple times so she had the hour free, and she hates floor washing. Something wrong? No, I've just been having trouble finding her today, Talia replied, taking care to seem nonchalant. But she was unnerved. These two were Elspeth's closest friends among her yearmates, and they only confirmed what Talia had begun to fear. 
there were gaps of an hour or so in Elspeth's day, during which she was vanishing, and no one seemed to have any idea of where she was. It was time she checked her other sources. The palace servants. Talia perched herself on a settle, next to the cold fireplace in the servants' hall. She had come to her friends, for many of the servants were her friends and had been since she was a student, rather than raise anyone's attention by having them come to her. Seated about her were a half-dozen servitors she had found to be the most observant and most trustworthy. Two of them, a chambermaid called Elise and a groom named Ralph, had pinpointed the guilty parties when a group of the blues, or unaffiliated students, had tried to murder her as a student by attacking her and throwing her into the ice-covered river. Elise had seen several of Talia's attackers coming in mucky and thought it more than odd. Ralph had spotted the entire group hanging about the stable earlier. Both had reported their observations to Elkarth when word spread of the attempt on Talia's life. All right, Talia began. I have a problem. Elspeth is going off somewhere about mid-afternoon every day, and I can't find out where or why. I was hoping one of you would know. From the looks exchanged within the group, she knew she'd found her answer. She's... This goes no further, young Talia. This from Jan, one of the oldest there. He was a gardener, and to him she would always be young Talia. Talia nodded, and he continued. She's hanging about with young my lord Jostle and Corby's crew, them as is no better than rowdies. Rowdies, Elise snorted. If twerent for their high-born das, they'd been sent home long ago for the way they paw over every girl they can catch unawares. Girl, here meant female servant. If Elise had intended to say that the young man had been mishandling other females, she'd have said miladies. Not that this difference was very comforting. It meant that they were only confining unwanted attentions to the women who dared not protest overmuch. It said, added another chambermaid, that at home they gets to mourn pawns. Such as, Talia replied, you know I won't take it elsewhere. Well, mind, my lady, this is just tales, but it's tales I hear from their people. This lot is plain vicious. Besides forcing their attentions on the servants of their estates, it seemed that Corby's crew were given to so-called pranks that were very unfunny. A cut saddle girth before a rough hunt was no joking matter, not when it nearly caused a death and some of these same adolescents were the younger brothers and sisters of those who had tried to murder Talia. But thus far, that anyone knew, Elspeth had not been a participant in any of their activities. It seemed that at the moment she was simply being paid elaborate court to, something new to her that she evidently found very enjoyable. But it could well be only a matter of time before they lured her into some indiscretion, then used that indiscretion to blackmail her into deeper participation. Elspeth's good sense had probably protected her so far, but Talia was worried that it might not be enough protection for very much longer. This required active measures. She tried to set a watch on the girl, but Elspeth was very clever and kept eluding her. She tried once or twice to read her with a surface probe, but Elspeth's shields were better than Talia's ability to penetrate without forcing her. Something was going to have to be done, or among the three of them, Elspeth, Dirk, and Chris were going to drive her mad in white linen. So she decided to try to do something about Dirk first, as being the easiest to get at, and since he wasn't talking to Chris, the way to him was through her blood brother Skiff. I'm as baffled as you are, little sister, Skiff confessed, running a nervous hand through his dark curls. I haven't got the vaguest notion why Dirk's making such an ass of himself. Lord and lady, Talia moaned, rubbing her temple and collapsing onto an old chair in Skiff's room. I'd hoped he'd have said something to you. You were my last hope. If this doesn't clear up soon, I think I'm going to go rather noisily mad. When she had finally given up on trying to manage the problem of Dirk by herself and had sought out Skiff's aid, he'd invited her up to his quarters. He'd been to hers a time or two, but this was the first time she'd seen his. Skiff's room was much like Skiff himself, neat, decked with odd weapons, and thick with books. 
Lately, Talia hadn't had much time to devote to picking her own rooms up, and she found his quarters a haven from chaos. He had only one window, but it looked out over Companion's Field. Always a tranquilizing view. First things first, this bond you've got. Chris was right. It's a life bond, and he's got it too. I have no doubt whatsoever of that. I can tell by the way he looks at you. He looks at me? When? I never see him anymore. Since the fight, he spends all of his time out in the mud. Except at meals. Any meal you take at the Collegium, he spends so much time watching you that he hardly eats. And I think he knows your schedule by heart. Any time you might be passing under a window, he's got an excuse to be near that window. Skiff paced the length of the room restlessly as he spoke, his arms folded. He's wearing himself to a thread. That's why I wanted to talk to you alone here. I don't know how I'm supposed to be able to help when the man won't let me near him. Oh, great. He acts like I was a play carrier. I've tried to get him alone. He won't let me. And that was before all this mess with the argument with Chris. Now it's twice as bad. Avens, what a mess. Skiff shook his head ruefully. He hasn't said anything to me. I can't imagine why he's acting this way. I've had it, though, and I know you're at your wit's end. It's about time we brought this out into the sunlight. Since he won't talk to you, I'm going to make damn sure he talks to me. I'm going to have it out with him, as soon as I can corner him, and I'll do it if I have to trap him in the bathing room and steal his clothes. I'm going to get things settled between him and Chris and him and you if I have to tie you all together in a bundle to do it. Neither of them had reckoned on the whims of fate. Dirk had been fighting what he thought was a slight cold, one of the many varieties that were currently decimating court and collegium alike for about a week. Perversely, he refused to care for it, continuing to escape Talia and Chris by retreating into the dismal weather out of doors. In a bizarre way, he didn't really mind feeling miserable. Concentrating on his symptoms kept him from thinking about her and him. Physical misery provided a relief from emotional misery. So he ducked in and out of the cold and rain, day after day, getting soaked to the skin more often than not, but not doing much about it except to change his clothing. Added to that, the emotional strain was taking a greater toll on him than anyone, including himself, realized. It was midweek, and Talia was taking dinner with the collegium instead of the court. She was watching Dirk out of the corner of her eye the entire time and hoping that Skiff was going to be able to fulfill his promise. She was worried, very worried. Dirk was white to the ears. He kept rubbing his head as if it ached. She could see him shiver, although the common room was warm. He seemed to be unable to keep his mind on what anyone was saying, and he couldn't speak more than two words in a row without going into a fit of coughing. She could also see that Chris was watching him and looking just as concerned. He pushed his food around without eating much. Chris finally seemed to come to some conclusion, visibly steeled himself, and walked over to sit down next to him. Chris said something to him, which he answered with a shake of his head. Then he stood up, and Chris had to catch him as he started to crumple. Chris had decided he'd had enough. He couldn't stand watching his dearest friend fret himself to pieces, and he'd come to some unhappy conclusions over the past couple of weeks. He'd gone over to sit next to Dirk before the Herald was aware that he was even in the common room and spoke his piece before Dirk had a chance to escape. I was wrong. I was wrong to put so much trust in my uncle, wrong to have doubted you, and wrong to have said anything about your private life. I apologize. Are you going to forgive me, or... Will I have to throw myself from the battlements in despair? Dirk had started a little when Chris first began speaking in his ear, but hadn't moved away. He'd listened with a mixture of relief and bemusement, then shook his head with a weak smile at Chris's last sally. Then he stood up, and the room faded from before his eyes as he felt his legs give out under him. Half a dozen instructors and field heralds made a rush for him as Chris caught him. They lowered him back down into his seat as he protested weakly that he was all right. I... <coughs> he coughed rackingly. I was dizzy. <coughs> A minute. <coughs> he bent over, 
in a fit of coughs, unable to continue, hardly able to catch his breath. Like hell, replied Terran, one hand on his forehead. You're on fire, man. You're for the healers, and I don't want to hear any nonsense out of you about it. Before he could regain enough breath to object, Terran draped one of his arms over his own shoulders, while a very worried Chris did the same on Dirk's other side. The rest surrounded the three of them, allowing no opportunity to escape, and escorted them out the door. By the time they'd reached their goal, his breath was rattling in his chest and there was little doubt of what ailed him. The healers isolated him and ran everyone else off, and there was very little that anyone could do about it. Talia had turned ashen when he'd collapsed, and had left her dinner uneaten, waiting for Chris's return. Chris finally reappeared, to be engulfed by everyone who'd been present, demanding to know what the healers had said. They tell me he has pneumonia, and it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better, he replied, his voice carrying easily across from the doorway to the bench where Talia sat, and they won't let anyone see him for at least a day or two. Talia made a little noise, like a strangled sob, stood quickly and pushed blindly away from the table. The knot of people surrounding Chris had blocked the door nearest her. She stumbled against benches twice as she fled to the door opposite and to her room. She ran all the way down the corridors of the Collegium and through the double doors leading to the Herald's Wing. She hurled herself up the darkened spiral staircase of the tower that held her room, pushed the door open, and flung herself down on the couch in the outer room of her suite, sobbing with a lost despair she hadn't felt since that awful moment in the way station. She hadn't closed the door behind her in her flight, and wasn't in much shape to pay attention to sounds around her. She only realized that she was not alone when she heard someone settle beside her, and somehow knew it was Karen and Cheryl. She tried to get herself back under control, but Karen's first words, spoken in a tone of such deep and unmistakable love that Talia hardly believed her ears, completely undid her. Little centaur, dear heart, what caused the greeting? Karen had slipped into the dialect of her home, something she only did on the rarest of occasions, and then, mostly with her twin or her life mate, moments of profound intimacy. That broke down the last of her reserve, and she turned with gratitude into Karen's arms and wept bitterly on her ready shoulder. Everything's gone wrong! she sobbed. Elspeth isn't talking to me anymore, and I know there's something going on, something she doesn't want either Selene or me to know about, but I can't find out what, and Dirk and Chris, we fought, and now they won't talk to me either, and, and now Dirk's sick, and I can't bear it. Oh, gods, I'm a total failure. Karen wisely said nothing, and let the hysterical words and tears wear themselves out. Cheryl, meanwhile, went quietly about the room, closing the door and lighting candles against the growing darkness. That done, she seated herself at Karen's feet to wait. For the problem of Elspeth, I can think of no solution, Karen said thoughtfully, when Talia was in a better state to listen. But if there was anything truly wrong, her Gwena would surely seek out Roland, and they would know. I... Hadn't even thought of that. Talia looked up into Karen's eyes from where she rested on her shoulder, crestfallen at her own stupidity. Why should they? She's never given the anxiety before. Karen almost smiled. I'm not thinking very clearly. No, that's not true. I'm not thinking at all. It's wrong of me, but Karen, I don't know how much longer I can bear this trouble with Dirk without flying to pieces. Karen, I want to be with him so much, sometimes I think it would be easier to die. Karen sighed. Life bond, then, is it? And with Dirk, gods, what a tangle. Well, that explains his madness for certain. Lady only knows what cracked notion the lad has in his head, and tis sure the things got him all turned round about. We know how it can be. An agony. Cheryl rose from her place, sat next to Talia, and slipped her arm around Talia's waist, joining Karen in supporting her. It's hellish, 
being pulled inside out by something that can't be denied and won't be turned to anything else. Is anyone trying to help you get this straightened out? At Talia's nod, Karen pursed her lips thoughtfully. I can't think of anything at all to help the little centaur. First, it's a matter of getting Dirk and Chris speaking, then getting Dirk's mind made up about thee. Hopefully the first is done already, but the second, my best guess is that he's gotten confused somewhere and has been chasing his own tail. Time, dearling, that's all it will take. Time. If I can just... Hold out a little longer. Talia relaxed herself with an effort, while Karen and Cheryl held her in a circle of love and comfort for long moments. You know we understand, dearling, Cheryl said at last for both of them. Who better? Now, let's change the subject. We're determined to make you smile again. With that, she and Karen took turns telling her the most hilarious stories that they could think of, mostly of some of the goings-on at the Collegium during her absence. No few of them were libelous. All of them were at least undignified. Talia wished profoundly that she had been present to witness the grave and aloof Kirill picking himself out of the fish pond with a strand of waterweed behind his ear. Between the two of them, they soon had her laughing again and had drained at least some of the tension from her. Finally, Karen nodded to her life mate and gave Talia a comforting hug. I think you're cheered enough to survive the night, dear one, the older woman said. Yes. I think so, Talia replied. Then let tomorrow take care of tomorrow and have a good, long sleep, Karen advised, and she and Cheryl departed as quietly as they had come. Talia wandered back into her bedroom to shed her uniform. She dressed for bed then changed her mind and wrapped a robe about herself and settled down on her couch with a book. She must have dozed off without meaning to because the next thing she knew, Chris was standing beside her and touching her arm lightly to wake her, and the candles were burned down to stubs in their holders. He was hardly what she expected to see. Chris! she exclaimed joyfully. Then fear took the place of joy. Is Dirk worse? she asked feeling the color drain from her face. No, little bird, he's no worse. I've just come from there. He's asleep, and the healers say he'll be all right in a week or two. And we're friends again. I thought you'd want to know. And I wanted to make up with you, too. Oh, Chris, I, I've i never been so miserable in my life, she confessed. I was so angry with you, that I swore I wasn't going to speak to you until you came to me and apologized, but my pride isn't worth wrecking our friendship over. His expression softened a little, and she realized he'd been tensed against her answer. I've never been so miserable either, little bird, and I've never felt like quite so much of an idiot. You aren't an idiot. Your uncle is... My uncle is not what I thought, he interrupted. I have to apologize to you, like I apologized to Dirk. I was wrong about my uncle. I'm not certain what his problem is, but he is trying to undermine you, and he's trying to wean me away from you. I've extracted information from the unwary often enough that I ought to have recognized it when he was doing it to me, but I didn't until just recently. He became a little too eager and failed to cover his trail. Chris's expression was troubled. I hope that what he did to Dirk was unintentional, but I'm afraid I can't be certain any more. I wish I knew what his game is. At the moment, if I were to hazard a guess, it would be this. He wants the position he had as Selene's closest advisor, and he wants me slightly disaffected from the Heralds, so that my family loyalty is just a trifle stronger than my loyalty to the Circle. You were right. I was wrong. I... I'm almost sorry to hear you say that. A little breeze from the open window behind her made the candles flicker and stirred locks of his hair as she assessed his rueful expression. What happened to change your mind? Mostly that he tried too hard after the squabble. As I said, he tried to pump me for information about you and made one too many slighting remarks about Dirk. You were right. 
that he has a grudge against you, though why I have no idea, and I think he used that incident with the scrolls as a chance to get at you through Dirk, and as a chance to come between me and Dirk. I can only hope he didn't manufacture it, too. She almost said angrily that the dropped scroll was no accident, that Ortholin had manufactured the incident, but decided to hold her tongue. He was in a receptive mood, but the quickest way to close his mind would be to make further accusations. I have to admit I'm of two minds about this. I'm glad you're coming around to my way of thinking, but I'm sorry to have changed your faith in your uncle. Don't be. It isn't you that has problems, it's him. Well, this is the first time anything has gone right in weeks. Chris, I'm glad we're friends again. He dropped easily to the floor beside her couch. So am I. I've missed talking to you. But as for things not going right, I don't know about that. He grinned ironically. That advice you gave me on how to deal with Nessa certainly worked. I meant to ask you about that, she said, grateful for the way they dropped back into easy conversation and glad of his company. I notice she seems to be pursuing Skiff these days. He sighed and drooped like a mime displaying dejection. Once she had away with me, she was off to other conquests. Oh, the perfidy of women. When will I ever learn? My heart is forever broken. That's the first time I ever heard that forever equaled the time it takes to boil an egg, she replied wryly. Oh, less, I assure you. I had a chance to drop Skiff a word on the subject of the fair Nessa. Now, he happens to be very appreciative of Nerissa's quite real charms. So, now that he knows the means of keeping her attention, which is to play hard to get, she may very well find herself in the position of hunter-turned-hunted. Like the old man said about that hand-fasted couple in Five Tree. Do you remember? Chris screwed his face up into a fair imitation of the old man's age-twisted countenance. Lor, help you, Harold, he croaked. Chased her, deed he did, and very deed chased her till she caught him. Talia smiled wistfully. We had some good times out there, didn't we? There'll be more. Don't worry, little bird. I'll get this tangle straightened as soon as the healers will let me near to talk to Dirk. You know, this illness may be a blessing in disguise. He won't be able to avoid me or find something that urgently needs his attention, and hopefully he'll believe the things I tell him. He stood to leave, and Talia gently touched his hand in thanks. Take heart, little bird. Things will get better. I can always slip Dirk love potions with his medicines. He winked and ran lightly down the staircase. She laughed, feeling much eased, and rose, laying her book down on the table beside the couch. She went slowly about the room and extinguished her lights, and then went to bed with a happier heart and mind. By the next morning, Talia felt far more optimistic, and far readier to tackle her problems face on. And since Dirk was out of reach, the logical problem to tackle was Elspeth. Now she was determined to corner Elspeth and confront her about her behavior. Counsel and court kept her occupied most of the day, she missed the girl at arms practice by scant moments. Finally, she tried tracking her down after dinner, but Elspeth managed to elude Tully again. She had no doubt this time that it was no accident, but a purposeful avoidance. Tully was badly worried. All her instincts told her that things were about to come to a head. She opened her shields and was unsuccessfully trying to locate the girl when she felt an urgent and unmistakable summons from Roland. With a sinking heart, she left the collegium and ran for the field. When she reached the fence that surrounded it, she saw her worst fears realized. Waiting with Roland was Elspeth's Gwenna, both of them like marble statues in the moonlight. The images she received from both of them, especially Gwenna, were blurred and chaotic, though there was no mistaking Gwenna's anxiety. Talia touched both their necks and concentrated in an effort to make some sense of the images. Finally, she got a series that came clear, and Ortholin was at the center of them. Ortholin and a young courtier, who was his creature, one of Corby's crew, and they were planning Elspeth's disgrace. She threw herself onto Roland's back without a moment's hesitation. He galloped at full speed to the fence that separated the field from the barn and stables of the ordinary horses, with Gwenna barely keeping up beside him. They vaulted the fence like a pair of great white birds and headed straight for the hay barn. Talia flung herself off Roland's back, 
before they had fully stopped. As she sprinted for the barn, she heard a young male voice murmuring something in the darkness, and she flung open the great door with a strength she never even knew she had. Moonlight poured in on the pair disclosed, and Talia saw with relief that matters had not yet had a chance to proceed very far between Elspeth and her would-be lover. He was rattled considerably by Talia's sudden appearance. If Elspeth was, she wasn't showing it. "'What do you want?' Elspeth asked flatly, refusing pridefully to snatch her jerk enclosed where it was unlaced. "'To prevent you from making the same mistake your mother did,' Talia replied just as coldly. "'The mistake of thinking that fine words mean a lofty mind and a pretty face goes with a noble heart.' This young peacock has little more in his mind except to put you in a position where you have no choice but to take him as your consort or disgrace yourself, your mother, and your kingdom. You're wrong, Elspeth defended him passionately. He loves me. He told me so. And you believed him, even when your own companion would have nothing to do with him. Talia was white-hot with anger now. Elspeth was not willing to listen to reason. Very well, then. She should have evidence that she would accept, in plenty. Talia ruthlessly forced rapport on the young courtier. His petty evil was no match for some of the minds Talia had been forced to touch, though his slimy slyness made her skin crawl. Before Elspeth had a chance to shield herself, Talia pulled her in as well, and forced her to see for herself the true thoughts of one who had claimed that he cared for her. With a cry of revulsion, Elspeth tore herself away from him and fled to the opposite side of the barn, while Talia released her mind from the enforced union. She was less gentle with the young popinjay. She had him in a crushing mental grip and fed his fear without compunction as he gazed at her in dumb terror. You will say nothing of this to anyone, she told him, burning each word into his mind, because if you dare, you'll never sleep again, for every time you shut your misbegotten eyes, this is what you'll see. She tore the memory of his worst nightmare out of the bowels of recollection and flung it in his face, brutally invoking terror and forcing that on him as well. He whimpered and groveled at her feet until she threw him violently out of rapport. Get out of here, she growled. Get out. Go back to your father's holding and don't come back. He fled without a single backward glance. She turned to face Elspeth trying to control her anger by slowing her breathing. I thought better of you than that, she said, each word built of ice. I thought you would have had better taste than to let a creature like that touch you. Elspeth was crying, but as much out of anger as unhappiness. Fine words from the Herald Vestal, she spat. First skiff, then Chris, and now who? Why shouldn't I have my lovers as well as you? Talia closed her hands into fists so tightly that her nails cut her palms. I think I hear the brat speaking, she replied. The little bitch who wants all the glory of being the heir, but none of the responsibilities. Oh, Hulda taught you very well, didn't she? Grab and take, snatch all you can, think only of yourself, and never mind what repercussions your actions may have on others. Others don't matter. Oh, no, not now that you're heir. After all, your word is law, right? Or it should be. And if somebody tries to make you see reason, well, dredge up the worst you can about them and throw it in their faces. Then they'll be afraid to try and stop you from doing what you want. Well, that doesn't work with me, young woman. For all the importance it has, I could be sleeping with men, women, or chiras, because I'm not the heir. You seem to have conveniently forgotten that you will sit on the throne when your mother dies. You may have to make a marriage of state to save us from a powerful enemy. That was what this business with Alessandar and Ankar was all about, or have you forgotten that too? No one will want you or respect you out kingdom after dallying with a petty schemer like he is. And I, at least, have never been intimate with anyone that I didn't know and who wasn't willing to let me inside his thoughts. He wouldn't let you do that, would he? Didn't that make you the least bit suspicious? Ladies' breasts, girl, where was your mind? Your own companion wouldn't have anything to do with him. Didn't that tell you anything? If you're so hot to have a man between your legs, why the hell didn't you choose a fellow student or someone from the circle? They will at least never betray you, and they know when to keep their mouths shut. 
Elspeth burst into frantic tears. Go away, she wailed. Leave me alone. It wasn't like that at all. I thought, I thought he loved me. I hate you. I never want to see you ever again. That pleases me very well, Talia snapped. I'm ashamed that I wasted so much of my time trying to help a damned fool. She stalked out of the barn, vaulted onto Roland's back, and returned to the palace without a backward glance. But before she was halfway there, she was already ruining half of what she had said. She reported to Selene in an agony of self-accusation. The queen was in her private quarters, which were as spartan as her public rooms were opulent. She had wrapped herself in a robe of old and shabby brown velveteen, nearly the same age and color as the couch she curled up on. Talia stood before her, unable to look her in the eyes, as she related the entire bitter tale. Goddess Selene, I couldn't have made a bigger mess of the situation if I'd planned it out in advance, she finished rubbing one temple and very near to weeping with vexation. I am as big an idiot as I accused Elspeth of being. I let all my training go flying merrily out the window, let my own problems get the better of me, and completely lost my temper. Maybe you'd better send me back through the collegium with the babies again. Just wait a moment. I'm not sure that your reaction was the wrong one, and I'm not sure that you didn't do the right thing. The queen replied thoughtfully, candlelight reflecting in her wide eyes. Sit down, little friend, and hear me out. Firstly, we've been very gentle with Elspeth up until now, insofar as exposing her to the kind of emotional blackmail and double-dealing perfidy that we both know is fairly commonplace at court. Well, now she's learned that deceit can arrive packaged very attractively, and that isn't a bad thing. She was hurt and frightened, but that will send the lesson home more deeply. I believe you were correct in thinking that this experience will prevent her from making the same kind of mistake I made. That's not to say that you didn't overreact and say some things you shouldn't have, but on the whole, I think the good will outweigh the mistakes. How can you say that? After the way I've alienated her, I am supposed to be her friend and counsellor. And when, in all the time you've known her, have you ever lost your temper with her? Not once. So she learned something else, that it's possible to go too far with you, and that you're as human and fallible as the rest of us. I doubt she'll ever provoke you that far again. There isn't likely to be another chance, Talia said bitterly. Not the way I've fouled things up. I disagree. Selene shook her head emphatically. Since you've been gone, I've gotten to know my daughter very well. She meant what she said, for now. She has a temper, but once it cools, she doesn't hold a grudge. And when she realizes that you were right, and acting in her defense, she'll come around. If you were to disappear for a while, I think she'll eventually realize that while you did overreact, so did she. The queen pondered for a moment. I think I have the perfect solution. Remember Alessandra's marriage proposal? I intended to make a state visit there in the next few weeks, and I wanted to send an envoy on ahead to look the prince over. As my own personal adviser, you would be perfect for that, the more especially as I intend to send Chris as well. I heard about the quarrel between Chris and Dirk, and I had figured on giving them a bit of time for things to cool as well. I was going to send Dirk and Kirill until Dirk fell ill last night, so I'll separate the pair by sending Chris off. That's mended, Talia sighed. I still want to send Chris. He has the manner and the blood to be acceptable, and I would as soon keep Kirill here. You and Chris worked outstandingly well as a team, and I trust your judgment completely. I think that rather than cancelling the visit, I'll move the date up and send the two of you on ahead to spy things out for me. I'll take Elspeth with me, and I'll have a word with Othalan about those protégés of his. Salonay's eyes grew cold. It's about time he stopped being their defender and stopped letting them use his good name to get away with whatever they please. Talia realized then that she had not told Salonay her belief that Orthalan had put the boy up to the attempted seduction. But what proof did she have? Nothing. 
except the vague image of Ortholin in the boy's mind, and that could have been because he was hoping to escape punishment by sheltering behind his protector. Best not to mention it, she thought wearily. I'm not up to going through the same arguments I faced with Chris. By the time we all meet again, Salonay was saying, Elspeth will have had time to think. Do you think you could be ready in the morning? The sooner you drop out of Elspeth's sight, the better. I could be ready in an hour, Talia replied. Although I'm not sure you should be so quick to trust me after tonight. Talia, I trust you even more, Salonay replied as Talia seemed to read understanding in her eyes. You've come to me hot from the quarrel to claim it was all your fault. How many people, how many heralds even, would have done the same? But you haven't told me what has set you so on edge. Is it something to do with Chris? Did you get caught in the middle of his feud with Dirk? If you have problems with Chris, I'll send a different herald with you. Chris! Talia's honest surprise seemed to relieve the queen. No, thank the lady. We've more than made up our differences, just as he and Dirk made up. Bright havens, if anything, he'll help straighten out this awful tangle. It's nothing that can't be worked out with time, just like this row with Elspeth. It's just that the time it's taken to set everything straight is driving me out of patience and out of temper. Good. Then the plan stands. You and Chris will leave in the morning. Selene, if you don't think it's a bad idea... Talia began hesitantly. I doubt that it would be. What is it you'd like to do? I'd like to write a note of apology to Elspeth and leave it with you. There's no doubt in my mind that I was partially in the wrong, that I overreacted, and that I said a great many hurtful things because I was unhappy and I wanted to hurt someone else. I certainly was far too hard on her. You can use your own judgment whether or not to give it to her, and when. It sounds reasonable to me, Selene replied, although a bit unnecessary. We'll be following a week or two behind you, and apologies are always more effective in person. That's quite true, but you never know what's likely to happen, and you may want to give it to her before you start off. I don't like the idea of leaving unfinished business behind me, especially something as wretched as this. Who knows? I might never get another chance. Bright havens, dear, I should hire you out as my official doomsayer. Selene laughed, but it was a little uneasy. Talia shook her head with a vague smile. Gods, I'm seeing everything miserable just because I am miserable. I will leave that note with you, but because the catling may well decide to be a human being again once I've left. Now, are they expecting any two heralds, or Dirk and Carol? Will there be any problem with me showing up? The underlings are probably just expecting two heralds, Salonay said. I hadn't specified. I'll send the appropriate papers with you, of course. The guards on Alessandra's side of the border will send the specifics on ahead of you. I've heard he has some special way of relaying messages, faster than birds or couriers. I would appreciate it if you could find out more details on that if it's possible. It might not be... It depends on whether it's supposed to be kept secret from allies or not, or whether it's a secret at all. We'll do our best. Talia managed half a smile. You know, having the two of us on this assignment will work rather well at Ferritin Secrets Out. Anybody involved with state secrets will be nervous. I can pick that up, and Chris can follow my anchor to far see what's going on. My queen, you are very sly. Me? Selene contrived to look innocent then caught her eyes squarely. Are you sure you're ready for this? I wouldn't send you if you don't feel capable of political intrigue and all the rest that this will entail. It is likely to be simple and straightforward, but it could involve ferreting out secrets, and at the very least you'll be dealing with the same amount of scheming you have here. I'm ready, Talia sighed. It can't be worse than the mess I've already been dealing with. Chapter 6 I feel like I'm running away. Talia's voice was quiet, but in the hush of pre-dawn, Chris had no trouble hearing her. Don't, Chris replied, tightening Tantris's girth with a little grunt. Their companions stood patiently side by side in the tack shed, as they had so many times during Talia's internship, waiting for their chosen to finish harnessing them. 
The rain that had blown up just past midnight had died away to nothing, but the skies were still overcast. Both heralds wore their cloaks against the chill damp. Tantris and Roland were being decked out in full formal array. The silver brightwork gleamed in the light from the lantern just above Tantris's shoulder, and the bridal bells tinkled softly as the companions shifted. The homey scent of leather and hay made Talia's throat ache with tears she refused to shed. Look, there isn't anything either of us can do here at the moment, right? Chris threw his saddlebags over Tantris's hindquarters and fastened them to the saddle's skirting. Elspeth won't talk to you, and Dirk can't, so you might as well be doing something useful, something different. There won't be anybody who's going to need you during the few weeks we'll be gone, will there? No, not really. Talia had been very busy this past evening. Her lack of sleep was apparent from the dark circles under her eyes. De Estrella is doing fine. Anything she needs now, Vostel is more than competent to give her. I talked to Albrecht. He took me to see Kirill. They promised me that they'd keep an eye on your uncle. I'm sorry, Chris. Don't apologize. I'm just a little surprised you managed to convince Kirill he needed watching. Tantris, stand, damn it. I didn't really. Albrecht did. Huh, Albrecht. Nobody convinces him of anything. He must have had reasons of his own to agree with you. He digested this in silence for a moment. Tantris shifted over another step. Albrecht is going to have a word or two with Elspeth, too, she continued after the silence had become a little uncomfortable. She ran her hands down Roland's legs to confirm that the bindings on his pasterns and fetlocks were firm. And Karen promised to be her dirk in his lair as soon as she can bully her way past the healers. So did Skiff. Skiff said as much to me. Poor Dirk. I could almost feel sorry for him. He's not likely to get much sympathy from either of those two. Tantris's bridal bells tinkled as he shifted again. Sympathy isn't what he needs, she replied, a little waspishly, straightening up. He's been wallowing in self-pity long enough, her voice trailed off, and she concluded shamefacedly, for that matter, so have I. Work is the best cure I know for self-pity, little bird, Chris said self-consciously. And, hey! With that last step, Tantris had managed to shift over far enough that Chris and Talia were trapped between the two companions, breast to breast. Kiss and make up, brother mine, and be nice. She's having a hard time. Chris sighed with exasperation, then looking down at Talia's wistful eyes, softened. It'll be all right, little bird. And you have every reason to feel sorry for yourself. He kissed her softly on the forehead and the lips. She relaxed just a little and leaned her head for a short moment on his shoulder. I don't know what I've done to deserve a friend like you, she sighed, then took hold of herself. But we have a long road ahead of us. Tantris had moved away so that they were no longer trapped and Chris could hear him laughing in his mind. And we've got a limited time to cover it, Chris finished for her. And since my companion has decided to cooperate again, we ought to get moving. He gave Tantris's harness a final tug and swung into the saddle. Ready to go? As ready as I'll ever be. They took with them only what Tantris and Roland could carry. They needed to carry no supplies, they would be housed and fed at inns along the way until they reached the border, and thereafter would be using the hostels of King Alessander. They also needed to bring a minimum in the way of personal belongings. The queen and her entourage would be following at a pace geared to her baggage train, and they would bring whatever might be required for the term of official visits. Selene and Alessander were long-time allies. He and her father had been the rarest of things among rulers, personal friends. Although it was a slim chance, the possibility of Elspeth being willing to make a marriage with Alessandar's own heir was not to be dismissed offhand. Alessandar had not been discouraged by Selene's initial reply to his offer. Rather, he had urged this visit on her so that she and Elspeth could see Ankar for themselves. He had argued convincingly that such marriages took years to arrange. Even were they to agree now, Elspeth would be past her internship when it became a reality. 
Since Salonay had not seen the young man since he was an infant, on the occasion of his naming and her last state visit, she agreed. This would be the ideal time for such a visit. Since the collegium was about to go into summer recess, she could bring Elspeth with her. She was still determined that Elspeth would not be forced into any marriage unless the safety of the entire realm rested on it. She was equally determined that any young man that Elspeth chose, be he royal or common, would at least be of the frame of mind to agree with the principles that governed her kingdom. If possible, he should be of heraldic material himself. Ideally, Elspeth's consort would be someone who was either chosen already or who would be chosen once he was brought to the attention of the companions. If this came to pass, it would fulfill Salonay's highest hopes, for the heir's consort would be co-ruler if also a herald. Besides preceding their monarch and making certain all was in readiness for her, Chris's and Talia's primary duty was to examine the proposed bridegroom and to determine how his own people felt about him, for themselves, and then give Selene their opinions of his character. It was no small trust. This was all in the back of Talia's mind as they rode away in the darkness before dawn. Troubling her thoughts was her feeling that, in spite of the importance of this mission, she was running away from unfinished business by accepting it. She had labored for hours over the simple note to Elspeth, tearing up dozens of false starts. It still wasn't right. She wished she'd been able to find better words to explain why she had overreacted, and nothing she could say would unspeak some of the hurtful things she'd said. The incident was evidence that she and Elspeth had drawn apart during Talia's interning, and the rift that had come between them needed to be healed, and quickly. She couldn't help but berate herself for not seeing it when she'd first returned. Then there was Dirk. She couldn't help but think she was being cowardly. Anyone with any courage at all would have remained, despite everything. And yet, what could she truly do back there besides fret? Chris was right. Elspeth would refuse to speak with her, and Dirk was out of bounds in the healer's hands. It seemed appropriate that they rode away through darkness, and that the sky was so gloomy and overcast there was no bright dawn at all merely a gradual lightening of the dark to gray, leaden daylight. Chris was not very happy with himself at the moment. I haven't been doing too well by my friends lately, have I? He sent to Tantris's backward pointing ears. No, little brother, you haven't, his companion agreed. He sighed and settled himself a little more comfortably in the saddle. Now that he looked back on it, there were things he should have done. He should have told Dirk right off about the way Talia felt, about Dirk and about himself. When Dirk started acting oddly, he should have had it out with him. He should never have let things get to the point where Dirk was leaning on the bottle to cope. Lord and lady, I'd be willing to bet gold he thinks it's me Talia's in love with. Gods, gods, I've been tearing his heart and soul into ragged bits and I never even noticed. No wonder he picked a fight with me. No wonder he was drinking. Ah, oh, Dirk, my poor brother, I did it to you again. How am I going to make it up to you? Then there was Talia. He should have believed that Talia wasn't indulging in a grudge. He should have known, what with all the time he'd spent with her, that she wasn't inclined to hold grudges, even though she wasn't inclined to forgive a hurt too easily. He should have believed that her feeling about his uncle was rooted in fact not dislike. Albrick obviously believed her, and the armsmaster was hardly noted for making hasty judgments. Might have beens don't mend the broken pot, Tantris said in his mind. Little brother, why didn't you do these things? Good question. Chris thought about that one while the road passed under Tantris's hooves. There weren't many folk out this early, so they had the road to themselves, and there was nothing to distract them. One thing at a time, why hadn't he done anything about Dirk? He came to the sobering conclusion that he hadn't done anything because he hadn't seen the problem until Dirk was drinking himself to sleep every night. 
and he hadn't seen it because he was so pleased with himself for the completion of a successful assignment on his own, so wrapped up in a glow of self-congratulation that he hadn't noticed anything else. He'd been like a child on holiday, selfishly intent only on his own pleasures now that the onerous burden of school was done with for the nonce. Teaching the classes and far-seeing was so very easy for him that it was like having no duty at all, and he'd been spending the rest of his time up to his eyebrows in his own pleasures. Very good, Tantris said dryly. Now don't go overboard in beating your breast about it. I wasn't too remiss in enjoying myself either. It had been a long time to be out, and already and I missed each other. Hedonist, Chris sent, a little relieved that his companion was being so reasonable. Not really. We're as close as you and Dirk, in a slightly different fashion. More like you and Talia, really. Yes, Talia. It was easy to figure out why he'd been so slow to see her plight. Orthalin was, in all honesty, a politician, a schemer, and power-hungry. Chris had been forced to defend his uncle's actions to other heralds more than once, although never against an accusation of deliberate and malicious wrongdoing. Chris knew Orthalin never did anything for just one reason— Yes, he might well manage to gain a little more power, influence, or put someone in his debt by the things he did, but there was always a profit for the kingdom as well. Heralds, though. The use of authority for personal benefit bothered them, probably because such usage was forbidden them, both by training and by inclination. Most heralds weren't high-born, and didn't grow up with the intrigue and politics that were a part of the rhythm of court life. Things Chris accepted matter-of-factly disgusted them. But the fact was that heralds were very sheltered creatures, except the ones who lived and worked in the court or were high-born. Court politics were a reality most heralds could remain blissfully unaware of, for they dealt only with the highest level of court life. The queen, her immediate entourage, and the seniors, where for all intents and purposes the politicking didn't exist. It was at Ortholin's level, the mid to upper level nobility that the competition was fiercest. And it was very possible he had seen only the political implications of the ascension of the new queen's own. More than possible. Most likely. Which meant he'd seen Talia as a political rival to be trimmed down, seen her only as a political rival. Her duties and responsibilities as a herald, Orthalin probably didn't understand them, and certainly discounted them as irrelevant. Old Talamir had been no threat to Orthalin, but this quick, intelligent young woman was. All of which boiled down to the fact that Talia was likely dead accurate in reading Orthalin's motives toward her. Yes, Chris had dealt with fellow herald's censure of his uncle before. But Talia's accusations had been different, and he had been as shocked by the idea that a member of his family could be suspected of real wrongdoing as Talia had been that a herald was accused of it. He'd taken it almost as an attack on himself and had reacted just as unthinkingly. I wish you'd spoken your mind to me before this, Chris told Tantris, just a hint of accusation flavoring the thought. It doesn't work that way, little brother, Tantris replied, and you know that perfectly well. We only give advice when we're asked for it. It isn't our job to interfere in your personal lives. How do you think poor Aridi was feeling, with her chosen making a muck of things and not even talking to her, hm? And Roland can't even properly talk with his chosen. But now that you are finally asking... Impart to me your deathless wisdom. Now, now, there's no need to be sarcastic. As it happens, I don't like Orthalin either, but he's never given anyone any real evidence of ill will before this. All I've ever had to go on were my instincts. Which are far better than any humans, Chris reminded him. Well, don't blame yourself for not seeing anything, Tantris continued. But when someone like Talia insists on a thing, 
It's probably a good idea to lay aside your feelings about it and consider it as dispassionately as possible. Now that she's got that gift of hers in full control, her instincts in these matters are as good as mine. Yes, Greybeard, Chris thought, his good humor somewhat restored by the fact that Tantris wasn't trying to make him feel guilty about the mess. Greybeard, am I? Tantris snorted and shook his mane. We'll see about that. And he performed a little caracol, a half buck that shook Chris's bones, and a kick or two before settling back down to his original steady pace. While Roland could not mind speak Talia as Tantris could Chris, he was making his feelings abundantly clear. It was quite plain to Talia that her companion thought she was indulging in a good deal more self pity than the occasion warranted. Perversely, his disapproval made her feel all the sorrier for herself. Eventually, he gave up on her and let her wallow in her misery to her heart's content. The weather, unseasonable for the edge of summer, was certainly cooperating. It was a perfect day for being depressed. The chill, leaden skies threatened rain, but it never quite made up its mind to fall. The few people they met on the roadway were taciturn and scant in their greetings. The threat of rainfall made folk in the villages they passed inclined to stay indoors. Because they were traveling light, they could make the best possible time to the border, even though they would be stopping to rest at night. According to Kirill, it was probable that they would proceed still on their own as far as the capital, since the companions would be able to make far better time than any steeds the king could send with an escort, which meant Given the probable speed of Salonae and her entourage, they would have several days at least to assess the prince and the situation before one of them rode back to meet the queen on the border. That likeliest would be Chris. Talia, as queen's own, was the better choice for envoy. Although her reason acknowledged the wisdom of this, her emotions rebelled, wanting it to be her who made that first contact with Salonae, and with Elspeth, and possibly with Dirk, if he was well enough by then. Nothing was going as she would have chosen, and on top of it all, she had been experiencing an odd foreboding about this trip from the moment Salonae mentioned it. There was no reason for it, yet she couldn't shake it. It was as if she were riding from bad into worse, and there was no way to stop what was coming. Talia remained turned inward determined to control her own internal turmoil by herself. Weeping on Chris's shoulder would accomplish nothing. Roland was a solace, but this was a matter of dealing with her own emotions and her own control. A herald, she told herself for the thousandth time, was supposed to be self-sufficient, able to cope no matter how difficult the situation. She would, by the havens, control herself, there was no excuse for her own emotional weakness. She had learned to control her gift. She would learn to school her emotions to the same degree. The hard pace they were setting left little opportunity for conversation, but Chris was very aware of her unhappiness. Talia had told him in detail about the confrontation with the heir as they were saddling up. He was sadly aware that there was little he could do to help her. It was extremely frustrating to see her in such emotional pain and be unable to do anything constructive about it. Not long ago, he would have fled the prospect of emotional demands. Now in the light of this morning's introspection, his sole regret was that he could not find some way to help. When she'd lost control over her gift, there had been something he could do. He was a teacher. He knew the fundamentals of training any gift, and he had Tantris and Roland to help him with the specifics of hers. Now, well, maybe there was one small way in which he could help her. If he talked to his uncle, perhaps he could make him understand that Talia was not a political threat. With that pressure off, the problem of dealing with Elspeth and Dirk might assume more manageable proportions. They stopped for a brief lunch at an inn, but mindful of the time constraints they were under, they ate it standing in the stable yard. How are you doing so far? he asked, around a mouthful of meat pie. I'm all right, she replied. She'd already bolted down her portion so fast she couldn't have tasted it. 
Now she was giving Roland a brisk rubdown and was putting far more energy into Roland's currying than was strictly necessary. Well, I know you haven't ridden much at forced pace. If you have any problems, let me know. I will, was her only reply. He tried again. I hope the weather breaks. It's bad for riding, but I would think it's worse for crops. Uh huh. We'll have to ride right up until dark to make Trevally, but the inn there should make up for the ride. I've been there before. He waited. No response. Think you can make it that far? Yes. Their wine is good. Their beer is better. Or, their hearth cats have two tails. Uh huh. He gave up. They stopped long after dark when Chris was beginning to go numb in his legs and staggered into an inn neither of them really saw. The innkeeper saw that both of them were exhausted and wisely kept his other customers away from them, giving them a table right on the hearth and a good dinner. The inn was a big one and catered to traders, carters, and other mercantile travel. The common room was nearly full and noisy enough that Chris did not attempt conversation. Talia was just as glad. She knew she wasn't decent company at the moment, and she rather hoped he'd ignore her until she was. After a meal which she did not even taste and choked down only because she needed to fuel her body, they went straight to their beds. She was able to force herself to sleep, but she could do nothing about her dreams. They were tortured and nightmarish, and not at all restful. They again left before dawn, rising before any of the other guests of the inn, breaking their fast with hot bread and milk before swinging up into their saddles and resuming the journey. Talia, having found no answers within, began resolutely turning her attention without. The skies had begun clearing, and by late morning they were able to roll up their cloaks and fasten them behind their saddles. When birds began voicing their songs, her spirits finally began to lighten. By noon she had managed to regain enough of her good humor to speak normally with Chris, and the whole mess she'd left behind her began to assume better proportions. She was still conscious of a faint foreboding, but in the bright sunlight it seemed hardly more than the remnants of her nightmares. Toward midday, Talia suddenly perked up and became more like her old self, for which Chris was very grateful. Riding next to a person who strongly resembled the undead of the tales was not his idea of the way to make a journey. Diplomatic missions were not entirely new to Chris, though he'd not been senior herald before. This was Talia's first stint as an envoy, and they really needed to talk about it while it was possible to do so unobserved. Chris was relieved by her apparent return to normal and ventured a tentative prompting. She responded immediately with a flood of questions, and that was more like the Talia he knew, but he could not help but note, with a feeling of profound sympathy, her dark-circled eyes. While he was no empath, he knew her sleep must have been scant. By the time they reached the border itself at the end of a week of hard riding, Things were back on their old footing between them. They had discussed every contingency that they could think of between them, ranging from the possibility that Ankar should seem to be perfect in every way to the possibility that he was a worse marital prospect than Selene's late consort and talked over graceful ways to get them all out if the latter should be the case. Chris was fairly sure she was ready to face whatever the fates should throw at her. As they rounded a curve... Late in the afternoon of the fourth day of the journey, Talia got her first sight of the border. The border itself, here where two civilized and allied countries touched, was manned by small outposts from each kingdom. On the Valdemar side stood a small building, a few feet from the road, and a few feet from the simple bar that marked the border itself. It served as dwelling and office for the two pairs of guardsfolk stationed there, the pair on duty were checking the papers of an incoming trader. They looked up at the sound of hoofbeats and grinned to see the two heralds. The taller of the two left the trader's wagon and took down the bar for them, waving them through with an elaborate mock bow. A few lengths farther on was a proper gate, marking Alessandar's side of the border. It was manned by another pair of guards, this time in the black and gold uniforms of Alessandar's army. 
With them was a young man in a slightly more elaborate uniform, a captain of Alessandar's army. The captain was young, friendly, and quite handsome. He passed them in without more than a cursory glance at their credentials. I've been waiting for you, he told them, but I truly didn't expect you here this soon. You must have made very good time. Fairly good, Chris replied, and we started out a bit sooner than planned. We've been out in the field for the last year or so. Field heralds are used to being ready to go at a moment's notice. As opposed to folks with soft bunks at court, hm? The captain grinned. Same with us. That lot stationed at court couldn't have a half day of maneuvers without a full baggage train and enough supplies to feed a town. Well, I do have some basic orders about what to do with you. You do, Talia said, raising her eyebrows in surprise. Oh, it isn't much. Just wait until you arrive, then inform the capital. Talia recalled then what Selene had said, that Alessandar was rumored to have some new system of passing messages swiftly. She also remembered that Selene had asked her to find out what she could about it. Evidently, Chris had gotten similar instructions. Now, how are you going to get further instructions about us in any reasonable amount of time? Chris asked. I know the nearest authority is several days away on horseback, and you don't have heralds to carry messages quickly. The young captain smiled proudly. It's no secret, he replied, his brown eyes frank. In fact, I would be honored to show you, if you aren't too tired. Not likely, not when you're offering to show us what sounds like magic. The captain laughed. <laughs> From what I understand, you're fine ones to talk about wonders and magic. Well, one man's magic is another man's commonplace, so they say. Come along, then, and I'll show you. Out of courtesy to him, since he was afoot, Talia and Chris dismounted and walked with him up the packed gravel roadway to his outpost, a building much bigger than the one on the Valdemar side and shaded on three sides by trees. Will it interest you to know that I may very well get my orders within a matter of hours, if someone is found of high enough rank to issue them, before the sun sets? That's amazing. We can't even do that, Talia replied. But what does the sun setting have to do with it? You see the tower attached to the outpost? He shook dark hair out of his eyes as he pointed to a slim, skeletal edifice of gray wood. This tower rose several feet above the treetops and was anchored on one side to the main barracks of the border station. It had had both of them puzzled, since it seemed to have no real use, except perhaps as a lookout point. I must admit we were wondering about that, Chris told him. Are forest fires that much of a danger around here? I wouldn't have thought so, what with all the land under cultivation. Oh, it's not a fire tower, though that's where the design is from. The young captain laughed. <laughs> Come up to the top with me, and I'll show you something to set you on your ears. They followed him up the series of ladders that led to the broad platform on the top. Once there, though, Talia didn't see anything out of the ordinary, just two men in the black uniform tunics of Alessandar's army and an enormous concave mirror, as wide as Talia was tall. Although it was not quite perfect, its surface a bit wavering, it was an impressive piece of workmanship. Talia marveled at the skill that had gone into first producing and then silvering such an enormous piece of glass. The mirror stood on a pivoting pedestal, and as they watched, one of the two men turned it until it reflected a beam of the westering sunlight at the southwestern corner of the platform. When he'd done that, the second man, picked up a smaller mirror about three handspans across and took his position in the beam of reflected light. That was when Talia realized just how they were going to pull off the trick. It was a very clever variant on the old scheme of signaling across distance by means of the sun flashing off a reflective object. It was clever because, in this case, there was no need to hope that the sun was in the correct position when you needed to send a message. The captain smiled broadly as he saw understanding in their faces. It was the idea of some savant in Ankar's entourage. We started building these towers last year at all the outposts. When we realized how useful they are, we sped up the building and put towers up as fast as we could get the mirrors for them. We have relay towers all across the kingdom now, 
he continued with cheerful pride. We can transmit a message from one end of the kingdom to the other in a matter of hours. That's rather better than you heralds can do, from what I understand. That's quite true, but anyone who knows your code has no trouble in learning the content of any messages you send, Chris pointed out. That makes it a bit difficult to keep anything secret, doesn't it? The captain laughed. In that case, the couriers need never fret that there will be no job for them. True, Solon? He addressed the man holding the smaller mirror. Tell them down the line that Queen Selene of Valdemar's two envoys are here and waiting for instructions on how to proceed. Sir, the signalman saluted smartly and carried out his orders. In the far distance, the heralds could just barely make out what might be the top of another tower above the treetops. Shortly after their man had completed his message, a series of flashes winked back at them from this point. He's repeating our entire message back to us, the captain explained. We started this check after too many misreadings had caused some serious tangles. Now if he's mistaken any of it, we can correct him before he sends it on. Sir, message correct, sir, the signalman replied. Send the confirmation, the captain ordered then continued his commentary. Now, the closer you get to any of the major cities, especially the capital, the more men we have on each tower, that makes sure that several incoming messages can be handled at once. If the originator doesn't get confirmation, he assumes that there was a momentary jam-up and keeps sending until he does. It's really brilliant, Talia said, and she and the captain exchanged a grin at her pun. But what do you do on cloudy days or at night? He laughed. We go back to the old reliable courier system in bad weather. We back it up by making our posting stations part of the tower system, so as soon as the clouds break or the sun rises, the message can be relayed. Even when conditions have been at their worst, the towers usually still manage to beat the courier. At night, of course, we can signal with lanterns, but that won't be of any help in this case, since no one is going to want to trouble envoys with orders after they've presumably retired. That's assuming anyone highborn enough to issue those orders is willing to take the time to do so after the sun sets. They followed him back down the ladders, once back on the ground. Since neither of them showed any signs of fatigue, he gave them a tour of the post that lasted until darkness fell. Talia was intrigued, and not just by the signal towers. This was more than simply a border guard station. There was a company of Alessandar's army on permanent duty here. When not patrolling the road for bandits or standing watch on the relay tower, the men, there were no women in Alessandar's army, performed policing functions for local villages. It was an interesting contrast to the Valdemar system, where Selene's soldiery was kept in central locations and shifted about at need. But then Alessandar had a much larger standing army. In addition to the army company, there were four healers, all women, permanently assigned here. There were three buildings, not including the tower, the barracks, the border station where the healers lived, and where customs checks were made and taxes collected from those passing across the border, and a kind of all-purpose building that included the kitchen and storage facilities. Well, the captain said with resignation when the tour was over and no one had appeared from the tower with a message. It looks like the folks at the other end couldn't find anyone with enough authority to issue orders about you before it became too late. That means you'll have to spend the night here, unless you'd rather recross the border. Here we'll be fine, providing it's no imposition, Chris answered. The captain looked doubtfully from Chris to Talia and back again, and coughed politely. I uh, haven't got private quarters for you, he said a bit awkwardly. I could easily find you space in the barracks, of course, and the young lady could take a bed with the healers, since they're all women, but if you'd rather not be separated, Captain, Harold Talia and I are colleagues, nothing more. Chris looked sober enough, but Talia could read his amusement at the captain's embarrassment. Your arrangements are perfectly fine, Talia said smoothly. We're both used to barrack-style quarters. I promise you that they're quite a luxury compared with some of the way stations I've spent my nights in. Talia had been careful to use I instead of we in speaking of the way stations. She saw out of the corner of her eye Chris winking at her to congratulate her on her tact. If that's the case, I'll escort you to the officer's mess for some dinner.
the captain replied, apparently relieved that they'd made no awkwardness over the situation. His attitude made Talia wonder if other guests at this outpost had been less than cooperative, or if it was simply that he'd heard some of the more exaggerated tales about heralds. While somewhat restrained by the presence of outsiders, the officers were a very congenial lot. They were terribly curious about heralds, of course, and some of the questions were as naive as any child's. If all of Alessandar's people were as open-handed and content with their lot as these men were, Talia was inclined to think he was every bit as good a ruler as Selene. Although Chris got a real bed, Talia had to make do with a cot in the healer's quarters. She didn't mind in the least. The nightmares that had plagued her nightly all the way here had left her so weary she thought she could quite probably sleep on a slab of stone. This night, however, the nightmares seemed to have been partially thwarted. That might have been due to the soothing presence of the healers bedded all around her. After all, she was an empath. Chris was not. There had been enough bad fortune this spring that it was possible she might well have been picking up the general air of disaster everyone was sharing lately. She'd thought she'd made her shield strong enough to block just about anything, but she had been stressed, and that put a strain on her shielding. Or the fact that the nightmares went away might have been just because she had worn herself out past the point of being disturbed by them. For whatever reason, she slept soundly for the first time since leaving— and had only the vaguest memories of disturbing dreams in the morning.